Gwen Weaver, The White Spirit, by Mercedes Lackey, narrated by Anne Flosnick, copyright 2009 by Mercedes Lackey. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Mercedes Lackey and Scoville Galen Gauche Literary Agency, Inc., and was produced in the year 2009 by Tantor Media Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. Part 1 Princess Chapter 1 The talk at the heart of the high hall of her father's castle was all of magic that wild evening. Harvest time had come and gone, and Samwin not far off. The old men and women were muttering about a hard winter ahead. Truly it had turned bitter very quickly, and the harvest, while not scant, was also not bountiful. All that little Gwen knew, though, was that tonight it sounded as if everything cold and evil in the world was trying to get in. She was glad that Castel Urchnuchlas was all of stone. Nothing mortal could get past those thick walls, and nothing uncanny past the women gathered at the hearth, especially tonight. Outside, the wind whined around the stone walls, and made the seats farthest from the hearth almost as cold as if the poor fellows relegated to them were sitting out on the walls. They were making up for the cold by drinking plenty of ale and mead. Inside, the draughts made flames of the torches on the walls flatten and dance, and even the huge open fire on the hearth in the centre of the hall flickered this way and that, sending streamers of smoke into people's faces unpredictably. Gwen was glad she was sitting on the stone floor, a bit of old sheepskin between her and the flags, where she was below the smoke. She hugged her knees to her chest, and listened to the women of her mother's circle with the wide eyes of a young owl. Firelight illuminated familiar faces and made them strange with shifting shadows and hectic light. The hall was the biggest room in the castle and served many purposes. By day it was in turn her father's audience chamber, the place where meals were served and the scene of most domestic work that wasn't done in the kitchen. By night her father's men and servants slept there. The walls were as thick as Gwen's arm was long, broken only by narrow windows too small for anyone but a child to climb through. Right now, heavy wooden shutters closed off the worst of the winds. The hearth fire in the centre gave most of the heat and light, supplemented by the torches on the walls. The stone floor was covered with rushes, newly changed just two days ago, so the herbs strewn among them were still sweet, and the floor beneath still clean. The ceiling was lost in darkness, and further obscured by the smoke rising to the louvered hole above the hearth. It smelled of dampness, of spilled ale, of herbs and cooked meat, of sweaty bodies and wet wool. Faintly, because it had only been two days since it had been swept clean, there was a taint of urine from the dogs and cats that ran free in here, but above all it smelled of smoke. The women had claimed the hearth itself, sitting about the fire on benches and stools, or like Gwen and her sisters, on the floor, and the men did not challenge them. No sane man challenged a wise woman, much less a gaggle of them. Behind them, on the mead benches, were the men of her father's following. He was Lloyd Ogavan Gower, called the Giant, and unchallenged king of these parts. There were no more Romans to contest his rule. The Romans had come and now gone from here. They mined their tin, lead, and gold no more, and the amphitheatre they had built for their so-called games now echoed only to the wail of wild cats at night. And good riddance, said her mother. 
Her father's words were more pithy and profane. The good-natured growling and grumbling of the men sounded like a muttering chorus of sleepy bears on the edge of hibernation, fat with autumn berries and nuts, and thinking mostly about sleep. Partly that was the mead and ale of her mother Ellery's brewing. She put herbs in it, she said to flavour it, but the women all knew it was to make the men calm and sleepy, and that was a secret that would never be breathed to the men, not even the king, her husband. There was little argument on Aga van Gower's mead benches, and no hot-tempered quarrels that could break into blood feud. Ellery, the queen, was a wise woman in the sense of knowing the ways of herbs as well as of magic, and she reckoned it worth the effort to keep the men from making more grief than there already was in the world. Bronwyn, who served as her right hand and the children's nurse, was the keeper of her secrets. Hunting and fighting and tall tales were the order of business on the mead benches tonight. With the harvest over, it was hunting that would keep the men busy until spring, and hunting would be needed to keep the hall fed if the winter was a harsh one. Magic was the subject on the hearthstone. It was the provenance of women, and a very few, very select group of men. The druids, the bards, the occasional hermit healer. Ellery had told Gwen that this was because men spent too much time around cold iron, wearing it in the form of weapons, crafting it, cherishing it. Magic shuns cold iron, she had said with a decided nod. Men might have the gift, but while they cling to cold iron, they'll never have the power. Gwen most especially watched her mother, listened to her words, for the queen was also the chief sorceress here, and high in the councils of the wise. Ellery had the power, and had it in abundance. Gwen had watched her by full moon and waning, by midsummer sun, and midwinter dark, weaving her power into the spells that were the weapons she wielded to defend, protect, and nurture their people. There were two thrones in Lloyd Ogavan Gower's high hall, the one at the mead benches and the one at the hearth, and both were equal. The king guarded the people with his sword, the queen did so with power. There were those that said the queen was fey-touched. Certainly, despite having given birth to Gwen and all her sisters, she often seemed as young as any of the maids at her hearth. There were those that said the two youngest of the brood, Gwen and her younger sister, took after her. But those that said so did so with a touch of pride, not fear, so if they were fey-touched, then that would be a good thing. Gwen's sisters sat beside her, watching and listening just as raptly. Ginath, who was almost twelve summers, Kataruna, who was fourteen, and Gwen Weevach, a mere five, the sister enough like her to have been Gwen's twin, all listened and remained very, very quiet, lest they be remembered and sent off to bed. All the sisters had much the same look about them, they got their looks from their mother, who was slim and very fair, a rarity among dark people, and not the king, who was burly, and even rarer, had a head of hair like copper wire. They had a visitor this night, who would stay through Sarwin to give their rights a special power. Ellery was concerned that the old men and women were right, that this would be a hard winter, and she would do whatever it took to keep her people safe through it. But it was not talk of the winter to come, and the Sarwin rites that occupied them now. It was talk of Arthur, the High King, and his court at Kehliwig. And so the High King takes a bride, and the Merlin is making sure the land rites are performed, the Lady Visitor was saying. She was very important, a priestess and a sorceress, from the great school at the Well of the Cauldron. 
And not afore time, too, muttered old Bronwyn. Asking for trouble it was, leaving it for so long. It'll be a hard winter, thanks to all this dallying. As the king goes, so goes the land, and that's a fact. She made a sour face as the rest of the women nodded. If the king be wifeless and childless, how can the land be anything but cold and hard? All very well to say the Merlin could make up for it, but he's only a man, one man, and— Hush, Ellery interrupted, chiding her woman, and the visitor nodded with approval. What's done is done. The land hasn't suffered. The land has a long memory and longer patience. One hard winter will not ruin the land, and the Merlin has brought him round to the bride and the rites. The woman sighed. And now I am here to ask you, has the High King's half-sister been among you? Morgana? Ellery shook her head. You surely do not mean Anna Morgors. I have not seen her in a year or more. The Orkney clan does not favour us with their attention much. Why? The visitor shrugged, but looked troubled. It is Anna Morgors, I mean. Morgana is hardly more than a child, for all her power, and she heeds the Merlin and the counsel of the wise. But Morgors! Anna is a woman grown, with four sons she would fain see raised high. She has the power and willfulness, and she is wedded to Lot, who speaks the High King fair, but watches through his fingers. And Morgors speaks the council fair, but— But Ellery shook her head. Rianu, be careful of what you say. Have you anything more than gossip and your own suspicions? Has the cauldron shown a vision of the future? The visitor looked away a moment. No and no, she admitted. Ellery smiled slightly. Have done, then, and tell us of the bride. If gossip there will be, let it be of bright things and not dark, truth and not suspicion. Anna of the Orkneys will do as she does, and if the cauldron gives you no visions, then that is the will of the goddess. Gwen Weavar pondered the visitor. She did not seem like someone who would gossip to make trouble, and normally Ellery would have deferred to her judgment, since she was older and a very powerful wise woman indeed, one of the nine who served the cauldron of the goddess. But her mother must know something that made her say what she had. Perhaps there was bad blood between the Rianu and Queen Morgors, and perhaps Ellery knew about it. Rianu pursed her lips, then seemed to resign herself. Well, her name is Gwenwivar, like your own daughter, and the name suits her, for she is very like to all of you, as fair as a Saxon, and slender as a reed. She was not our first choice, but Arthur came to the aid, if her father, Léon de Grance, saw her firing arrows from the walls, with her fine gown curted up, and fire in her eye. She shrugged. He was smitten, and she is of the right bloodline and of our teaching. But— Ellery raised an eyebrow. But— she is her father's only child. We question whether his blood grows thin. The good goddess knows Uther's line. Ellery looked speculative. Hmm, one child only, Arthur himself. And never a by-blow by Leman or lover. And it took the Merlin's magic to quicken Arthur in Igraine's womb. Ellery nodded. Still, at least now Arthur has found a woman he wants, and all else is suitable. Passion has a magic all its own, and the rites themselves should ensure that there is at least one child. Rianu coughed. We intend to make certain of that, she said, and significant glances were shared among the women. 
"'That is Chancy meddling in those matters,' Ellery murmured softly. "'Have a care that your enterprise does not miscarry.' Gwen shivered at that moment as an icy finger traced itself along her spine. "'Has any one troubled to scry the results?' Ellery continued as Gwen shivered again. "'There will be a son born to Arthur within the proper season,' Rianu replied with confidence, at least one. Sons, said the king cheerfully, coming up behind his wife, or sons are all very well, but a king's wealth is in his daughters. A son may run off and pledge his service to another man in another crown, but a daughter remembers what is due her sire. What is that old saw, my sweet? He set both hands on Alary's shoulders, and she reached up to squeeze one with affection. A son is a son till he takes a wife, but a daughter's a daughter for all of her life, Alary responded, tilting her head back to look at him and being rewarded with a kiss. There, you see, the king beamed at their visitor, and there is my wealth. Fair daughters, strong and comely, and I know they will remember their duty to land and sire. If the High King wants loyal allies, let him have daughters to cement those bonds. If he wants magic to safeguard his kingdom, let him have daughters to spin him spells and speak for him to the gods. And if he is very lucky, he will also have a daughter that is a warrior woman, for they make the most loyal shield-bearers. Gwen noticed at that moment that the queen looked as if she was harboring a pleasant secret. But she said nothing, only again squeezed the king's hand, and the king chuckled and went back to his men. But what of Anna Morgos? Ellery asked after a moment. If there is anything about her you should be warning us against, it is your duty to make it plain. The visitor grimaced with distaste, then looked pointedly down at Gwen and her sisters. Gwen sighed. If she had been just a little off to the side, there was a chance that the visitor would not have noticed her. That happened a lot. Then she tried concentrating very, very hard on not being noticed. Sometimes that worked, more and more as she got the knack of it. But not tonight. Much to Gwen's dismay, her mother took the hint. "'Off with you,' she said in a quiet voice that nevertheless brooked no argument. "'Time for bed.' The girls didn't even try to dissuade their mother. They just picked up whatever they had been sitting on and trudged off to the private rooms behind the dais. This was a grand, grand castle indeed. Behind the dais, through a wooden door, was a set of two small rooms where the royal family and their immediate servants slept, away from the tumble of bodies in the great hall. A pair of rush-lights, one left burning in each room, lit the way just enough that the girls didn't stumble over anything. The first room was theirs. It was smaller than the second, and had just enough space for the big bed where they all slept, and their clothing chests lining the walls. Mag, the servant woman they all shared, who had been their nursemaid when they were smaller, helped them pull off their outer clothing and fold it neatly, each on top of her own chest. Then they clambered into the big bed, which Mag had warmed with a stone she'd put near to the fire earlier. They had their own particular order for this. The two most restless, Gwen Weevar and Gwen Weevark, on the outside, and Kataruna and Ginath on the inside. The bed, with its woollen blankets woven by Eleri and her women, its fur coverlet from bearskins of the bears killed by their own father, could easily have slept two more. They even had a feather mattress, an immense luxury. Gwen was the last to climb in, and Mag shut them in with the bed curtains, leaving them in the close darkness. Gwen was always the last to climb in, because if she didn't wait, 
her sister Gwen Weavok, the baby of the family, would find some sly way to torment her. Poke, prod, pull hair, pinch, they were as alike as twins. Everyone said so, and no one could understand why Gwen Weavok hated her sister so. When little Gwen was in a fine mood, she was enchantingly beautiful and bewitched everyone around her. Her hair, like Gwen's, was as light a gold as sunlight, her eyes large and a melting blue when she wanted something. She put Gwen in mind of the tale of the maiden made of flowers sometimes. She was so slender and graceful, even when she was up to mischief. In fact, her real name wasn't Little Gwen at all, but everyone insisted they looked so much alike the name had stuck, and no one even remembered what name she'd been given at birth any more. Perhaps that was why. Perhaps she sorely resented that they were so much alike. It certainly wasn't because Little Gwen was being deprived. If anything, being the youngest and so pretty, she was spoiled. Then again, Maybe it upset her that there was anyone who could be said to be as pretty as she was, much less that it was her older sister. Even Gwen Weavar was at a loss. She didn't remember doing anything that would have warranted this. If their positions had been reversed, had Gwen Weavar been the youngest, there would be some cause for that resentment. But no— it had been little Gwen that had usurped the position of youngest from her year older sister, and she'd scarcely begun to toddle when she made her enmity known. From that day, Gwen's life had been a struggle to avoid her clever sister's tiny tortures. One thing she had learned early on, never strike back. Little Gwen was never caught, at least not by an adult, and retribution on Gwen's part only brought down the wrath of an adult. Gwen was the oldest. Logic said that when there was a quarrel, she was the aggressor, for why would a smaller child bully a larger? When Gwen displayed bruises, she was told that was what she deserved for picking on her younger sibling. Her older sisters knew what was going on, of course, but protests to an adult only got them told not to take sides. That was the other reason for having a Gwen on either side of the bed, with two sisters in between. It stopped the fighting. Well, mostly. It's all your fault, little Gwen whispered in the dark. You got us sent to bed, Gwen Weavar. We could still be there, if not for you. Me? What did I do? Gwen demanded, as both her sisters sighed with exasperation. You weren't quiet enough. You made the Queen look at you. You were fidgeting. You always fidget. This from the person that Mag always checked for fleas, since by the nursemaid's way of thinking, anyone who squirmed that much must be harboring a host of fleas. Did not? Did so? Did no such thing. Did so. Give over, snapped Ginnath, the eldest of them all. Gwen did no more fidgeting than you, and was a deal less obvious about wanting to hear every word about the Queen of the Orkneys. Now go to sleep. I can't, little Gwen whined. I'm cold. Gwen stole all the covers. Since Gwen was barely covered by the drape of the blankets, this was obviously a lie. Did not? Did so? Couldn't have, Ginnath said smugly. I tucked them under the feather bed on your side. You're a liar, and that just proves you're a changeling. I knew it. The fair folk took the real baby and left you in her place. No wonder you're a little horror. I'm not. Little Gwen said furiously, and she stole the covers. Ow! This last punctuated the thump on the head her older and much larger sister gave her. Give over, Ginnath repeated. Go to sleep, or I'll tip you out, and you can lie on the floor with the dogs all night. I'm lying with bitches now, Little Gwen muttered, and Ginnath thumped her again for her pains, 
and at last she subsided. Gwen turned on her side, her back to her sisters, and stared at the place where the curtains met. Stealthily, because if little Gwen knew what she was doing, there would be whining about letting the draught in, she parted the curtains with a finger and peered across the room at the light visible through the gaps between the door and door frame, straining her ears to make out something besides the indecipherable muttering of voices. She had wanted to hear more, too, but not about Anna Moore Gores. She wanted to hear about magic and the power. Hearing about, watching someone working magic always gave her a shivery good feeling. She couldn't wait until she came into her own power. She wondered what it would be like. Some, like Eleri, could do just about anything in reason. Some were just healers. Some could command the weather, or see into the past, or the future. She wanted to be able to do it all, though. Well, who wouldn't? And she wanted something else. She wanted to be a chariot driver and a warrior. There had to be a way to keep the power and still wield cold iron. Sometimes she felt torn in two, wanting both those things. But there was no doubt, no doubt at all, that when she came into her gift she would be sent to the ladies. The doubt came whether the king would be willing, no matter what he said, for a daughter to take up weapons. There were not many warrior women, and most girls who tried the life soon gave it up. That wasn't the only reason she strained to listen to the talk at the hearth. Besides hearing about magic, she wanted to hear about this new queen, with the same name as her. She wondered what life was like for this slender, fair young woman. Did her father have a castle like this one? Clearly, if she was a good archer, he let her train with the warriors. Oh, how Gwen wanted to do that, too! Well, maybe. She would have to be careful that the power didn't desert her because she handled cold iron too much. But there had to be a way. That Gwen Weevar had done it. But if there isn't, which do I want? To be a warrior or the power? Did she have sisters? Probably not, and probably not brothers either, if she had been on the walls shooting arrows at her father's enemies. Brothers were funny about things like that. Gwen had overheard plenty of fights when some of the boys tried to keep their sisters from training with the warriors and the like. No, from the sound of it, she was an only child. Oh, yes, Gwen remembered now, something about the blood being thin, and only the one daughter in the line. So there it was. Gwen envied her. It must be wonderful to be an only child, no having to share everything, no big sisters that thumped your head, nor horrible little teases of a younger sister. She'd have gotten the best of everything. Only children got spoilt, everyone knew that. And now to be marrying the High King, to be his equal in all things. She would have her own court, Everyone knew that the power of the land went through the queen as well as the king. She was trained by the ladies, so she would probably be the one in charge of all the things having to do with the power, subject to the Merlin, of course. She would have her own horses to ride, and not have to share one elderly pony with three sisters. And, oh, the clothing! probably enough to fill chests and chests. She would have new clothing, not things that had been cut down from adult garments and then passed down until by the time Gwen got them they had lost any colour they had once had and any trimming had long since been pulled off. In fact, with three sisters handing down the same clothing, it was little Gwen who actually had the best of it, since by the time Gwen was done with what Ginnath handed down to her, it was suitable only for padding, patches, and baby's clouts. 
little Gwen got true second hand, just like the eldest of them. There would be fur linings to that Gwen Weaver's cloak and hood. There would be embroidered hems to her gowns, and her shifts would be the softest lamb's wool and linen. She would dress like Eleri did on rare feast days, only she would do so every day, because she was High Queen. All her clothes would be coloured, and she'd never have to wear anything faded or plain again. Except her shifts. Her shifts would be linen so blinding white they'd think she was a spirit. In fact, in fact, she would have one gown that was that white too, whiter than snow, whiter than clouds. Everything she wore would be soft, too. No scratchy linens for her, no itchy wool. And no shoes she had to wear three pairs of stockings with to keep them on. Shoes would be made to fit her feet, and hers alone. She'd have the best food, too. Whatever she wanted, like as not. The best cuts of meat, the slices from the middle of the loaf, Succulent cakes and pies whenever she liked. Goose, oh lovely goose, and the rich fat to dip her bread in. They'd let her have all the sweet mead she wanted. Apples, pears, plums, cherries, and berries of every sort. She would have a stable full of horses, one of every colour there was. And a falcon, a real one, not just a little sparrow-hawk, a real peregrine, or a goshawk, and a coursing hound with an elegant long-eared head. She would go hunting whenever she felt like it, and no one would tell her that she couldn't. There would be a bard all the time in the court, too, and jugglers and gleemen and all sorts of things. She could hear whatever tales she wanted, whenever she wanted, and if she woke up in the middle of the night and wanted to hear one, well, she could. And she would, of course, have great power and command the most serious of magic. The High Queen was also the chief of all of the wise, and at the most important of the rituals of the year, she was the avatar of the lady for all of the land. Gwen had seen Eleri coming back from the great rites, face flushed, eyes shining, exultant, and more alive than at any other time. Gwen wanted to feel like that one day. Well, one day she would. Eleri had promised as much. One day she, Gwen, would be leading the rituals, making the magic happen. Suddenly, though, amidst all her envy, something else occurred to Gwen. Would it be worth all those wonderful things, to have to go so far away from home, to never know if you were ever going to see your mother or father again, to have nothing around you but strangers. Maybe not. Unable to hear anything meaningful, Gwen let the bed curtains fall closed and wriggled closer to her sister. The bed was soft and warmed by the heat of four bodies. They were all safe in here, and tomorrow the bird hunters were going out, and there would almost certainly be goose, and then there would be stories, and maybe some rough music, and their visitor would talk more about magic. And Gwen would be able to look up from her place on the hearth, look around her, and know every face in the hall. Maybe being High Queen wasn't so wonderful after all. Chapter 2 Gwen had not meant to overhear her mother and the priestess. Indeed, she hadn't. It was a cold, bright day, and she had been given sacks of goose and swan feathers to pick over and sort, for the king and his men had gone out bird-hunting and brought back a plentiful catch. Eleri was strict about idleness. There was to be none if there were tasks to be done, and Gwen was deft-handed enough to be trusted with this one. She wouldn't lose a single feather, she wouldn't sort where the wind could carry them off, and she wouldn't leave dirt on any of them. Not even Ginnath picked feathers as clean as Gwen could. She knew better than to sort inside, 
A chance draught might send the precious feathers into the fire. So she circled the castle and grounds and came to one of her favorite spots just below the window of her parents' room on the south wall. This spot got sun all day and was sheltered from the wind. The lush grass made a good place to sit and no one was likely to disturb her. So she slowly picked through the feathers. Precious down feathers went into one sack for making the softest of pillows and feather beds. Body feathers went into a second for feather beds of lesser quality. Longer feathers went to a third sack to be used as needed, and the primary and secondary wing feathers went to a fourth to be used for fletching arrows and very occasionally for quill pens, although there was no one here that could write more than reckonings. Dirty feathers had to be carefully picked clean, but her reward was that she could have any feathers she liked from the third sack. She had already made plans for a feather skirt for her doll, and maybe a feather cloak, too. It was not hard work, nor difficult to understand, but painstaking. Gwen was clever and dexterous, and besides, she loved the silky feeling of the feathers, the subtle plays of greys and whites and browns, so she never complained about getting this chore. Despite the cold, the sun had warmed warmth into the turf and the stones at this spot. She put her back up against the stones and set to work. She was halfway through the second sack when she heard voices. She quickly recognized Eleri and the visitor, who must have sought out the privacy of the solar in order to keep their words from the ears of the inveterate gossips. She concentrated very hard at that moment, willing them not to look out of the window, even though Eleri knew she was picking feathers and that this was her favorite place to do so. "'Now tell me what you would not say in public about Anne of Orkney,' Eleri demanded in what Gwen thought of as her queenly voice. "'If there is danger to this realm from her, I want to know about it.' "'That is the trouble.' The things that I know are as hard to hold to as water, the priestess replied. The priestesses, great and small, are not of one mind on this. Some think Anne of Orkney is dangerous. Some think her ambition will be held in check by the High King and the Merlin. And some think that nothing will hold her if she reaches beyond her current status. I know that she holds to the old ways and under any other circumstances I would be inclined to her for that alone. But, but, she sighed, I know that Lot is ambitious. I know that his wife is equally ambitious, and I believe that there is not much either of them would scruple at to advance their ambitions. I know that she has the power— and I know that she will use it to further her own ends rather than the welfare of the land. But how far she would go, I cannot say with any degree of certainty. The High King has a son, said Eleri, sounding irritated. He has a son by the girl called Leonore. Lorolt, she calls him. Does he need more? The priestess made a tisking sound. But she was not his wife, and it is only we of the West that still hold to the old ways, at least publicly. If your husband had a son by another than you, and he chose to make that son his heir, and you put your blessing upon it, no one here would think it amiss. But in the lands where the Romans once held full sway, the High King must have a son by a true wife, one wedded to him by a Christian priest, as well as promises, and sealed in betrothal. The old rites do not signify. Gwen listened to this carefully. This seemed very strange to her. There were plenty of couples among her father's people who had never even seen a Christian priest, nor had any priest or priestess say any words over them whatsoever, and yet no one doubted they were husband and wife. Jumping the fire at Beltane, 
jumping the broom among friends. That was enough for most. Only those with land or with some title of honour seemed to need the formality of vows and blessings. Blessings were for babies who needed every help they could get, and the proof of that was that there were four small graves with other daughters of Eleri in them that did not live to see the full turn of the seasons. But the priestess was continuing. The truth is, young as he is, the High King has many sons, but none of them are, a pause, suitable to us, to the others. None were sired on a girl to whom he had any true tie. None has he accepted as his heir. None were sired on girls that the servants of the goddess approve of, girls of the proper bloodline with the powers. All are, again a pause, inferior. They are of no importance. Attempts to see into their future show nothing of note, not a hint that the goddess cares for them any more or less than she cares for any other of her daughters. They are toys for the young high king's bed. Their sons will be numbered among his warriors, but will never be outstanding. They are ordinary. The high king's son cannot be ordinary. Eleri snorted. So... The High King must breed him a son on a girl acceptable to us and to the followers of the White Christ, a girl with the powers, a young woman like this Gwen Weavard he is wedding. So? The priestess responded reluctantly. The scrying bull shows me nothing I can make sense of. I see a son of Arthur vying for the throne, not one holding it unopposed and I see the Merlin and blood connected with that son, but I cannot make out what that means. She hesitated. I see the death of many children associated with the birth, and yet I see him surrounded by all the signs that says he has the right to the throne, and I see him as a man of the powers. I think... It would be wise to avoid the wedding. Eleri sniffed. We could not go in any case. Arthur has our pledged fealty from his coronation, and he scarcely needs it a second time. That is a very long way to go with winter coming on, and all for a feast that we could as well hold ourselves, which to show our loyalty to the king we shall, with bonfire and all, there will be nothing to complain of in our demonstration of fealty. Suddenly her tone changed. Do you see Morgoth's ambition spreading to these lands? Not directly, the priestess said, though reluctantly, and Eleri breathed a sigh of relief. Then hear me out. The magic to make the High King a son will be a powerful one, and I am minded to sip at that same cup. Eleri continued, My man speaks highly of his daughters, and he loves them true, but... But a man wants a son, and a king wants a son more than most men, the priestess sighed. To answer your question, that cup will indeed be overflowing, and if you as the chief priestess here were to open yourself to what is not needed you likely will find yourself graced with the same gift. But, Eleri, there is danger there. There may be a reason why the goddess has seen fit to give you all daughters. It may be because of the blessing in your blood. We cannot know that, or, if it is true, what that reason is. If you flout her will in this, there may be consequences. The goddess has seen fit to give me a husband I have come to love, to love enough to give him something he wants and will not ask for. Oh, Gwen knew that tone. The queen was not to be denied. This was what would be, and woe betide whoever stood between her and the goal. 
Then, for what it is worth, my blessing be upon you, the priestess sounded resigned. In this I cannot speak for the goddess. You have given me leave, and that is enough, Elleri said firmly. Gwen heard their footsteps leaving. Gwen continued to pick through and clean the feathers, trying to piece together what this all meant. All that talk of sons and the High King only puzzled her. She couldn't imagine what these Christian priests had to do with who the High King picked as his heir. But then again, that didn't matter. The High King was very far away, and what he did in Keliwig hardly even caused a ripple here. But what Eleri was up to, that troubled her, though she could not have said why. She knew very well where babies came from. Her mother was midwife as well as queen, and the great hall where all the rest of the court slept was open to any sleepless child that would rather go outside than use a chamber pot. Gwen had seen the dogs and cats, the chickens and ducks and geese, her father's famous horses, and no few of her father's men and her mother's maids, coupling with pleasurable abandon and no regard for privacy. So she knew where babies came from and what made them, and she had also known most of her life in that vague sense that put parents in some mental place other than everyone else, that the king and queen did this same thing in their great bed. Well, they must have, to have produced Gwen and all her sisters. But this sounded more portentous than that. Magic would be involved, and her mother was going to try and make a son for the king. Gwen turned that thought over and over in her mind, she wasn't sure she liked this idea, not sure at all. She felt more than a twinge of jealousy. A boy child would get all the attention right from the start. He'd be the king one day. He'd be able to order his sisters about in every place but the circle of the goddess and the hearth. Her father would take all the attention he now paid his daughters and lavish it on this newcomer. And why was her mother doing this? Because she had said she loved the king? Yes, but didn't she love her daughters? Didn't she realize how they would feel, how they would be made to take second place? A boy would get a pony as soon as he could walk. She was still waiting for hers, one that she didn't have to share with her sisters. He'd get a real horse as soon as he'd mastered the pony. He would get lessons in the sword and the bow without ever having to ask for them, much less beg. When the time came for chores, he would get the interesting ones, not weaving or spinning, picking feathers or sewing. He would get hunting, hawking, mending weapons, fletching arrows, making bowstrings. How could she not be jealous? But also there was curiosity, not about the wished-for son, but about the magic that would make him. It was magic for the High King, and Eleri was going to share in it, and that did not sound right. Surely that was not right. That magic should go to the High King only, and not someone else, even if that someone was her mother. It was magic, from the sound of it, that would be made in circles across the land, the High King might not even be aware this was going to happen, but nevertheless it was magic that would stretch through every little kingdom that owed allegiance to Arthur. And that, it seemed wrong, very wrong, for Eleri to steal some of that away. If it had only been their kingdom, it would have been different, for Eleri was the priestess here and the magic that was made here should benefit this land and its priestesses. But it was not. Eleri had no right to it, did she? But this was her mother, the priestess and the queen. If anyone would know if this was right or not, surely it would be Eleri. Gwen continued to turn these things over and over in her mind, and finally she sighed and gave up. Besides, 
the topic had turned to something even more interesting. Genath seems to have little gift, the priestess was saying. She should have come into it by now. Kataruna, though, has come a great deal since I last saw her, and should already be serving by you in the rites. She is, Ellery replied with satisfaction, and that is why I would rather not send her to you. I need her here, and she is not going to be so very powerful that I cannot teach her myself. But Gwen already has the signs on her. The priestess's voice was firm with conviction. And do not think that you are not powerful, for you are. Whichever daughter you teach will be as powerful. You must send either Kataruna to us now, or Gwen to us as soon as she becomes a woman. Either will be suitable. That is my intent, the Queen said, then hesitated. But— What? the priestess asked sharply. Gwen yearns for the power, but she also yearns for the reins and the sword. And you heard her father— he favours warrior women. The Queen sighed. I do not know if that is mere words, and I do not know if this is some childish longing, but if there must be a choice, I would rather it was a sure one. The priestess chuckled. The King may well not wish to truly see one of his girls going to war, or if he allows the training, she may tire of it. Even if she began tomorrow, the power would not leave her overnight in any case, and by the time she is old enough to send, she will be old enough to understand that choice. The priestess's voice took on a shrewd tone. After all, when a maiden begins to be interested in young men, suddenly all the things of war become much less attractive. Ellery chuckled. I bow to your wisdom. They turned their talk to things in which she had no interest. Other kings, other queens, people she didn't know or care about. Gwen went back to concentrating on the feathers. There were some things she would certainly do. If there was going to be a baby brother, she was going to spend more time begging her father for those things she wanted. She would redouble her efforts to be good, she would do everything she had been asked, and some things she hadn't, all so that her father would note what a good and obedient daughter she was. And she would take good care to ask him for those things she wanted. The pony. Oh, a pony! She was almost sick with wanting one. The lessons in sword and bow, at times when he was feeling well content. She would think very hard about convincing arguments why she should have these things, too. That way, if there was a brother coming, she would have secured her booty before the baby claimed the king's attention. Making the feather skirt for the doll was easy. Just a bit of string to bind the feathers around doll's waist. The feather cloak, however, was proving a bit more problematic. She was old enough to be trusted with a bone needle of her very own, but sewing the feathers to a bit of rag was not working out as well as she had thought. She sat at old Mag's feet with the feathers in her lap, the needle and cloth in her hand, and her tongue in the corner of her mouth as she concentrated, but the feathers just pulled out of the stitches she made. Finally she put the needle back in its keeper and gave up on the idea. The feather skirt was pretty enough, and, after a moment of thought, she took the feathers she would have used for the cloak and went to the bedroom. In a corner she found little Gwen's doll and bound a similar skirt on it. Not out of kindness, out of self-defense. The moment little Gwen saw the skirt, she would want one for her doll, and if she did not get one, she would hardly trouble to make one for herself, she would ruin Gwen's the first chance she got. It had happened too many times before. Gwen had made flower crowns and skirts for her doll in the spring and summer, 
and little Gwen had torn the fragile garments off in a fury when no one would make them for her puppet. Gwen had made a bow and arrow for her doll, and little Gwen had stepped on them out of spite. Gwen had made a horse out of straw for her doll, and little Gwen had thrown it into the fire. Just for good measure, Gwen braided the yarn hair of little Gwen's doll, and stuck some remaining feathers in the braids. She thought it looked ridiculous, but it was something little Gwen's doll had that Gwen's wouldn't, and that would satisfy her fractious younger sibling. Wrapping her own doll carefully in a scrap of hide and putting her away, Gwen considered what she could do to curry favour with her father. What would he like? What would he notice? Perhaps a nice basket of nuts. She knew of one or two spots that hadn't been picked over yet, mostly because tangled underbrush full of nettles and briars made the trees hard to get to. But she was small and clever about getting into and out of such spots. She got a sack and trudged out into the sunny afternoon. At the door she stood considering what she should do, as she watched the horse-keepers exercising her father's famous beasts. The old men ran the horses around them in circles on the end of long tethers. She watched them pacing at the end of their leads, their muscles rippling under their rough winter coats, the necks arched, and their eyes bright. Once again she felt sick with longing for one of them. You didn't ride these horses to exercise them, not if you were old and not as agile as you used to be, or crippled. You needed every bit of your wits and strength to handle them. They were war horses, trained for war, pulling the dangerous war chariots or charging into the affray, and not for casual riding. All horses were beautiful, all horses were desirable, but these, oh, these, these were kings and queens among horses. When she watched them, all her desire for the power faded. Finally she turned away. These horses were not for her, not yet anyway, and if she wasted her time standing there yearning after them, they never would be. All her father's men and a few of the women were out hunting in this fine weather, for in a few days there would be a great feast, both for Sarwin and for the High King's wedding, and a great deal of meat would be needed. Should there be any excess, it would be smoked and salted against the winter. This was also the time when the herd beasts were culled for the winter, but in that case, with the exception of a single ox, it would only be the things that couldn't be preserved that would add to the feast. You didn't risk the war-horses in that sort of hunting. At least one party had gone out after boar, one had gone fowling, the rest in pursuit of deer. She hoped there would be a lot of success with the fowling party. Just once she would like to be able to eat so much goose that she didn't want any more. In theory, she wasn't supposed to go out into the forest alone. Well, she wouldn't be alone, even though none of her mother's women would care to go scrabbling for nuts. But she wasn't going to take any of the other older children, either. Instead, she marched off to the kennel and loosed Hold Hard, one of the boar hounds. All of the dogs loved her, and Hold Hard seemed to regard her as his special charge whenever he was let off his rope. With the formidable dog trotting alongside her, she made her way over the hill and down into the valley, where the little copse of hazelnut trees was what she had in mind. Hold Hard knew to be quiet when she wanted to slip away. The two of them moved stealthily enough until she was well into the woods. She avoided the oaks, and not just because they were sacred and dangerous. A thick layer of leaves and acorns carpeted the ground beneath them, and that meant the wild pigs could be feeding in there. Even a young pig could be dangerous to a child, and a grown sow or boar could easily kill a man. Hold Hard sniffed at the air and growled as they went past. Gwen called him sharply to her. Whatever he scented had to be dangerous, 
but it would likely leave the two of them alone if they left it alone. At this time of year, like men, the beast's priority was to lay up food against the cold. In the case of the beasts, that meant eating everything they could to get fat against the days of starvation. As a precaution against the nettles, she had taken more rags with her. When they reached the nut trees, she wrapped them around her hands and pulled the stinging nettles aside so that Hold Hard could worm his way in with her. Once inside the ring of nettles, thistles, and briars, it was as if she was in a different world. There wasn't a breath of wind. The branches above her were bare and let the sunlight through to warm this place as thoroughly as her little nook against the castle wall. The ground was thickly carpeted with crisp brown leaves that crackled as she sifted through them for the nuts. The air was full of the scent of them, a scent of dying, a little stuffy, with a suggestion of immense age. It was soporific, and as Gwen felt through the leaves for the hard round nuts with the sun on her back, Hold Hard flopped down into a sun-dappled spot and began to doze. Slowly the sack filled. Hold Hard snorted and snored and twitched. There was no other sound. There didn't seem to be any birds at all in this part of the woods. The sun didn't seem to move at all, and Gwen worked in a drowsy dream. And then a snort that did not belong to Hold Hard made her look up, and she froze. Through the screen of nettles she watched in numb fear as a bear shambled out of the underbrush. He swung his head from side to side as if he was trying to find something, and finally reared up on his hind legs to sniff the breeze. Hold Hard continued to sleep. She knew that she did not dare to move, for if she did, she knew that the bear would see or scent her. The bear dropped down onto all fours and snorted fretfully. Gwen prayed silently to the goddess, her lips and mouth dry with terror, that the great beast would continue to be oblivious of her presence. Her fear made everything preternaturally sharp and clear, and she saw in that clarity the grey patches on the bear's muzzle, saw that his eyes were dim rather than bright. Then those dim eyes brightened, and the bear growled, a deep rumbling that emerged from its chest and filled the air like thunder. Fear turned to horror as Gwen saw what it was that the bear had spotted. Gliding out of the deepest shadows among the bushes came a serpent. But this was an impossible creature. It was long, long, long enough that if it had its head in the king's bedroom, its tail would still be sticking out the main door of the castle. At the thickest point, its body was as big around as the chest of one of their horses. Its wicked wedge-shaped head was as big as a barrel, and its glittering eyes were the size of her fist. It could easily have swallowed one of the horses as a grass snake swallowed a frog. And it was black, an oily, glistening black, from the tip of its snout to the end of its tail. Even its flickering, forked tongue was black. The bear reared up on its hind legs and roared at it. Gwen smothered a scream as the serpent raised itself as tall as the bear's head, hissed angrily, and struck. It sank its fangs into the bear's shoulder. The bear roared with anger and pain and raked its head with terrible claws, laying the flesh open in four long, bleeding furrows. Gwen clapped her hands over her ears as the snake briefly released the bear, then struck again. This time the snake cast two coils around the bear and began to squeeze. Its eyes red with rage, the bear wheezed, but raked the serpent again and again with vicious swipes of its claws and tore at it with long white teeth. As Gwen watched breathlessly, the two combatants rolled and thrashed, tearing up the ground and the underbrush in their struggle, and aside from the sounds of combat, it was a silent struggle. The bear roared no more challenges, 
and the snake did not utter a single hiss. Suddenly there was a tremendous crack. Gwen jumped and screamed. For a long moment, serpent and bear were frozen together into a knot of fur and scales and torn flesh and blood. Then, slowly, the serpent's coils fell away from the bear, dropping limply to the forest floor. The bear had broken its spine. But the bear had not escaped unscathed. It stood there swaying from side to side for a long, long moment, bleeding from a hundred wounds. Gwen gathered herself to try and creep out of the grove and escape when the bear looked up and looked at her. She froze. There was something in its eyes, something desperate, something with a hint of recognition. The bear held her with its gaze, looking at her, making her feel that it was trying somehow to tell her something. Then it moaned once, and its legs buckled, and it toppled clumsily to the ground. There was a roaring in Gwen's ears. Little black specks danced before her eyes, then grew, then covered everything with blackness, a darkness that she fell into, and forgot the bear and blood and serpent and all. When she opened her eyes again, there was no sign of the bear, nor the serpent. The forest floor was undamaged, the underbrush rustled undisturbed, and Hold Hard snored on, as if nothing whatsoever had happened. Gwen was silent all through the meal, even when her father petted and praised her for the treat she had brought him. She smiled up at him as little Gwen seethed, but the smile was only on her lips. Her mind was still on that terrible fight in the forest, trying to understand how it could have happened, and then not happened. She had not been dreaming. She was very sure of that. She had not been asleep. That meant it could only be one thing, a vision. She didn't want to tell her mother about it somehow. She really didn't want to tell anyone, really. But she had to know what it meant, and if she could not tell her mother, there was only one person she could unburden herself to, provided that person would listen to her. After the meal was over, and the women had gathered at the hearth, as the men gathered at the mead benches, instead of sitting at her mother's feet, as she usually did, Gwen allowed little Gwen to usurp her place without a murmur. Instead, she settled away from the warmth of the fire, just in the shadows, and fixed her gaze on the priestess, silently willing the woman to look at her. If it worked to will people not to look at her, the opposite should be true, too, shouldn't it? For the longest time the priestess seemed oblivious to Gwen's gaze, the usual talk went on, of the luck of the hunt that day, of the feast to come on Sarwin, of those who were expected to pledge to each other by leaping the fire that night, of the thickness of the wool, the taste of the wind, speculation on how hard the winter to come might be. But finally, slowly, the priestess turned her head and looked into Gwen's eyes, her solemn gaze met Gwen's anxious one, and finally she nodded once, then indicated the door with a little inclination of her head. Gwen got up and headed for the door, as if she was going to relieve herself at the privy, but she lingered beside the door, shivering in the cold with her cloak around her, waiting for the priestess. She did not have long to wait. The priestess slipped through the door and shut it against the wind, then reached down and gripped Gwen's shoulder. "'Your eyes were burning holes in my back, child,' she said calmly. "'What is your trouble? For surely you have one. If you gave up your place at the hearth and hardly smiled at your father's thanks—' "'I—I I saw something,' Gwen blurted. Then the words came tumbling out of her like an avalanche of pebbles as she described the battle of serpent and bear. When she was finished, 
she waited in silence. I do not know what this means, the priestess said after a long silence in which the cold wind whipped their cloaks about them. But it is a vision, and one portentous for you, I have no doubt. But I cannot tell what it means. Oh, Gwen said in a small and disappointed voice. But I will meditate on this, the priestess continued, and if the goddess sends me enlightenment, I will tell you. The hand on Gwen's shoulder relaxed, and the priestess gave her a little pat. You did well to tell me, Gwen Weaver. Such visions are rare. Your mother has never had one. Should you have another such, do not fear to confide it to a priestess. I won't, said Gwen, and that seemed all there was to say. Feeling vaguely cheated, she went back inside and spent the rest of the evening on the edge of the cluster of her sisters, shivering, until the queen sent them all to bed. Chapter 3 The morning of Sarwin dawned as perfect as anyone could have asked for. The sun was warm enough for pleasure, and not so warm as to make the old people grumble about summer out of season and bad omens. A cloudless sky and not even a hint of wind meant that the fires would send their smoke straight up and not into anyone's face. A hard frost three days ago had killed the flies, the hunts had been outstanding, and in short everything was as perfect as one could want to celebrate the High King's wedding, the harvest, and the rites of the Lady of the Fields and the Lord of the Wood. Gwen and her sisters were rewarded for much hard work in the days before by being given a holiday today. They couldn't stay a bed, though. The moment the sun was up, so were they, getting their hair braided, putting on their best gowns and shifts. The castle hall was full of people already. Folk had been coming for days, and every little space where someone could lay his head had been taken up by someone. There were even tents pitched all about the castle, and people sleeping in them. When the girls left their room, the sleepers had already been cleared from the great hall, and trestle tables set up along the wall, laden with bread and autumn fruit and honey for folk to break their fast on, and ale for drinking. For the girls, however, there was a tastier treat of sops in wine, and watered wine with honey to sweeten it. All of them helped themselves to apples once they had cleaned their bowls, both figuratively and literally. It was only dawn, and a long time to dinner. Already there was activity everywhere in the hall, but especially out on the green and about the village. Great cauldrons of soup were cooking, ovens fired up with the first baking of the day. The boar's head, the baked meats, fish and fowl, the fruit pies, the cakes and baked vegetables that would be served at dinner. The second baking would be for meat pies for supper, and more fish and fowl. There was a whole ox roasting at one fire, and a whole wild boar at another. Sawin was not a religious festival, although tonight there would be the great working for the High King. It was the equinox that was the significant date, when the Winter King slew his rival, the Summer King, as the summer equinox was when the young stag slew the old. Sawin was the celebration of the end of harvest, and the time when those animals who were to be killed for winter meat were culled out. Anything that could not be preserved must be eaten, so why not make a festival out of it? The butchered beasts were already rendered into quarters, and in the pickling vats, the smokehouse, or the salt packs. Sausages were already made up and curing. The brewing was done, the ale and mead in their casks. Still the women were hard at work, tending to the cooking. Innards and bones, hooves and vegetable scraps had gone into pies and soup, for nothing was wasted. The common folk would get their portion of the ox and the boar, 
everyone got at least a small share of meat, but mostly they would be eating their fill of the soup. It was the guests of the king that would feast on the choicer stuffs. So this was mostly a celebration for the menfolk. The hard work of farming was over, and the year was about to descend into the dark. Not a bad time of year to hand fast, for the sharing of a bed now could mean a fine babe in the summer. A bed was warmer with two in it. This would be the last time of abundance before the hoarding of winter. Gwen's father made a point to bring in all his warriors for the days of feasting, organizing contests and games. There were even musicians, and not just the ones from the village. He was a surprisingly tender-hearted man as well when children were concerned. As this was the time of year when many a lamb grown into a sheep, gosling now big and grey and honking, or pink piglet grown fat went under the knife, he saw to it that there were plenty of things to occupy the children that had made these creatures into pets. So when the former pet became quarters, ham and sausages hanging in the smokehouse, it was all done when the child was occupied with dancing or gaming or stuffing himself with unaccustomed treats. As Gwen headed purposefully out with her pockets bulging with apples, she did not follow after her older sisters, who were making straight towards the fields where some of the older boys were engaged in wrestling, archery, and sling contests, and the hurling of wool sacks. She also made sure to lose little Gwen at the moment when her younger sister was distracted by a game of tag. Little Gwen could not bear to be left out of anything that promised attention, and once the child's attention was fully occupied, Gwen took advantage of a couple of geese being chased to get away. Gwen didn't want to play tag or hoops, to run races for prizes, or watch the older boys and men compete at feats of strength. She wasn't interested in the quieter pursuits of playing with poppets or merrills, and she certainly wasn't interested in the mock hand-fasting that was going on, nor the flirtations of her oldest sister. She made her way with quiet determination to where the horses had been tethered. She knew better than to approach them. Handling the war horses was strictly the work of those who were given that privilege, sometimes boys, and rarely girls, but mostly fully grown men and the occasional woman. But feast days like these were the only time she ever got to see them do the sorts of things they had been trained to do. At the moment they were being readied for the chariot races. The Romans were the ones that had introduced the chariot to the tribes, but once they had seen chariots in action, there was no stopping the tribes from adopting the vehicle. But unlike the Roman races, which were held in the Colosseums and on round or oval tracks, and were consequently hideously dangerous for driver and horses alike, these races, like the ridden ones that would come later, were held on the straight, from a line out to some distant spot, then a turn, and back to the start. Horses were too valuable to lose to accidents that could easily be prevented. The chariots were light wicker affairs, and never pulled by more than two horses. The wheels had iron rims and iron fittings, and the wicker cars themselves were open in front, with a curved wall behind. The chariot that their father used for important occasions had seats. These racing chariots did not. Nor did they have the scythes on the wheels that the war chariots had. The war chariots were fearsome things, and Gwen had never, of course, ever seen them in use in battle. But these races would demonstrate some of the skill of the charioteers and the warriors that fought with them. There were four in the first race, which was a very special challenge match. Two of them were her father's horses and driven by his men. The other two belonged to two of his war chiefs. The king was well known to be a generous winner and a gracious loser. No one would hold back for fear of displeasing him. These would be excellent races. Now as much as Gwen yearned after the horses like one gone love-struck, 
There was one pair and their driver that Gwen particularly wanted to watch, and they were not her father's horses. They belonged to Hid Ap Kai, one of the king's oldest friends, and the chariot driver was a woman. Her name was Braith, and Gwen had watched her race a score of times. She was amazing in the races, and Gwen wondered what she would be like in battle. She seemed to be absolutely fearless. She was known for running out onto the pole, standing on the yoke to help balance for a fast turn, running back to the chariot again. Precious time could be lost in the turns, precious in a race, and Gwen supposed precious in a fight, too. Running the pole like that helped in a turn. Gwen had even, once, when the chariot had hit an unseen rock and shattered, seen Braith leap onto the horses' backs and drive them with one foot on each horse, her hair coming loose from its braids and streaming behind her like the horses' tails. She'd been disqualified, for after all, in a chariot race, it is expected that there be a chariot behind the horses, but people were still talking about the feet. Braith was indeed in the first race, and Gwen edged as near as she dared, watching her idol crooning to and soothing her team. They weren't a matched team, like the king's two. The left-hand one was a dark chestnut, the right hand a dun. Braith combed her fingers through their coarse manes, ran her hands along their stocky necks, and whispered into their short, broad ears, standing between them as if she was a third horse in the traces. Gwen watched her with raw envy, her fingers itching and twitching with longing to touch those soft noses, scratch those warm necks. She wasn't allowed near the war horses, ever. Too dangerous, her father said. He didn't mean dangerous for her. He meant dangerous for the horses. She might move suddenly the wrong way, or do something else that would startle them, he said. They could sprain a muscle, or make a misstep, and hurt themselves some other way. So Gwen could only watch from afar, as the betters circled the chariots, eyed the great beasts knowingly, and conversed in mutters. Gwen thought that Braith looked exactly like her team. She was stocky, weather-beaten, rough. Her bright brown eyes peered out from under a kind of forelock of coarse dark hair that looked as if she had hacked it off with her own knife in a fit of impatience. Her voice had the same intonation as a horse's whinny, and when she laughed, it was loud and sudden, and exactly like a neigh, and Gwen adored her. If there was any one in the world she would have liked to grow up to be, it was Braith. Power? Braith had power. If any one doubted, all they had to do was see her with her horses. That was Epona's power. And if Epona was a lesser goddess, well, perhaps she was closer to those who served her. The race was to begin at the sacred oak grove, and Gwen pressed herself against the bark of one of the great trees, hoping her brown gown would blend in with the bark, and yearned after Braith and her team with passion she never felt for the gods. Suddenly those bright brown eyes caught sight of Gwen and locked on her. As if pulled by their reins, her horses turned to look at what Braith was looking at, so now there were three pairs of eyes gazing thoughtfully at her. Slowly, Braith smiled, and Gwen felt a jolt of something that took her breath away. Then she went back to whispering to her team, but now and again she looked over at Gwen again and smiled. No one else seemed to notice, or if they noticed, care that Gwen was there. Her ability to be quiet and unobtrusive was working even in this crowd. So she was allowed to watch with the rest as the drivers got into their chariots, as the chariots maneuvered into a roughly straight line, and then, at the shout from the king, reins slapped on backs, whips snapped, and the teams plunged out onto the rough sward for the outward leg of the race. Gwen would have swarmed up the tree, but she was wearing her one good gown, 
and she knew what her nurse and the queen would have to say about it if the garment was ruined before it was even dinner. So she just ran to stand in front of the shouting, cheering men, who were now so focused on the race that they didn't even notice her. The hoofbeats didn't sound anything like thunder, more like rocks tumbling down a cliff. Thunder wouldn't make the ground shake. Thunder didn't make her heart pound or her throat dry with excitement. Four lines of rising dust followed the teams, but the colors painted on the chariots made it easy to tell which was which. What you could not tell, until they turned at the opposite end, was who was in the lead. That was signaled by the servants at the end, who raised a pole with the owner's pennant on it as soon as the chariot made the turn. And the first pennant up was for Braith's team. Gwen gave a squeal of glee and jumped up and down, her hands clasped under her chin. She knew better than to pray to Epona, the goddess of horses, for Braith to win. That was frivolous use of prayer, which was important. The queen had made that very clear to all her daughters. If you pestered the gods with petitions all the time, they'd grow tired of hearing from you, and when you needed them to answer, the prayers would be ignored. But she could hope, and she could wish, and she wished with all her might. But right behind Braith's team was her father's, a pair of handsome greys out of his war-horse herd. If the Romans had still been here, he'd have lost them for certain. The Romans would have whisked them away for tribute before you could say knife. The other two teams were lost in the dust, but the kings and Braiths were so close that Gwen held her breath. It looked from here as if they were literally one team of four horses. The tension was incredible. She clasped her hands so tightly together that the knuckles hurt. And then Braith did the unthinkable. She leapt out onto the pole and ran up between her pair, reins loose-wrapped around her wrist, to stand between them, an arm over each neck, shouting encouragement in their ears. Behind her, the empty chariot bounced and bucked. Other horses might have shied, but her team paid it no heed. From some depth within them, they found new strength and surged ahead, crossing the finish line a full chariot and team length ahead of the kings. The men roared approval at this daring move, even the king whooping and clapping. Gwen's heart was beating so fast she felt faint. They shot past as Braith ran back to the chariot and began slowly to rein her team in and turn them about. When they pulled up again before the crowd, Gwen hung back to keep from being noticed, but Braith was having none of that. "'Young Gwyn Weavard, she called, beckoning to her. "'Come ye here!' Gwen started at the sound of her name, but at her age she was supposed to obey anyone that was an adult, and although her father looked surprised to see her there, he didn't forbid it. She eased through the forest of towering men, and came to the side of Braith's chariot. The horses steamed, their sides moving strongly, although they were not heaving for breath. Nah, my beauties have just run themselves to sweat, so what is it we do with them? Braith asked, looking straight down at her. Walk them so they do not founder nor stiffen, Gwen said promptly. And water, Braith prompted. Only a mouthful at a time. Gwen knew all this very well. On the rare occasions that the sisters could get their fat pony to work up a sweat, she was the one left to walk him cool. Not that she minded. She just wished he was a horse, but she was fond of him, and a pony, even a shared pony, was better than no horse at all. Here ye be, then, and to Gwen's astonishment, as well as that of the rest of the crowd, including several adolescent boys who gaped at her with raw envy, Braith put the looped-up reins in her hands. Be walking them cool, please ye. Gwen didn't hesitate. She took the reins as the two horses bent to sniff the top of her head. 
Then, with her heart feeling so full of happiness she thought she would burst, she began walking towards the stream, the team ambling obediently behind her, with the chariot wheels rumbling and swishing through the grass. She let them have the allotted mouthful of water when they reached the stream, then turned and began walking them back. In the distance she could see Braith talking with the king and the rest of the men. The prize was already in her hands, a pair of beautiful bridles, with bronze ornaments for the team, a silver torque for her. The team's owner got a drinking horn bound in silver with silver feet. He seemed well pleased. Without being prompted, Gwen stopped short of the crowd, reached up under the nearest horse's mane as high as she could, and felt the shoulder. He was still sweaty, so she turned back around and made another trip to the stream. Again she let the horses have a mouthful of water, and she tried not to feel self-conscious, as everyone but Braith seemed to be casting glances at her. This time when she returned the horses were cool. It had only been one race after all. This was nothing to the exertion they would get in a battle. She waited politely until Braith noticed her, then held up the reins. Braith checked the horses herself. "'Well done, young Gwen Weaver,' she said gravely. "'Now will ye be doing me the kindness of stepping into my chariot?' Now, totally astonished, Gwen did as she had been asked. "'And now be running out on the pole and back.' Braith did not ask if she could do so. She simply acted as if this was just a matter of course that Gwen would be able. Of course she could. It wasn't as if she hadn't been practicing just such a thing all summer. Not on a chariot with horses hitched to it, of course, but on an old one with a broken axle. She flexed her toes, and then, fixing her eyes, not on the pole, but straight ahead, ran out along the limber pole between the warm sides of the horses and back to the chariot. "'Ah, King,' sighed Braith, "'it is a pity this is your daughter, for I'd be taking her back with me this day and leaving you the talk in her place.' "'And for what purpose, lady?' the king asked with a chuckle. "'To make a charioteer of her as I was.' Braith turned her head to the side and looked at the king from under her shag of hair. "'And I tell you this, be giving her a horse now, and not a pony, and of her own. A wise old war-horse, too old for battle. Let the old horse teach the young rider, and be giving her training. Now is the time to do it, while she's fearless. Do that, and you'll have a warrior out of her.' The king pulled at his lip, and the queen will have a wise lady out of her. Braith shook her head. The mark of Epona is on this one. There's two goddesses in this one, but Epona is the stronger. Tis a waste to make her go to the ladies. Braith shrugged. But if it is your will to send her, still give her the horse and as much of the training as she can get before she goes. I never heard it said that warrior training did a lady any harm. She's only ten summers. Maybe when she is a woman, Epona will let her go. If not, be sure you will know. The power won't leave her in that time, and I never heard the lady say otherwise. Nor I the king agreed, to Gwen's joy and delight. It will be done as you advise. She was going to get everything she had wanted. A horse, a real horse, and not a pony. Training with bow and knife and sword. Oh, and lance as well, because a charioteer used the lance too. She felt dizzy with happiness, more dizzy than she had the time she'd filched someone's forgotten cup of mead. In her rush of happiness, she did not forget her manners. "'Thank you, father,' she said with a little bow, "'and thank you, warrior.' 
The king beamed down on her, his ruddy hair and beard glowing in the sunlight, his strong shoulders stretching the leather of his tunic, and the gleam of silver at his throat, wrists, and around his head. She watched the rest of the morning races in a glow of happiness. None of them were as exciting as the first one. Braith won all the ones she cared to enter, but she held back a good deal of the time. The chariot races alternated with ridden races to give all the horses a chance to rest. The king didn't enter his horses that often either. Gwen had been given tacit approval to stay, so stay she did, at the king's side, but not getting into the way, listening as hard as she ever could as the king and Braith and the king's war leaders discussed the horses and their drivers. They talked not about the race itself, but about how the teams might perform on a hill, maneuvering around other chariots when encountering slippery grass or mud. They talked of the riders, of whether man and horse seemed of one mind, whether a horse was uncertain of his rider or the rider of his horse. Such uncertainty could mean bulks and spills on the battlefield. They discussed whether the horses had been seasoned to the sounds of combat. It was then that she realized that these weren't just races for the sake of the holiday. This was the opportunity for the king to see his war chief's best drivers and pairs, the best riders and mounts, so that he would know where to put them in a battle. Perhaps the only race that actually had been nothing but a race had been the one between his team and Braith's, and even then. "'Your pair is steadier than last year,' the king said. Braith nodded. "'Last year I'd not have run out on the pole. They'll go through fire and ice for me now. I reckon two more years, maybe three, before they start to slow, and five or six before I needs be training a new pair, then another brace of years before the new pair will be ready.' She laughed. And maybe then twill be me that's out to pasture. The king laughed. You are as ageless as the hills. No pasture for you. The rest of the war chiefs laughed and asked Braith's opinion on this or that team. Gwen became aware that not only was Braith her hero, her opinion was held in high esteem by all of these men. I want to be like that she thought, looking worshipfully up at the woman. I want people to talk to me like that. The sound of a horn warned them all that dinner was ready. This would not be a formal feast of the sort that was held in the great hall, but as Gwen knew from earlier years, she and her sisters, her mother and her chief ladies, the king's particular guests and war chiefs, and the king himself, would be seated at the trestle tables hauled outside and given the best. Everyone else would help himself. There would be more than enough. Anyone not competing in the afternoon games would probably be stuffed and dozy. The press of people around the king was too great for her to walk beside him to the tables, and she had an idea that her mother would think it forward of her to do so. She eased herself away and trotted back to the open-air kitchen, where the queen was supervising the lost preparations. Before she even got that far, her eldest sister, Kataruna, spotted her and rounded her up like a straying goose. "'Now you sit here. I put little Gwen on the other side, so unless she starts flinging things at you across mother and father, things should be quiet enough.' Her sister paused and turned her around to look her up and down critically. "'I don't believe it. No dirt, no leaves and grass in your hair, nothing torn. Are you a changeling? Did someone make away with the real Gwen?' Gwen laughed. "'I was watching the races.' "'And you didn't climb a tree to see them better?' Her sister shook her head. "'I shall expect a hen to crow next.' and a gander to lay an egg. All right, sit down and mind your manners. Gwen had every intention of minding her manners. She was not going to give her father the least little excuse for taking back what he had promised. Dinner was uneventful, 
except for little Gwen trying to command attention at her side of the table, boasting and being self-important. And it was irritating, but most of those around her seemed to find it amusing. Men and boys, particularly, fell under her naughty charm. By contrast, Gwen kept very quiet, didn't grab for the best portions, and didn't even complain when the boys on either side of her and across from her did. She watched wistfully as most of the goose went into those boys, and the juiciest bits of the roast pork, the best baked apples, the center part of the bread. Her reward was the approving nod from her mother. The king didn't notice. What children did or did not do was not something that concerned him when he was busy speaking with his guests. The boys on either side of Gwen quickly stuffed themselves and as quickly sped off to whatever game or competition had claimed their interest. That was when the queen passed down the remains of the very special dishes that the adults had shared. Little Gwen had also already dashed off on a quest of her own at that point, so Gwen was able to enjoy her feast in peace. And she did, indeed, for the first time in her life, get enough goose she didn't want any more, and enough tasty goose liver paste to spread on a bread end. The king also lingered when he saw that Gwen was still there, and awkwardly cleared his throat, getting the queen's attention. It's Braith's mind that Gwen's ready for a horse and for warrior training, he said abruptly. The queen stared at him as if she hadn't quite heard him correctly. She licked her lips and twined the end of one of her braids about her fingers for a moment. She looked, at that moment, very conflicted. Braith is a very competent trainer and warrior, she said carefully, and you trust her judgment. The king nodded. Braith says it's a pona's hand that's on her. She entrusted her own team to Gwen for cooling down, and I saw it myself. The girl has horse sense, and good sense about horses. Pardon, father, mother, Kataruna, Gwen's eldest sister, paused in fetching away the precious silver-rimmed drinking horns for safe keeping. Gwen is the one that always takes first care of the pony, and he never kicks or bites her, which is more than I can claim. Ask your horsekeeper. He knows. The queen sucked her lower lip in a little. I suppose there's no harm in it, but little Gwen will want a horse and training too. The king began to roll his eyes, but then narrowed them. Then she shall have them and when the horse is left neglected and her nurse has to march her down to the stable to tend him, or she cries because he's too tall, and pouts because she got a bruising, or because it stepped on her foot, you shall make her beg you to let her off. Ellery the queen nodded, then looked past the king at Gwen. And you will do none of these things, she said to Gwen, who nodded solemnly at what was clearly an order. Very well, then. Let it be as you wish. She has some years before she will go to the ladies, at any rate, and I suppose no harm ever came of a girl getting warrior training before she went to the cauldron keepers. Exactly what Breath said, the king replied with open relief. He sprang to his feet. Then, by your leave, I'll have her with me for the rest of the races. She can't see too much of them, and perhaps she can make herself useful with the boys. Wait, the queen beckoned to Mag. Put Gwen into a good tunic and short kirtle, or trues if you can find them to fit her. She's to help with the races by the king's command. I'll help you look, Gwen exclaimed, her cauldron of happiness overflowing. She pulled up her skirts and ran back to the castle. Gwen spent the remainder of the day at her father's side, being quiet, obedient, doing exactly what she was told, even though what she wanted to do was to poke her nose into everything. She was occasionally allowed to lead horses to cool them, as she had for Braith, 
but most of the time she kept strictly in her father's shadow and said nothing at all unless it was "I, sir," and "No, sir." And even though she got hungry and thirsty, she didn't run back to the tables, not even when the wind brought aromas that made her stomach growl. She kept her ears open too to the opinions of the owners and drivers about various pairs or horse and rider. The races made her forget her growling stomach, even if they weren't as exciting as Braith's were, and she tried to see what it was that others had talked about as the horses thundered down to the turn and back again. As the afternoon went on, the horses pounded the grass on the improvised track to fragments. And raised more and more dust every time they ran. The horses were covered in a fine coat of the stuff, which streaked as they worked up a sweat. The king's greys would have looked a sad sight if they'd still been racing. There were prizes for every race, but Gwen came to understand that the one that Braith had won had been very special, and arranged far, far ahead of time. The king's pair against the two finest pairs of those of his war chiefs that cared to match him. The rest of these were races among whoever brought a team and cared to challenge. Finally, the ridden races were over, and the best four pairs of all battled for the prize of the day, for the horses, silver bridle and harness ornaments, for the driver, a silver torque like Braith had won. And a plain silver cloak brooch, for the owner, if he was not the driver, a cloak brooch worked in the image of Epona in her white horse aspect, with a gemstone for an eye. Truly fine prizes, and there were many comments of admiration as they were passed around. Gwen expected Braith to race for these as well, but to her surprise, the warrior was nowhere to be seen, and her horses must have been taken away. For they were no longer at the picket line. I am surprised Braith is not here," said one of the war chiefs, echoing Gwen's surprise. "I asked her not to run," replied Hid Apkai, the chief to whom the pair belonged. "It said there might be trouble on our border before the snows fall, and I'd not have my best pair or driver not at my disposal if there is. This last race is dangerous." Drivers are like to push their pairs because it is the last race, and horses are tired. The king nodded sagely. That is why my greys are not running, he said, and then laughed. Besides, I would not have it whispered behind hands for the rest of the year that my pair won only because the other horses were tired. All the men laughed at that. And another good reason for Braith not to run," agreed Hib. "Whoever takes the prize will know he took it fairly, and those who lose will know they lost it fairly." The last four teams lined up, and the crowd fell silent. The four drivers leaned forward a little, knees loose, eyes on the turn at the far end of the course. Their teams had all been given a rest and been wiped down. And now it was not just the men who were gathered to watch the race. Word had spread that this was the prize race, and the boys and young men had come from the contests, the older women from their cooking and talk, the maidens and the few maiden warriors from their dances and flirtations and contests of their own. They lined the side of the course nearest the camp, leaving the other free. So, but a team in trouble had a side to pull off to without endangering the spectators. The tension in the air made Gwen's heart race, and her mouth felt like it was full of dust. The king solemnly stepped forward. With deliberation, he eyed each of the drivers in turn. Then, looking at the sky, so that he could not have been said to have cued a driver before time. Waited until all was so still, but only the distant metallic clatter of the rooks on the castle roof broke the silence, and then, shouted. The team shot off, showing no sign of being weary, without Braith being a driver, without her father's precious greys at risk, 
Gwen was able to simply watch them with the same excitement as everyone else. The cheering started immediately and did not abate. Even if someone had not had a favorite before this race began, he'd picked a favorite by the time the horses were halfway to the grove. The flags went up and the teams turned. It was a close race, so close that at this point anyone could win. And then one of the two centermost teams stumbled. The crowd gasped as one. For a moment the heads of the horses vanished under the dust, and Gwen's heart stopped. Had they fallen? Had one of the horses, Epona forbid, broken a leg? That would be a terrible omen, as well as a disaster, and worse still would be if the chariot had gone over, the driver thrown, to break a leg, an arm, a back, his head. That had happened once a few years ago. She had been too little to be allowed near the course, but she remembered it. The wails of the women, the lamenting around the body, brought back to lie in solemn state on a swiftly cleared table. And that had been a horrible winter, too. But her heart leapt as the horses' heads appeared again, far behind the others, but not down. They moved slowly off the course, the offside one limping, but that was the worst of it, pulled up lame. She turned her attention back to the remaining teams, who thundered on, until with one tremendous effort the team that had been farthest behind leapt forward while the crowd screamed. Gwen shouted, the horses strained, and at the very last moment they pulled a head length in front of the team that had been winning. The three teams pounded past as the drivers slowed them, turning them in a great circle to bring them back to the king and his men. The rest of the company swarmed around the winner as soon as it was safe. They gathered up the driver on their shoulders, and Gwen reckoned that if they could have gathered up the horses as well, they would have. No one seemed to take a thought for the poor loser leading his horses back to the picket line. Gwen's eyes flicked between him and the winner for a moment. Then she ran as fast as her legs would take her for that lonely driver and pair. "'I'll take them and walk them,' she called as soon as she was near enough for him to hear. "'You find the king's horse leech. He won't watch the races. He's at the ale tons.' "'Epona's blessings on you, little one.' the man said gratefully, giving the reins over to her. Then, despite his own weariness, he ran. She led the poor drooping things slowly. It wasn't just the offside horse that was limping. The stumble must have pulled the other over enough to lame him, too. They wanted to stop, but she knew that if she let them, they'd cool too fast, and that might make their hurts worse. But the driver was back in mere moments with the king's horse healer. Not needed now, she handed back the reins and walked away quickly. If it was very bad news, she didn't want to be there to hear it or see the driver's face. Chapter 4 Supper was what had been left over from the rest of the day for the common folk, and baked meat pies and baked fowl for the king's guests. Gwen had thought she had eaten all the goose she could possibly eat. She discovered to her pleasure that she was wrong, and this time the boys, given the option of savoury meat pies dripping with rich gravy, merely picked at the goose, leaving most of it to her. The sun was setting as supper began. It was fully dark, and the torches and bonfire had been lit by the time the last of the guests rose from the table, and the servants and Gwen and her sisters, all but little Gwen, who had disappeared as usual, carried their valuable cups and knives back to their coffers in the castle. The Queen and her women were long gone. No one mentioned this. No one would say anything about it later. They had gone off to make magic for the High King to ensure a son from the marriage that had been made this day. That was woman's work, 
and men were not even supposed to know about it. Nor were little girls, so Gwen pretended that she didn't, and settled down to enjoy the music and dancing. Little Gwen finally put in an appearance. It seemed she had bullied or cajoled some of the village children to make her a harvest maiden, and they were parading about with her at the head of them, in a wreath of leaves and vines, with a stalk of weed as a sceptre. The real harvest maiden chosen by the women was at the working, of course, and last year Gwen probably would have been irritated at little Gwen showing off, but she was full of goose and the knowledge that she was going to be given a horse and training in a few days, and that little Gwen would surely get her comeuppance if she tried to wheedle and pout and cry her way into the same. "'Be wary of that one,' said a voice in her ear. Gwen turned to see Braith settling down next to her, a horn of mead in one hand and a pottery cup in the other. She handed the cup to Gwen, it held hot cider. Why? Gwen asked, casting a dubious glance after her sister. Because there's power in her, Braith nodded at the chain of children. Look at her. Look at who's following. Boys, mostly. A few girls. Even young as she is, she has that power over the males. Who indulges her? Men and boys. Who persuades women not to punish her? Men and boys. With one like that, there's no reasoning with the men folk. When she gets older and learns her power, and make no mistake, she has power, in her presence their eyes will glaze over and their reason fly out the window. The glamoury. That's what she's got, her true power, and make no mistake. Anna Morgos has it, I've seen her, and she's but to bend a finger, and nine men of ten will come to sniff at her hem. And they say that young Morgana has it too, though more subtle than Anna Morgos. So be wary of her, for once she's woman grown, what she wants, she'll have, and someone else has it, she'll take it, and the men will stand in line to get it for her. A strange chill ran up Gwen's back, and she shivered. It seemed absurd to look at little Gwen lording it among the other small children, and talk about her in the same breath as Lot's queen, and yet— She watched little Gwen— and despite the absurdity of the crown and the troop of little boys about her, there was no doubt. Her sister was more than just pretty. When you put aside what you knew about her, and just let your eyes follow her, she had something about her that made everything about her a little more. Both of them had white blonde hair, but little Gwen's was glossier, and even when tousled, it looked pretty instead of messy. They both had blue-green eyes, but little Gwen had a way of looking sideways out of them that made you think she was looking at you in particular. Her cheeks were the pink of wild roses, her chin adorably pointed. And that was now, as a little girl, what would happen when she got to be Katarina's age? She sipped her cider, and wondered why Braith was telling her all this. I tell you this, because I have a sister like her. By the time we were twelve and eleven summers, she had the best in the house, and the rest of us got what she didn't want, nor hadn't a use for. Twas a rare good thing for me, she didn't like the horses, and they didn't like her. Every lad one of us fancied she took, only to toss aside for the next. My brothers, my parents, they fair doted on her. Braith shook her head. When I got taken up by Chief Hid's horse tamer, no one even noticed I was going. Never went back, 
not even to visit, but I've no doubt she made plenty of mischief before fever took her, and she was only a farmer's git. Reckon what mischief yon'll make, being the king's. Braith sipped thoughtfully at her mead. So, best get ye gone from here, afore there's summat ye hold dear that she comes to fancy, or be doing something she never will. After that, Braith seemed to have nothing more to say, and sat in silence. Gwen watched the dancing, and listened to the music for a while, then when she looked up again, Braith was gone, leaving as quietly as she had come. By that time, the long day and a full stomach were both catching up with her. She was having trouble keeping her eyes open, and finally decided that going to bed was a better idea than nodding off and having someone have to put her to bed like an overtired baby. Besides, the Queen and her women had just come back from the working, and the Queen had a strange, wild look about her. Gwen wasn't sure she liked the way her mother looked right now. Eyes as bright as someone a fever, cheeks flushed, looking scarcely old enough to be the mother of one, much less a brood. If you didn't know her, you'd take her for Kataruna's sister, not her mother and the way her father was looking back at her made her very uncomfortable, for reasons she really didn't understand. So, as the queen drew the king into the dancing, taking his hand and pulling him up from his seat as if he was light as a bit of down, then pressing close against him, Gwen picked herself up and turned her back on the fire and her face to the castle. The great hall was full of murmurings in the shadows. She took the straightest path through the middle of it and ignored what was going on. Really, the only difference between tonight and every other night was that the hall was a great deal fuller. The bed was cold, and she shivered for a while before her body warmed up the hollow. She was almost asleep when half-running footsteps Murmurs, playful growls, and breathless giggling heralded the passage of the king and queen into their bedchamber. The sounds made her uncomfortable all over again, but it wasn't just the sounds, and it wasn't just the knowing that her mother and father were going to do what all those people in the shadows were doing. It was something else, something she couldn't put a finger on, a feeling that— that something was turning wrong, that had been right, like a blight on grain. This wasn't just a matter of her parents, it was bigger than that. The feeling held her pinned in her bed, until she woke suddenly to find that it was dawn, and her sisters were all curled up with her, and, as usual, little Gwen had stolen the covers. The king was in a rare good mood. After breakfast he gathered up Gwen, with little Gwen predictably trailing behind unasked, and took her down to his horse-master. Braith says the lass is ready to be trained, and to give her a wise old war-horse to train her, he told the old man. The horse-master looked down at her critically. Gwen looked him in the eyes. There were scars all over him, at least everywhere that she could see, and a pair of spectacular knife or sword cuts marred a craggy face still further. "'I know ye,' he said finally, his voice a low growl, "'and a goodly work ye make of the pony. Bray thinks ye ready for a horse now?' Gwen nodded. "'Aye, sir,' she said quietly. "'I want a horse,' little Gwen interrupted imperiously. The horse-master turned to look at her. Then Gwen saw him suddenly look up at her father. Something passed between them, and the horse-master smiled. 
Gwen got a shiver of pleasure when she saw that smile. It promised that little Gwen was going to get what she wanted, and not like it. Well then, you'll have a horse, the horse master said, and you'll follow me. Gwen followed obediently at his heels. Little Gwen marched imperiously in front of them all. When they got to the stables, the horse master addressed Gwen in a quiet voice, while little Gwen surveyed the horses in the paddock as if she owned all of them. And which of these do ye think suits ye? he asked. Gwen ducked her head deferentially. You should pick, sir. She said, "Braith said old and wise. I don't know which are old and wise." He smiled. "Then pick, I shall," he began, when little Gwen interrupted. "I want that one," she declared, pointing at a showy young grey. The king made a choking sound. Gwen caught the horsemaster making a soothing motion with his hand. All right," he replied agreeably. "Let's get him saddled then." He ordered the astonished grooms to catch, saddle, and bridle the high-tempered beast, and put a lead line on the bridle. Little Gwen was practically bouncing with excitement, but frowned at the line. "I don't need that," she announced grandly. "I can ride." Indeed. The horsemaster said, but kept the rope clipped to the bridle. But every rider needs the lead to try the paces. He swung her up onto the saddle, where she perched as if she was on the old pony, legs slack, hands clenched on the reins. The horse reacted poorly to the latter. He tossed his head, and his mane lashed her face, cutting right across her eyes. She shrieked. The horse reacted to that by lurching into a run, or trying to. The horse master had been ready for that. He kept a tight grip on the lead and pulled inward while pivoting on one heel, which forced the horse to stay in a trot in a tight circle around him. Little Gwen bounced in the saddle in a way that made Gwen wince for what seemed a very long time. Her shrieks now coming out as painful. Ah, 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 ah! Sounds as she bounced and hit the saddle. Three times she went in a circle around the horse master, each time making more and more noise and making the horse try to break into a run. How the horse master kept him to a trot, Gwen could not imagine. It was a relief when she fell off. She immediately scrambled to her feet. Face red with pain and rage, she looked about for something to hit the horse with, but fortunately found nothing. The horse master pulled up on the lead and soothed the ruffled stallion, but made no move to soothe little Gwen. Interestingly, neither did the king. Neither man said anything to her as she stared at them in a fury. Gwen prudently backed away from everything and everyone, until she had a horse or two between her and her sister. Best to not remind her just who had inspired this desire to have a horse. Finally, little Gwen erupted in the tantrum that Gwen knew was inevitable. "I don't want your old horses!" she screamed, making every horse in the paddock shy or lay its ears back. "I hate horses!" You should kill them all and make soup out of them. Then she burst into angry tears and ran off. Gwen slowly emerged from hiding. The king and his horse master were both shaking their heads. She's not hurt, is she? The king asked. Only a bit of bruising. The old man gestured at the straw-strewn paddock. That be why I kept her on the lead. And I grant ye, I could have made a longer affair of this, picked a horse fit for her, tried to get her to tend it, as I know yon girl will, 
and the end of that it'd be more work for me when she didn't. So, instead, I cut across country, give her what she wanted, and— He shrugged. The king laughed ruefully. She'll find something to take this out on, Gwen thought sourly. But then the horsemaster turned to see her standing there, and she tried to make her expression pleasant. Nah, brave girl, let's find ye a proper horse. In the end it came to two, and the horsemaster couldn't make up his mind which. One was a mare, one of the cavalry duns, the other stallion of the famous grey line, now almost a pure white, that had been both a chariot horse and a mount. After looking them both over for a long time, the horsemaster sighed and threw up his hands. Not for it, he said. Mun let them choose. He put Gwen at one end of the paddock and turned the two horses loose. Call them Braid's girl, he told her, and stood away from her so that they would not react to his presence but to hers. Now, alone in the paddock with them, her mouth went a little dry. They were very big, twice the size of the pony. She swallowed, licked her lips, and made the little chirruping sounds she made to call the pony to her. They both looked at her, ears and heads up. Come, she urged. One of you has to teach me now, so come. The stallion snorted. The mare shook her head. Both of them started forward at the same time, but before they were halfway across the paddock, the dun mare shouldered the stallion aside with a snort of her own and laid back ears. She picked up her feet in a trot that brought her to Gwen while the stallion slunk sheepishly off to one side. Gwen held out her hand, and the mare nuzzled it, then put her head down and butted Gwen in the chest, blowing hay-scented breath into her tunic, surprising a delighted laugh out of her. The horsemaster brought saddle and bridle, but waited while Gwen put them on, only giving her a hand when something was too far for her to reach. Ye mun find ways to be doing this on your own, great girl, he told her gravely. I don't help the boys. I shan't help ye. She nodded. That was reasonable. So taking the hint, once the mare, Adara was her name, was saddled and bridled on her own, she took her over to a stump that had been incorporated into the paddock fence, and used that to get herself into the saddle. Once there, she found it not as dissimilar to the pony as she had feared. She was a lot higher off the ground, it was true, but the pony was so fat that his girth wasn't a great deal smaller than Adara's. She couldn't imagine why little Gwen hadn't been able to sit the saddle better, unless it was that her youngest sister really hadn't learned to ride properly. She fitted her feet into the leather stirrups, and was relieved that the horsemaster had judged the length right. She was even more pleased when he didn't clip a lead rope to her bridle. Since he was waiting expectantly, she chirruped to Adara, tightened her legs in the right places, lifted the reins a trifle, and nudged her a little with her heels. Adara moved out in a walk, circling the paddock, then increased her pace from a faster walk into a trot. Gwen bounced for a few paces before she found her seat again. Adara's ears flicked back and forth, and she looked over her shoulder with what looked like amusement, and she moved into a canter. Now this was the fastest she had ever ridden, and it was both thrilling and terrifying. The pony had never gone this fast, not even at a gallop, but the mare had another pace in her, and without Gwen doing anything she lengthened her stride into a gallop. The world blurred. All Gwen was conscious of was her own breathlessness, her heart racing, and horse moving under her, and it was glorious, like flying. 
The mare only gave her a taste of this before slowing, first to the canter, then the trot again, and finally into the walk. She stopped on her own at the side of the horsemaster. "Ye'll do," was all he said. Then he left her to make sure the mare was walked cool, unsaddled and unbridled, rubbed down, and put up in her stall with her tack with her. Gwen moved in a kind of happy dream. She had thought that yesterday was the best day of her life, but no, today was. One of the grooms came to tell her when she was finished that she had to report to the novice trainer. She thanked him and trotted off to the yard where all the boys and the odd girl or two got their first lessons in warcraft, or rather their first lessons in making their bodies strong enough for weapons. It seemed that handling a sword or a bow or even a knife was a long way off. Gwen had never thought of herself as lazy, but after what seemed like an age of lifting small leather pails of water over and over, of swinging weighted sticks against a padded pole over and over, and many other similar exercises, she was hot and sore and grateful to be dismissed for the day to go back to the paddock and commence another round of riding. This time under the eagle eye of one of the grooms. In the company of the rest of the beginners, she got no help in saddling and bridling this time, but neither did the others. No help, that is, from the groom. She was not the only undersized person among the beginners, and they helped each other reach girths under bellies, pass breastbands around chests, and persuade the canny old horses to bend their heads for the bridle. Gwen was especially good at the latter. So no one begrudged her the help it took to get a saddle that seemed a hundred times heavier than it had been this morning onto Adara's back. Then they lined up head to tail along the paddock fence, and the groom called out what they should do. Oh, not for their benefit! It was very clear to Gwen that she wasn't in control of Adara right now, and it looked to her as if the rest of the beginners were in a similar case. No, no, it was the horses who responded to the commands, and they, the riders, were doing their pitiful best not to fall off, to learn how to move as one with the horse and not merely balance there. Ride in a circle, walk, trot, canter, then drop back to a walk, wheel and do the same in the other direction, repeat until the horse's muscles were sufficiently warmed up. Wheel so that they were all facing the same direction. Charge the fence at a trot. Pull up. Wheel in place and charge the fence on the other side. Repeat until the young riders were starting to get the rhythm of things. Go back to riding in a circle. Split into two groups. Charge each other, making sure no one collided. Wheel and repeat. Go back to riding in a circle. Trot to the fence and stop, then back, wheel in place and repeat. Then the groom ordered them all out of the paddock, and Gwen thought they were going to be allowed to just ride on a jaunt across the grazing meadows as she used to on the pony, but no. The groom directed them to another part of the training field where there were padded poles set up down the middle, and when Gwen saw them. She knew what they were going to be doing, as she expected. The groom set them to weaving through the poles, down and back, first at a walk, then a trot, then a canter. They didn't go up to a full gallop, but right next to them was another set of poles, around which another set of slightly older warriors in training were riding at an all-out gallop, and with the reins in their teeth and their hands held out to the side. Keeping their seats only through superb balance, all this was taking an entirely different set of muscles than she used in riding the stolid little pony. She could feel every pull and strain, and knew she was going to be very, very sore. And yet, she would not have traded this for anything. And no matter how sore she was, it was going to be worth it.
The groom finally led them back to their original paddock, but of course the work was not over. The horses had to be unsaddled, walked cool, rubbed down, and put in their proper stalls, with saddle arranged on a stand and bridle hung on a peg. Then, and only then, were they allowed to go. It was sunset and supper time by the time she limped back to the great hall. The servants had brought in the kettles of stew and the remains of last night's feast, and people were settling onto the benches and tucking in. The hall was nowhere near as crowded as it had been last night. At least half the guests had packed up and headed homewards this morning, and the rest would leave tomorrow. Gwen was not altogether sorry to see them go. She was already tired of being polite and always on her good behavior, even when some of the boy guests behaved outrageously. Her father and mother were already seated at the high table. On the day after a feast, no one really stood on ceremony. When a shriek and a wail arose from the back of the hall where the bedrooms were, and a moment later Ginath and Kataruna came storming out of the room, the one angry, the other lamenting, with ruin in her hands. My best slippers! shouted Kataruna, her cheeks aflame with rage. My belt! I just finished embroidering it. I only wore it once, wept Ginath. Consumed with grief, the pretty leather slippers had very clearly been given to the dogs to play with. They were chewed to shapelessness, and the seams had come half unsewn. As for the belt, someone had taken it out and trodden it into the mud, until nothing of the bright colours that Ginath had so painstakingly sewn into beautiful patterns could be seen for the dirt. And stains. A sinking feeling in her stomach, Gwen walked slowly to the bedroom. She dreaded what she would find. Which of her possessions had been taken and ruined? Behind her, she could hear her sisters telling their parents how they had found their things, and Kataruna added shrilly that little Gwen was nowhere to be found. Little Gwen, of course it was her. She'd wanted something, gotten it, and didn't like it. So her first thought was to take whatever her sisters took pleasure in and ruin it. Ginath's new belt had been the admiration and envy of the other girls, for Ginath was the best needlewoman in the castle, and Kataruna's slippers had made her feet look very handsome indeed in the dancing. More than one young man had said something about them, in ways that had made the blood rise to Kataruna's cheeks last night. It was no accident, father," Kataruna snarled. "The slippers were in my chest, on top of my kirtle, right where I put them last night. She took them and gave them to the dogs, then put them back." Ginath was sobbing too hard to be coherent. She had been working on that belt all summer. Gwen didn't blame her for weeping, but Gwen didn't have to look far to find little Gwen's revenge on her. There, in the corner where she had been left, was Gwen's poppet, or rather, what was left of her poppet. The doll had been torn limb from limb, scalped and decapitated. Her clothing had been shredded. Mutely, Gwen gathered up the pitiful remains in both hands, and went out into the hall where her mother was trying to soothe the disconsolate Ginath, and her father to placate Kataruna, with promises of a new pair of slippers even prettier than the ruined ones. She waited until Ginath's sobs had quieted into sniffs and hiccups, and Kataruna had run out of names to call their sister. That was when the king and queen finally became aware that she was standing there. When their eyes fell on her, she silently held out her hands. It took them a few moments to realize what it was, or had been. Oh no! It was Ginath who realized it first, and it came out in a moan. 
Oh, no. Oh, Gwen, your puppet, your poor doll. Katarina's cheeks flamed anew. That, that, she spluttered. Oh, I am going to shake that brat until her head falls off and her teeth fall out. Elleri's eyes narrowed with anger. The king put up a hand. You'll not touch her. When she's found, she will be whipped, and she'll be living on bread and water for a fortnight, and put to whatever work Bronwyn deems suitable. There will be no playtime for her until the snow flies, and perhaps not even then, if I am not convinced of her repentance. He looked to his queen. I've spoiled and indulged her over much, as you said time and again, and this is what comes of it. I am sorry that you, my good daughters, have fallen victim to her mischief. And her puppet will be yours, Gwen, the queen began. Lady Mother, no, Gwen replied, feeling dimly that if she were given something of little Gwen's rather than just a replacement, her youngest sister would only see it as a reason for more vengeance. She straightened her back, gently piled the pathetic remains of the doll on the table, rubbed the back of her hand across her stinging eyes, and looked up at her mother and father. I'm a warrior now. Warriors don't need puppets. I won't have time to play with it anyway. Her mother gave her a skeptical look, but her father relaxed and beamed his approval. Well said, was all he replied, but Gwen felt that approval fill her and ease some of the sadness she felt at losing her plaything. Bronwyn, Ellery directed, take these things and see what, if anything, can be done with them, the belt especially. Then look for Gwen Weavark, and when you find her, See she is put in the guard closet to await our pleasure. And let us eat. There is no reason for a nasty child to spoil our supper, nor make us wait until our meat is cold. Gwen ate slowly, feeling the ache of every overworked muscle, every bruise. She actually didn't mind it. Concentrating on that made everything else secondary. And while Eleri consoled Ginath and Kataruna with the most golden crusted of the pies and the last of the honey cakes, the king directed his server to give Gwen all of the leftover goose, and with his own hand poured her cup full, not of cider, but of honey mead. You'll be a king, young warrior, he said in an undertone. This will help you sleep. The meat was sweet, but with a fire under it. It burned its way pleasantly down her throat as she slowly ate slivers of goose, spread a surprise bit of goose liver on some bread, and sopped up the last of the goose fat with the rest of the bread. And it did start to make the aches go off into the distance and give her a warm and soft-edged feeling, as if she was falling asleep. Halfway through dinner, Bronwyn returned, and reported that a sulky and unrepentant Gwynweevark had been put in the guard closet with one of the turnspits as a guard on the door. The guard closet was a tiny little windowless niche in the stone walls, with a single hard stone bench in it that the king used to keep single wrongdoers in while he debated what punishment to mete out to them. From time to time all of the girls had been confined there for mischief, but never had he done what he did now. Here, he said, carefully picking out the hardest and most stale piece of trencher bread and a leather cup that he poured full of water. He handed both to Bronwyn. Give her those, and tell her she will be staying in the closet until morning. In the morning, my dog master will whip her. And then... For the next fortnight she will sleep in the rushes with the dogs and the scullions. I'll not have her sharing a soft bed that she did nothing to deserve. I'll not have her sleeping comfortable 
beside the sisters she wronged. When she is repentant and ready to act like a king's daughter instead of a low-born brat, we will see if she may sleep like one. Gwen's astonishment woke her up from a half-drowse. Ellery nodded approval. I put you in charge of her Bronwyn, to direct her as you like, the king continued. While she sleeps on the hearth, you will give her work to do, so that she learns the evil of idleness. She'll have nothing but bread and water. At the end of that time, she will apologize, and if I am convinced she is repentant, she may go back to the bed and the board. Bronwyn bowed silently, took the bread and water, and disappeared into the shadows. Gwen sopped up the last of the fat, ate the last bite of bread, drank the last swallow in the bottom of her cup. She felt the fatigue of the day settle on her like a weight. She begged permission to leave and plodded back to the bedroom. On the way there she passed the turnspit guarding the door to the guard closet. There were muffled sobs coming from inside, but they didn't sound repentant or frightened or sorrowful. They sounded angry. Chapter 5 Winter did not stop the training. Even when conditions were too foul to ride, it was the responsibility of the warriors in training to take the horses out to the paddock, turn them loose, clean the stalls, then give their feet a thorough cleaning and put them up again. Normally the grooms did this, but when the horses were confined to the stable rather than running loose, the stalls fouled that much faster. A horse standing in a fouled stall was in danger of thrush, and a horse with thrush was in danger of having to be put down. As the horse-master told them all sternly the first time they were set to this task, Every horse in this stable is worth three of the likes of you, and ne'er ye forget it. It was true, too. So foul weather only meant another sort of work with the horses. As for warrior training, well... Foul weather meant that some of their training involved axe work against the firewood. The trainers had very clever ways of making sure that every stroke accomplished some wood splitting. Gwen built quite a set of muscles over the winter, and once they could be safely trusted with bows and arrows, they became part of the army of hunters that provided meat for the king's table. And a miss there against rapidly moving targets had more serious consequences than a miss at a wand. Gwen learned to appreciate every bite of rabbit pie and look on goose, duck, venison, and boar with an appreciation she'd never felt before. After a month of punishment, little Gwen finally broke down and repented, or at least made the motions of repentance, Gwen was expecting some other form of retaliation, but at least where she was concerned, nothing happened. In fact, little Gwen left her alone for the first time in memory. Perhaps it was nothing more than the fact that from Gwen Weevach's perspective, Gwen's training regimen was worse than any sort of revenge. It hardly mattered, really. The only time she ever saw her little sister was at meals and bedtime, and often not even then. Gwen ate early, rose early, and went to bed early, so tired from the physical work that she was dead asleep from the moment she got under the blankets. But once back in the king's good graces, little Gwen seemed to be putting most of her effort into becoming his favorite, and to making herself as unlike Gwen as possible. She began walking and talking as daintily as any girl trying to catch the eye of a boy, kept herself fastidiously neat, and for the first time volunteered to do things, so long as they were womanly. The king found this very amusing. As for Ellery, she was too preoccupied with her own matters to pay much attention, and Gwen was just relieved 
that little Gwen had finally found something to keep her from plaguing her older sisters. The winter was not as harsh as everyone had feared, and most took that as a sign that the High King's marriage had had the desired result on the land. Certainly at the year-turning and fire-kindling, the midwinter solstice, word crept across the kingdoms that the new queen was properly increasing, and that was a good omen indeed. Someone else was increasing as well, although Eleri the queen had kept it to herself until almost February, revealing it only when her women threatened to tell the king themselves. But again, this had little impact on Gwen's life. Now one of the warriors in training, she was effectively cut out of Eleri's household. Strangely enough, now that she spent less time within the household, the more she came to know of her older sisters. In many ways, she saw them now through the eyes of the older boys, hearing things from them she would never have guessed. That made her watch them, pay attention to them, in a way she had not before. All four of the girls were fair, like their mother. This alone set them apart among most of the darker-haired people her father ruled. And now that she came to think about it, it was very possible that Aleri's blood was all or part Saxon. But if that was true, no one even whispered it. She was the queen, and their wise one, and those two facts eclipsed any mere question of blood. Or, just maybe, there was other blood entirely in her. But if that was the case, no one would even whisper about it. Gwen and little Gwen were the fairest of the lot, with Gwen's hair now mostly shorn off, and little Gwen's waist-length locks being tightly braided every morning by old Bronwyn. Kataruna had more than a flavouring of their father's red hair, but she did not have the high temper to go with it. She also had his square face, where Gwen and little Gwen had inherited their mother's pointed chin and tiny nose, and Ginath had something in between. Kataruna was usually grave and quiet. Ginath was usually merry, and while not a flirt exactly, had discovered that young men were very interesting a year before her older sister did so. And both of the older girls fitted into the domestic and busy life of the household, as Gwen, increasingly, did not. She found she did not miss it, found she did not wish herself back in skirts, nor regret trading the chores she used to do for the harder, in the physical sense, labour of the training, and the sort of work the boys were expected to do. Even in the worst weather, cleaning the stable, cleaning out her horse's hooves with bare, freezing hands, chopping wood as she practised her axe swings, she would not have traded this for sitting and learning the making of clothing, how to weave, spin, and embroider, the law of herbs, other than those needed for battlefield medicine and horse doctoring, the management of a household. No, not even for learning magic. She found that last growing less and less attractive with every day that her body strengthened, her skills with weapons sharpened, and her ability to understand her horses deepened. Not that magic revolted her, far from it, but where once she had longed to see herself in the rites, taking the part of the maiden in the circle beside her mother, learning to control and use the power, now that grew distant. Just as she could look at little Gwen, playing with a lap full of poppets, and feel not even a twinge of envy, now she would watch her mother beckon Kataruna off into a conversation with the other wise women, and no longer even wonder for very long what they were talking about. Perhaps her mother was right. Perhaps it was being around so much cold iron in the form of the swords and axes had blunted her need for magic. Perhaps it had even driven the magic off from her. Or perhaps Braith was right, 
and she never really was suited for that sort of magic in the first place. And on the midwinter solstice, that change in her position was solidified when she celebrated the night with the other young would be warriors and not among the women. She thought her mother looked obscurely disappointed, but the queen had two other daughters well in age to go to the ladies, three if you counted little Gwen. And after midwinter solstice, Katerina's demeanour toward Gwen changed. Mostly, the eldest of the siblings had ignored Gwen, which was fine. They weren't even close in age, after all. Even before Gwen had gone to the squires, they hadn't had much in common. But now, as if the solstice had signalled some change in Katerina's mind, she began to do small kindnesses for her sister. When Gwen came in with half-frozen hands, Katerina would beckon her over to a pot of warmed water to thaw them. When she came to bed, far earlier than anyone else, all worn out with the work, she found that Katerina had put a fire-warmed stone in her place. When it was her turn to serve at table, Katerina saw to it that her portion was kept warmed at the fire, and kept little Gwen's greedy fingers off it. That might have been by Eleri's orders, but not all of it. Gwen found herself exchanging grateful and slightly conspiratorial smiles with her eldest sister, and got them in return. Katerina's square face seemed unaccountably happier this winter than Gwen had ever seen it before. Whatever was the reason for it, it made Gwen unaccountably happy too. While the days lengthened again, and winter lost its grip on the countryside, Gwen found herself outstripping the group of youngsters she'd started with. Not drastically, but enough that by Gwil Canal Gwen Winnall, the spring equinox, she was given her second horse. All warriors had more than one horse. Charioteers needed two, of course, but riders had more than one as well. If your horse was lamed or killed or ill, you couldn't count on one of the chariot drivers to be able to take you to the battlefield. The chariot was already considered by some old-fashioned, although Gwen's father used it, and used it well. Many commanders were slowly abandoning it in favour of purely mounted cavalry, following the lead of the High King, who fought Roman fashion. Chariots broke. They needed highly skilled drivers. When accidents occurred, they could be terrible, and generally involved more than just the driver and his horses. And a single mounted man was always faster than a chariot. Nevertheless, King Lloyd wanted his cavalry trained in chariot work, and that required two horses. All the more reason for every warrior to have two, or more than two, if he or his lord could afford it. So just before the equinox, the horsemaster Bran came himself for her, and presented her and her mare with the grey stallion that had been one of his two original choices for Gwen. This time, when she called him across the paddock, the mare was at her side. The stallion stepped carefully towards them both, and diffidently bowed his head a little at the mare. Adara looked the poor fellow over with thinly veiled arrogance, as was to be expected in a lead mare of the herd, then snorted and perfunctorily touched noses with him. The stallion Di was to be permitted to partner with Gwen. It was very hard for Gwen to keep a sombre face and not laugh out loud at the two of them, but poor Di had been humiliated once by Adara, and he wasn't going to forget that in a hurry. So now Gwen would learn chariot driving and the trick of switching from one horse to another when riding. The High King Arthur had made a name for himself with his mounted knights who could move swiftly to any part of the land where trouble was brewing by doing just that, stopping only for the briefest periods, or not at all, by switching from a tiring horse to one that was fresher. Though her father might favour the chariot, he was no fool, and as a good commander could easily see the advantage this brought him. 
This was a well-omened time for her to have such recognition, for along with the rites of the seed blessings, the spring equinox was the moment when the young god of light took up his weapons for the first time and slew his rival of darkness, the young prince of spring, eliminating the killer of his father, ridding the world of the murderous winter king. As such, Gwen's father generally called for another feast like the one at the fall equinox. It was not yet time for planting. The ground was still too cold, and the frosts still too certain for that, which meant that the men were not yet bound up in the sowing and tending. Lambing time was mostly over, and though carving and foaling time was on them, such were the responsibilities of horsemasters and herdsmen, not the warriors. So it was a good time to take stock of what the winter had taken, and trade news and rumours. The women, of course, and the druids, all had magic to do, so it was a good time for them to gather also. There were the seed blessings, and there were other things. For this feast, Gwen was not required to do any of the hearth chores, although she did, in fact, pitch in. With the other squires, she went to gather fallen wood in the forest. She gathered cress and the young sprouts of the cattail plants, which were delicious when quickly dunked in boiling water. She caught and cleaned fresh fish. There was, of course, little fresh game at this feast. This was the time of year when birds were about to nest and animals giving birth, and careful custodian of his lands that the king was, he forbade any springtime hunting, except for the very old, and those made for tough eating and required stewing. But mostly Gwen did the chores that her warrior band did, endless wood chopping for the cook fires and ovens, the hauling of water, which was regarded by their trainers as yet another fine way to build their strength, building temporary paddocks for the visitors' mounts, and a thorough cleaning out of the stables down to the bare earth, which was then sprinkled with lime to sweeten it before sand was brought in to cover the lime, and straw laid down over that. The castle underwent a thorough cleaning too, with the winter's rushes hauled out, the stone floor scrubbed, and new rushes brought in, but that was mostly the work of the servants. And Gwen had learnt that for her, at least, the time of the celebration itself was going to mean still more work. Peter Ap Duach, Gwen's chief instructor and one of her father's most trusted captains, called all of his particular charges together just before the first visitors were to arrive. I have assignments for some of ye, he said shortly, looking them all over with a stern eye, and no whinging do I want to be hearing. Not all the king's honoured guests will be bringing their own pages and squires, and that'll be the job ye'll be doin. Tis a great honour to be chosen, and a great trust. So here now, he'll be the ones that'll be serving. Never in a thousand years would Gwen have thought she'd be picked, but to her astonishment she heard her name called, and that she would be serving Hid Ap Kai, Braith's lord. She didn't question the assignment, however, nor did she complain about being put to work when some of the others were free to enjoy the relative freedom they'd have while the celebrations were afoot. For one thing, it gave her rather a thrill to have been picked over those older than she. For another, well, this was Braith's liege lord, which meant that she would almost certainly be spending a lot of time in the company of the real warriors and chariot drivers, without needing an excuse to try and hang about. So as soon as it was possible to do so, once Hid had arrived, she presented herself to him as his page. Since the weather was fine, he'd set up a tent, as had many of the lords and captains. She didn't blame them, Sleeping conditions in the great hall were beyond crowded. His bodyguard nodded at her and pulled the canvas flap aside for her. "'Lord Hid, I am to be your page,' she said, as the man turned away from something he had been unpacking from a small chest to look at her. 
Peda sent ye? he asked. She bowed as was proper, and kept her eyes on her toes as was also proper. The king's daughter could look boldly into the face of a high lord and one of the king's favoured captains, but a page had to be respectful and show humility. Then go to the king and give him my compliments, and ask when he wishes me to attend him. Bring me back his answer. Is Lord Gwydion here yet? Ay, my lord, I will, she replied immediately. I don't know about Lord Gwydion, my lord. Then on this the king wants me urgent. Go to him and tell him we need to speak about that hand-fasting at his leisure. Find out about Lord Gwydion. Then return with the king's word. I'll have more work for ye then. She bowed again and ran off at high speed. She suspected sending her to her father was on the order of a test. If she hadn't been sent by Pedda, and was only trying to find a way to lurk about and eavesdrop on the adults, this would uncover the ruse. But of course she had been, so she'd passed the test, if test it was. Her father returned the compliments as impassively as if she had been anyone but his daughter. There was no urgency. He would gladly receive Hid at supper. Lord Gwydion was not yet arrived. She ran back as quickly as she could, without arriving in an unseemly, untidy and panting condition. Hid accepted the answers she had brought back without comment, and immediately put her to work in truth. Mostly the work involved a lot of fetching, and much more message-taking. In fact, by the time darkness fell, she was about run off her feet. Her duties to Hid should have included serving at his side at table, but she hadn't yet been trained in that, and with a chuckle he dismissed her. "'Go and sup with your family, little page,' he told her kindly. Near starving, she was nothing loath to obey him. She found herself seated between the same two boys as at the Sarwin feast, but this time word had mysteriously spread that she was now one of their peers. Instead of ignoring her, they included her in their chatter, and despite the long day, she found herself having a lively conversation with them about tricks they had all learned for managing their horses. Though she was younger than they, she discovered she had great status in their eyes, not because she was the king's daughter, but because she was Braith's girl. And that she could entirely understand. Sometimes the fact that Braith had singled her out made her feel giddy. She had learned how to pour, so when the last of the supper was carried away and the tables set to the side, she stood behind Hid and saw to it that his flagon was never empty. It was ale, not mead, they were drinking tonight. Serious drinking would happen later. The talk was of nothing particularly serious. That too would wait until the morrow, when all the guests would be here. The only thing that Gwen heard of any interest was that Braith would not be racing tomorrow. The best of Hid's mares were all in foal. The king looked envious, her team included. Long before the men were prepared to take to their beds, Gwen and the other pages began to droop. She was willing to hold out as long as she had to, or at least to try, but the king took pity on them all and dismissed them. "'My own servants can see our cups stay full,' he said with a laugh, "'and we'll get no work out of these youngsters to-morrow if they cannot keep awake.' As was usual now, Gwen was the first into the big bed. Now she could have claimed the choice spot in the centre, but she kept to her old place instead. This endeared her to her older sisters, who in their turn saw to it that Gwen Weevark got not so much as a hope of interfering with her. Little Gwen might have outwardly reformed, but it was clear that Kataruna and Ginath were not convinced of her sincerity. Nor was Gwen, but since her return to the king's good graces, little Gwen seemed to have wormed her way back into the position of indulged baby. Gwen didn't much care, 
given that she had everything she could ever have wanted, but the two older girls were not so happy about it. And in fact they woke her up when the three of them came to bed, arguing about it. "'Father thinks it's amusing,' Ginath was saying, the disapproval so thick in her tone that it surprised Gwen into complete wakefulness. "'But it's a disgrace. You shame all of us acting like that. You're too young to be putting on such a show, and old enough to know better.' "'But father likes it,' little Gwen said insolently. "'So you have nothing to say about it. I'm his favourite, and I can do what I want. You heard him?' "'We heard him.' Kataruna said darkly, then laughed. But you won't be his favorite for much longer, you wicked little changeling. You just wait till harvest, ha! <laughs> Why? Little Gwen's tone was suspicious. I'm not going to tell you, Kataruna taunted, because you are so full of yourself that you haven't paid any attention to what's going on right under your nose. Tell me, Little Gwen demanded, Tell. Oh, tell her before they hear her out in the hall and we all get in trouble, Ginath interrupted crossly. Oh, never mind. Brat, by the time harvest comes around, Mother will have had a baby and it's going to be a boy, which means not only will you not be the youngest any more, Father won't care a straw about what you want. Not when he has a prince to fuss over. So there. Chew on that a while, and enjoy yourself while you can, because by this time next year you'll be lucky if he even notices you. The bed creaked and moved as the two eldest got in. You're lying, little Gwen finally burst out. I don't believe you. And I don't care. We're going to sleep. You can stand there all night stamping your foot if you want. It's not going to change the truth. The bed bounced and shook a little more, as both of the older girls turned their backs on the youngest. Little Gwen stood there for several moments longer, before finally coming to bed herself. But she said nothing, so Gwen fell quickly asleep. In the morning she was the first awake, and none of the three even stirred as she slipped out of bed. They must have come to bed much later than she had supposed, and far past their usual bedtime. Could that have been the cause of the quarrel, or had it been something else? Well, it hardly mattered. Gwen had work to do. The first thing was to make sure her horses were properly tended for the day. The grooms would ordinarily take care of that, but they would have their hands full with all of the visitors' horses. So Gwen got into her older clothing first, and went out to make sure they were fed, watered, groomed, and turned out for the day. Then she returned to the castle, changed into her good clothing, ate quickly, and went to present herself to Lord Hid. She spent the rest of the day in a state between anxiety and bliss. Anxiety because she was terrified lest she do something wrong and disgrace herself, or worse, her trainers and her father. Bliss because of the company she was in, and all the things she was hearing. She didn't understand more than a quarter of it, as the talk ranged from politics to horse-breeding, but she tried to consign as much of it to memory as possible. Again at dinner, and again at supper, Lord Hib sent her to sup at the high table with her family, rather than waiting on him. She had assumed that tonight— the night when the women would gather to work the magic that would bless the seeds and the soil, she would be expected to serve as cup-bearer. But no, once the remains of supper were cleared away, all of the pages were dismissed as her father and his chief lords took themselves to the solar and closeted themselves away from any and all ears, including those of the pages. Full of nervous energy, for she had keyed herself up to see the night through, and not get sent to her bed like a sleepy baby, she was at a loss at what to do with herself. This not being a great festival like Midsummer or even Beltane, and not being a feast of plenty like the autumn equinox, there were no bards nor even itinerant musicians, only those among her father's men and the villagers who could play a few tunes. 
That was good enough for dancing, but she had no interest in dancing. Some of her own lot of young warriors were taking advantage of the absence of their elders to dip as heavily into the ale and mead as they could. That held no appeal for her either. Kataruna and Ginath were each enjoying the attentions of several boys, an activity which seemed a pointless waste of time. Then it occurred to her. She could spy on the rites. It wasn't precisely forbidden. She wouldn't have dared such a thought if there was any chance that the gods would take offence at her curiosity. So why not? In a few years she would be old enough to participate anyway. So what was the harm? Even if you weren't one of the wise women, there was always a place in the circle for you. It certainly wasn't going to be difficult to find them. All rites were held at the stone circle not far from the thicket where she had seen the bear and serpent fight. She took a quick glance around the hall and saw no one, no adult at any rate, who was paying much attention to what the youngsters were doing. She got up and walked out as if she had some errand she had been sent on. No one stopped or questioned her, and once she got out past the tents and the fires, she made a sharp turn towards the stone circle. Once away from the fires, she looked back to make sure she was not being followed, waited for her eyes to adjust to the darkness, then carried on. With all the people about, she was not concerned with wild beasts. All the noise had probably frightened most of them into hiding, and the rest would be very cautious. She saw the light of the fires within the circle reflecting upon the stones long before she caught sight of the figures within the circle or heard their voices. She knew where there would be a good vantage point, and as silently as a stalking fox she slipped into it. Her heart raced with excitement. She had never seen any of the rites before, and was hoping that there would be real magic. Somewhat to her surprise, for she had thought that only women were permitted at the rites, she saw that there were two men and a boy within the circle. One of the men was cloaked and hooded, and stood well back from the rest. The others seemed to be a bard and his apprentice. The bard was speaking as she moved into place, and she held her breath to listen to him when her mother answered him, but in a voice full of power. Now she heard the tale of Gwydion and Arianhrod, of Hlu and Goronwe, often enough to know within hearing a few words that this was what they were playing out, with Eleri taking the part of Arianhrod, and these men the other parts. But then something happened. The world about her shifted. She felt incredibly dizzy, hot and cold at the same time, as if she had struck her head in a fall. Everything blurred for a moment. It was no longer night, but broad day. And she was not on her father's lands near the stone circle. She was on the top of a bluff that fell off abruptly to end in the sea. At least she thought it was the sea, though she had never seen it herself. There was water to the horizon, an unfamiliar tangy scent in the air, and a roaring sound from the waves coming to shore below her. On top of the bluff was a castle easily five times bigger than Castel Nuchlas, maybe ten times. It was so big she couldn't rightly judge. And the woman standing before the castle was so beautiful she took Gwen's breath away. Her hair was a ruddy gold and fell to her feet. Her eyes were bluer than the sky, and her face was terrifying in its perfection. She wore a rich gown of some shining red stuff that Gwen couldn't identify. There was silver at her wrists and her throat. A silver chain served her as a belt, and she wore a silver fillet in her hair. Before her was a man as like to her as could be, Vaguely Gwen realized that if this was Arianhrod, then he must be Gwydion, her brother. With him was a boy hovering on the edge of manhood. Both the boy and Gwydion were clothed in rough, churlish clothing, with the leather aprons of cobblers. 
Ariane Hrod was angry, but more than angry she was near tears, and no wonder. This boy was her son, and his birth had been the cause of her shame, for she had been thus exposed by the magic of math, Gwydion's king, to all as being no longer virgin. It was Gwydion who was the cause of that, so small wonder she was angry at him, and angry at his bringing before her the boy who had until this moment been nameless, and who she had repudiated, abandoned, and denied. He shall get no name unless he gets it from my own lips, and that will never be, she had told her brother. And now he had tricked her again. She had called him the bright and clever-handed, which served very well as a name, so now he was Hlu Hlor Giffes. She had just at this moment seen through the deception. Oh, perfidy, she cried, and Gwen could see how hard it was for her not to cry. She was so angry with her brother for raising this child, for presenting the source of her shame to her, that she could scarcely form the words. You have tricked me twice, but there shall come no third time, and this your protégé shall never be a man. She all but spat the word. Hear my will on this. You have got him a name by trickery, but he shall never bear arms unless I give them to him with my own hands. Now go, and find him a fit place among the churls or the women. A darkness passed over the scene as Gwen shuddered at the misery in Ariane Hrod's voice. She sensed how deeply wounded the goddess was, how it wounded her that this beautiful boy that she would gladly have cherished was the cause of the worst experience of her life. And when the darkness faded into light, the scene remained the same, but it was clear some time had passed. Two bards, an old, old man and his apprentice, approached the castle and were welcomed inside. Somehow Gwen found herself in the great hall with them, as if she were some sort of bodiless spirit, and while part of her knew that the bard and his companion were, in fact, Gwydion and Hlu in disguise, she could not see it, and clearly neither could Ariane Hrod. Gwydion was a famous bard in actuality, something that his sister seemed to have forgotten, as he regaled her and her court of mostly women with song and story. But behind the storytelling there was magic afoot. Gwen felt the power stirring, could almost see it, as Gwydion wove it into the tales of battle and tragedy that he chanted. She felt the power stretching the very fabric of the air tight, as a drumhead was stretched tight, until at last it took shape from those very same tales, just as Gwydion had intended. The roar of an assaulting army shook the walls of the castle. Startled into panic, Ariantrod and her women screamed in fear, as well they might, considering how few men were in Ariantrod's retinue. In terror, Ariantrod turned to the bard, who could be expected to have some idea who might be attacking her, all unprovoked, and who might well have some strong magic to defend his hostess. "'I have given you my heart and bread,' she cried. "'I beg you, help me!' Gwydion had only been waiting for this, and thrust Lu towards the queen. "'This fellow is a doughty fighter,' he said, "'worth ten of any normal man. Arm him, my lady, and I will strive to make magic in your aid.' Arianhrod called for a sword and armour to be brought, and with her own hands buckled sword and scabbard on to Lu. In that moment the clamour from outside ceased, and the seeming dropped from both Lu and Gwydion, and Arianhrod's fear turned to fury. Three times tricked, she spat, but this, I swear, will pay for all. 
Never, Lu Lor Giffis, will you have lover or leman or wife that is a mortal woman. Enjoy that sword you got of me, for that is all the bedfellow you shall ever have. But Lu did not care, for now at last he had the arms he needed to slay the man that had tried to slay him. His face was alight with a fierce exultation, so that it outshone the sun, and his eyes burned so brightly that for a moment Gwen was blinded. When her sight came back, the scene had changed. A dark but handsome man cowered before Hlu, the treacherous Goronwe, who had plotted with Hlu's faithless wife to slay him. But now it was Goronwe's turn to be slain. Standing where Hlu had stood, he pleaded for his life. I have no magic to protect me as you did, he was begging, as Gwen took in the scene. Let me at least have a paving stone between us. Hlu laughed. Never let it be said that I was less than fair, he replied mockingly. You may have your stone. Desperately, Goronwe pulled up a flat stone and huddled behind it, as if behind a shield, and Hlu stretched his arm back. As the sun stretches his strength, come the year turning, and flung his spear with all his strength. As the warming spring is flung against the cold and weakening winter and the spear hit the flagstone so hard that it pierced straight through and killed Goronwe in the instant. Hlu's shout of triumph shattered the world into a thousand, thousand bright splinters. And with that, Gwen fell back into herself and found herself once again hiding in the shadows of three massive oak trees, watching the rite take place within the circle of standing stones. Chapter 6 Driving a chariot, merely driving it, and not doing any of the tricks that the experienced drivers did, was a lot harder than it looked. To begin with, there were two sets of reins, each set going to a different horse, each of whom had its own ideas about how a good driver handled those reins. Then there was the fact that you were standing on something that was moving, so your balance was constantly shifting, and that caused tugging on the reins if you weren't careful, and that gave the horses signals to do things you hadn't intended. She was just lucky that her pair was so experienced, so steady, so calm. They reacted to bad signals, not by obeying them, but by stopping dead in their tracks and waiting patiently for her to sort herself and them out. Gwen had never been happier. Braith was right. This was what she had been born to do. There was so much more to learn. She'd had no idea, not really, when she first started down this path, how much there was to it. She supposed now that it was all a matter of seeing, that she'd only really paid attention to the warriors, who were the end of all the training, and not to the milling lot of half-finished people still in training. But now that she was in the middle of it all, she had at least a sense of how much more there was to being a warrior. And even knowing how much work there would be, how far she had to go, she still wanted to learn it all. Today she guided her team carefully around a course laid out by the horsemaster. They'd been at the walk, then the fast walk, then the trot. Now he signaled to them to move straight into a full charge. She slapped the reins on their backs and shouted, bracing herself against the chariot back as they surged forward in the traces. The chariot bounced and bucked. She kept her knees flexed as she had been taught, and kept her balance, although it was a fight to do so. Here is where it was so important for the young warrior to be trained by old, experienced horses. If she fell, she knew she could count on them to stop dead, 
because they had done just that in the early stages of her driving training. She got bruised, but she didn't get as badly hurt as she would have if the team had kept going. This was far more frightening than riding. Anyone with any sense would be terrified, with the flying hooves of the horses so close to you, with the chariot bouncing like the featherweight thing that it was, and you trying to guide the horses around turns that slung it sideways as well as sending it bounding into the air. And for that reason it was all the more exciting and exhilarating. The horse-master let them run the course three times before signaling her to slow, then stop. He walked up to them and slid his hand up the shoulder of the mare under her mane and nodded with satisfaction. She was no warmer than she should be. She showed none of the signs of fighting with her driver. Without a word, he waved Gwen off and signaled to the next to come on to the course. She hopped down out of her chariot, her legs wobbly with fatigue, but determined not to show it, and walked them back to the paddock, where she backed her chariot into its place in line, unhitched them, and led them off to cool. Once they were fit to turn loose, she unharnessed them, gave them a quick rub-down, and let them out into the field. She turned then to find her mother at the fence, waiting patiently for her to be finished. She looked in her pregnancy like the pregnant goddess must look. Ridiculously young, face glowing and beautiful as the sun. She was startled, to say the least. Not that Eleri was an utter stranger to the stable. She had driven a chariot herself in the past, though she hadn't done so in several years, and certainly not in her current state. She was, perhaps, two moons from giving birth, which made it even odder that she should have come down here to the stables, when her increasing girth made such a long walk uncomfortable. And there was no doubt who she had come to see. Gwen was the only person here at the moment. She recollected herself quickly. Here she was not the Queen's daughter. Here she was nothing more than a warrior in training, and as such she bowed low and did not raise her eyes. My lady, she said, and nothing more. It was for Eleri to give an order, and her to obey it without question. Gwen, walk with me. The Queen's voice made that a command, a gentle one, but nevertheless a command. Obediently Gwen went to her mother's side and set her pace to the Queen's slower one. They did not go far, only to a bit of stone outcropping overlooking the chariot course that made a convenient seat. Eleri eased herself down onto it, while Gwen remained standing, until her mother patted the stone beside her. Still puzzled, but grateful, Gwen took a seat beside the Queen, and Eleri put one arm around her daughter, hugging Gwen close, and with that gesture Gwen became the princess again, and not the young warrior. "'I'm sending Kataruna to the ladies,' Eleri said out of nowhere. "'I know you wanted that yourself, and perhaps in time we shall send you, but your mentors tell us that you are doing well.' so well that they have urged me not to send you until you are much older and your training is complete. Gwen turned her head up to look at her mother in astonishment, to see the queen gazing down at her with an anxious look in her eyes. This kingdom needs as many with the blessing as powerful as I have been given, as Kataruna has been given, as we can manage to be properly trained. Kataruna leaves today, in fact, in company with two of the village girls who also have the blessing. The king and I wanted to send her off before she made any serious attachments to a boy, and there are several now with whom she might. I hope you are not upset. Now Gwen was even more astonished. No, she blurted. Braith was right. This is what I want. Eleri sighed 
and her face took on an expression of regret. Your father said that you would say that. Gwen's brows creased. Is that bad? The queen hugged her again. Not at all. But you know that the hand of the goddess was strong on you when you were born, and I was sure that there was nothing that you would want more than to take up the power. Now, she sighed more deeply, now you are around cold iron so much that the power is fading. I begin to think, as Braith does, that there were two goddesses bestowing their blessing on you, and one of them was Epona. I cannot fault you at all for choosing her, and I know I will not have to ask you twice. You want this more than anything. Gwen nodded solemnly. Then my blessing on you, and Kataruna will take your place. There is Kataruna, and perhaps your other sisters. The queen got ponderously to her feet. I have been watching you at your training, and your mentors are right. Your hand was made for the chariot reins, for the bow, and perhaps for the sword. I will sleep well of nights, knowing that you will be a strong guardian to your little brother as he grows. I promise, she said firmly. In fact, she could not think of anything more delightful. She would guard him until he was old enough to take up these first lessons himself, and then she would help to teach him. And when he was a man, she would be one of his chosen band and fight at his side. The queen's hand rested briefly, caressingly on her head, warm and tender. "'Go back to your lessons, young warrior,' she said fondly. "'Be wise as the salmon, crafty as the fox, valiant as the wolfhound, and fierce as the hawk.' Then she turned, and as she did, Gwen felt something quite peculiar a sense that something had been loosened between them. Not broken, not at all, but it felt very much as if the Queen had opened a door to her and was letting her go through it all on her own, like the first day a young falcon was taken off the Creans and allowed to fly free. She looked up into her mother's eyes. I will, she repeated, making a pledge of it. You'll be proud of me. I already am, her mother replied, and turned to make the slow journey back to the palace. Gwen couldn't stand to be indoors that night, sandwiched in the big bed with her sisters. She wanted to be completely alone with her thoughts. She wanted nothing to interrupt, and above all, she did not want little Gwen to sour everything with poking and prodding. Little Gwen had an uncanny instinct for when Gwen wanted to think. During the day, of course, little Gwen didn't come anywhere near her. But during the day, Gwen was too busy to stop to think. That moment when the Queen had come to speak to her had been the only pause in the entire day, and Gwen was pretty certain she would not have had that much if it had not been the Queen who had taken her aside. Gwen's day, like that of her fellows, always began before anyone else but the servants were up, and was filled with chores, exercises, practices, lessons, and duties. It only ended when the steward, who was the one in charge of Gwen and her fellow squires and pages, said that the day was over. But she loved it. Not every moment of it, of course, but even in the most tedious parts, the knowledge that, after this, I'll have archery practice, or will be learning to wheel in formation, kept her willing to work through the tedious or the difficult or the downright onerous. Or she would be thinking hard about something she was supposed to master, which made the time pass so much faster when she was mucking out or grooming or cleaning weapons and armor. And, of course, when she served at table, she had to stay on her toes. The great hall was a lot more crowded when you were counted among the servitors. Not that all the squires served every night, far from it, 
Most meals were very informal, but they all took it in turn to serve at the high table to keep in practice. Gwen was never allowed to serve the king. The steward told her from the beginning, but a squire was never, ever allowed to serve someone he was closely related to. But at some point or other she did serve each of the other men at the king's side of the table, his three captains, the steward himself, and any important guests he might have. That, too, put her out of little Gwen's reach, and usually she was so tired by the time the steward dismissed them all that she went straight to bed and was asleep by the time little Gwen, who was always trying to put off her bedtime, came back to the room. But on those rare occasions when Gwen wasn't exhausted and did want to lie awake thinking for a while, little Gwen seemed to sense, somehow, that she was feigning sleep and would poke and prod her accidentally, or pretend to be tossing and turning, interrupting her thoughts. So to-night she took a sheer sheepskin rug and a blanket out to that little sheltered corner where she used to pick over the feathers. She nodded at the sentry standing guard at the door. Too hot to sleep inside, she told him, and he grinned and nodded. Of course he wouldn't have grinned and nodded if she had been old enough for boys to be interested, as they were in Kataruna. He would have asked quite sternly if the king knew she intended to sleep out and if she was sleeping alone, and then he would have made certain that the king did know and knew who she was with. Not all her willing him not to see would have stopped him from spotting her if she had been Kataruna's age. Although things were changing elsewhere, it was still the expected thing here that boys and girls, even when the girl was the king's daughter, would make their first fumblings together without there being any formal promises binding them. A swelling belly generally meant a wedding, of course, but Gwen knew vaguely that there were ways of preventing such a thing. If there hadn't been, there would have been a great many more princesses than just four. In the village, at least, the girl that went to her marriage a virgin was a rarity. Nevertheless, for the king's daughters, there were some things expected. You might keep the identity of the boy you were with from your parents if he were an ordinary girl, but the king's daughter, well, there were always going to be complications. That had been carefully explained to them once they were old enough to notice that not all the bodies in the great hall of knights were quiet ones. If you went with a boy, mother and father had to know about it, know who he was, and to that end the king's men would be asking questions if you went slipping out to meet one. And you had better go to your betrothal, if not your wedding, still virginal, or at least able to pretend to that state. But she was still young enough that it didn't matter. He probably thought that she was going to go meet up with more of the squires for an illicit berry feast, perhaps, or some night fishing, or even for the sharing out of too much stolen ale or mead. He still had to know, of course, and followed her for a bit. But under his watchful eye she went right where she said she was going to, laid the hide down over the grass, rolled up the blanket into a pillow, and laid herself down to stare up at the night sky. Satisfied, he went back to his post. What the Queen had told her still warmed her heart and gave her a thrill of pride. It was one thing to have her father beaming at her. She was doing just what he had hoped some one of his children would. She had joined the ranks of the warriors, she was doing well at her duties, and it was only natural that he was proud of her. Perhaps it was a mild surprise that it was Gwen in particular, but Braith was a trusted member of his elite fighting force, and the last thing he would do would be to prevent Gwen from following in the footsteps of such a valued warrior and driver. But she was doing precisely the opposite of what the Queen had planned for her. She'd avoided thinking about it, but underneath everything she'd been certain that Eleri must be disappointed in her, maybe angry. 
but she wasn't, so not only was Gwen proud and happy, she was relieved. It wasn't often that Ellery changed her mind or her plans. It wasn't often that she needed to. Gwen had felt the weight of Ellery's expectations weighing her spirit down with dread. Now that weight was gone, and she felt light enough to fly up to the moon. Underneath all that was one thing more. The farther her duties took her from the women's side of castle life, the less time she had to spend in little Gwen's company. That was a relief, too. In fact, it was entirely possible, but at some point she would be expected to move from that comfortable bed to a pallet in the great hall with the others. Little did they know that she would gladly trade that warm bed and its unruly occupant for relative discomfort and peace. In the morning Gwen returned to the bedchamber, intending to leave the blanket and rug and go straight out to her duties, only to walk into a storm, and at the center of that storm was little Gwen. Kataruna stood with her arms crossed and her lips pressed tightly together, as little Gwen tore through the two packs she had carefully made up, hissing angrily that Kataruna had stolen her things. "'Where is my comb?' she demanded, her voice getting louder with each moment. "'You took it! And my ribbons! And my top!' Quietly, Gwen edged into the room and dropped her burdens in the corner. She would have liked to edge out again, but by this point little Gwen's tantrum was turning into a full-blown tirade, when she didn't find any of the things she was claiming were stolen. Kataruna's belongings were scattered all over the floor, as if tossed by a whirlwind, and Bronwyn, awakened by the fuss, appeared at the door curtain. But at that same moment, someone far more important than Bronwyn appeared at the door to the solar. It was the king. Without a word, he strode into the room picked up little Gwen by the scruff of her neck, and shook her until her teeth rattled. Shocked into silence, her eyes gone round as river stones, when he let go of her, she fell in an unmoving heap on the floor. "'How dare you disturb the Queen's rest!' he snarled, staring down at little Gwen. "'How dare you trouble the mother of my son! How dare you, miserable changeling!' Enough! More than enough! He turned to Bronwyn. See to it that she repacks all of Kataruna's things with care, while my good Kataruna breaks her fast. Then see to it that when the top and the ribbons are found, they are given to some child of the village that deserves a reward. He turned his gaze down on little Gwen again. I would have thought you had learned your lesson by now, but I see that you have not. Perhaps your hands are too idle. Perhaps you need more work to do. Little Gwen stared up at the king, her face blank. Bronwyn compressed her lips tight. That may be so, my lord king, she said. Perhaps some kitchen work? Little Gwen made a faint sound of protest. The king ignored her. Perhaps, he said, perhaps she will learn that churlish manners lead to being set among the churls. Gwen winced. She knew that above all things little Gwen was proud. Being put with the lowest servants to do the most menial of tasks would be an agony to her. The king turned to Kataruna and put gentle hands on her shoulders. As for you, my daughter, go and break your fast well. We are pleased and proud that you are going to the ladies. Master your blessing, become wise and true, and return to take your place at the queen's right hand, first among your sisters. I shall be with you anon to bid you farewell. Kataruna's lower lip trembled a trifle with emotion. Thank you, father, she said. I will not fail you. The king chuckled slightly 
and chucked her under the chin. Now come, it is no more than a matter of lessons and learning, which we both know you excel at. You are not going off to battle, but to something I think you will find a pleasure. He gave her a gentle push in the direction of the hall. Now go, for I am sure Bronwyn has managed something especial from the cooks for you. Katerina ducked her head in a quick curtsy and turned, whisking her skirts as she slipped under the door curtain. Gwen took the opportunity to follow her. What was that about? she asked, as one of the maidservants intercepted Katerina with a platter heaped with good things, obviously being saved for her. I knew there would be a pother last night, Katerina replied, as Gwen got a wooden platter and took bread and butter, cheese and carved cold meat from last night's dinner. You know how the little brat hates it when a fuss is made over anyone but herself, and there was a double fuss after dinner. Mother asked me to sit beside her, and when they weren't all talking about what I could expect to be learning from the ladies, they were all talking about the baby. I could just see little Gwen starting to get that look she gets when you know she's going to do something. Gwen nodded. She knew that look all too well. Katerina shrugged. I expected trouble from her last night, and I think perhaps Bronwyn did too, and maybe Mother. When we went to bed, Bronwyn gave us all possets to drink, and little Gwen went straight to sleep. Bronwyn and I were able to pack my things in peace. If I'd known that, I wouldn't have slept outside, Gwen said ruefully. I wanted to think a while, and I didn't want the brat poking and prodding at me. Well, I wish Bronwyn hadn't done that, because she was awake far too early, and the first thing she did was to tear into my packs. Katerina made a face. Poor Ginnath! You're off with the squires all the time. Pretty soon you'll all be made into a real war band, and you'll all be doing everything together. It could even be that you'll be out in the great hall with them to sleep, and she'll be the one left to deal with the brat. The eldest of the king's daughters sighed and ate some bread dipped in honey. I am not going to miss that. Are you going to miss any of this? Gwen asked curiously. Truthfully? Katerina nibbled pensively on her bread. I don't think so. I don't make friends the way Ginath does. None of the boys here make me want to kiss them. I truly will be glad to see the last of the brat, and until now there was nothing really special about me except I was the eldest. Gwen blinked, wondering obscurely if she ought to feel hurt by such a revelation. But she and Katerina were too far apart in age to have been close. Until now, I never really had anything for myself, Katerina was continuing. Oh, I had the blessing, but from what I heard, it was never as strong as yours. I'm not pretty like Ginath and little Gwen, and I would never want to be a warrior. Up until you got singled out by Braith, I was just, really, nothing special. You were the one that was going to the ladies as soon as you ever could, and if I went, it would be only after you came back and since everyone expected great things of you, I'd still be coming in your shadow. Something about Katerina's tone made Gwen feel obscurely guilty, and even gladder that she'd had Braith to send her in another direction. But now, Katerina finished the bread with a lift of her head and an air of satisfaction, now it's me that's going to the ladies, and it'll be me that will be the maiden in the circle when I get back. And the ladies won't know, or won't care, what great things were expected of you. You've gone the path of iron, and you'll never be as strong in magic as me now. So when I come back, I'll be me, Katerina, with my own place and my own path, just like you'll have your own place and your own path. 
she turned her head to look at Gwen. I'm really grateful to you, Gwen. That's why I don't think I'll miss home too much. It's not as if I won't be coming back, but when I do, it will be as the blessed daughter. You'll be the warrior daughter by then, and Ginath, she chuckled a little, Ginath will have half the war chiefs wanting her for a bride, and she'll make father some good alliance, and then she'll make him a grandfather, if she hasn't already by the time I get back. Who knows, maybe she'll even get a prince. She didn't say anything about little Gwen, and Gwen was not inclined to prompt her on that head. Did you really want to go to the ladies that much? she asked instead. As much as you wanted to be a warrior, Kataruna said fiercely. Then I'm glad you're going. Gwen surprised her sister, and to an extent herself, by fiercely embracing her. Kataruna returned the embrace. And I'm glad you're happy where you are. She nodded. We're lucky. We are. At that moment, Bronwyn made her way across the great hall, trailed by a servant with Kataruna's two packs. Kataruna eyed them curiously. The king, your father, thought of several more things you should take with you, Bronwyn said, with a glint in her eye, but her lips set in a severe line. Little Gwen will be making do with made-over gowns for a time. I trust you will find moments to spare to make yourself suitable garments with the lengths in the bottom of the packs. Kataruna could not repress a gasp of pleasure. All the girls knew about the lengths of lamb's wool and linen that had been reserved for little Gwen. Gwen had been indifferent, since gowns were the last thing on her mind at the moment, but she suspected Kataruna and Ginath had suffered a pang or two of envy. I shall find the time somewhere, she promised fervently. Father is most gracious. Bronwyn looked as if she might say more, but in the end only nodded. Come, it is time. Your escort is waiting. But it seemed that more than just the escort was waiting. The king himself came to see his daughter off, something else Kataruna had clearly not expected. He lifted her onto the horse himself, after kissing her on both cheeks. "'We send nothing but our best to the ladies,' he boomed, in a voice intended to carry, "'and we know you will make us all proud.' With her head high, her cheeks glowing, and her eyes shining, Kataruna bowed deeply to her father. Then, at a word from the king, she and the escort rode off at a brisk walk, and were soon over the hill and out of sight. Bronwyn remained staring after them long after everyone else had gone to their duties, one hand on Gwen's shoulder, preventing her from leaving. When there was no one else within earshot, Bronwyn looked somberly down at her. I would not say this in Kataruna's hearing, but it was a spiteful splash of venom from that unnatural child that caused the king to rethink her leave-taking. Why such a pother over the second best, she said, and in the next moment she turned her eyes on the servant and had him doing the packing for her. Bronwyn's lips tightened. I confess that I am sorely tried by that child, if I had not been the midwife myself, I would suspect her of being a changeling. I think it may be she has some different magic of her own, not out of her mother, of charm or glamoury, that she is only yet vaguely aware of. And this is why I decided to speak to you. To me? Gwen was astonished. But— if that child does have such a thing, the queen has armoured the king against it, as she has armoured him against any ill magics, which is why she could not sway his anger. But there are others that will have no such armouring, and they may be those with whom you must deal. Bronwyn shook her greying head. 
I wish to tell you to be wary of rousing the child's envy. Try not to come between her and something she wants, at least until I have devised a means to deal with her, or discovered what it is that she has. She looked up again, down the road that Kataruna was travelling. I am very glad that Kataruna is well away, and Ginath, I think, is safe enough for now. But you have ever had her enmity, and it is best you stay out of her gaze. Well, that was easy enough to promise. I will, she said, and Bronwyn let her go. But it was troubling. This was the second time that someone she trusted had warned her against little Gwen, and in terms that suggested she was more than just a spiteful little girl. Chapter 7 Gwen! hissed Madoc. Gwen! She ignored him, working hard on her horse's harness with a polishing cloth, a little oil and talc, trying to get the brass bits to look like gold. The leather was already cleaned and oiled, and as supple as a snake. Adara and Di were groomed within an inch of their lives every day, their hooves oiled, their manes and tails braided and clubbed up to keep them from tangling. Midsummer was barely a week away now, and as usual there would be many of her father's war chiefs arriving for the festival and the rites. Braith was coming. There would be some abbreviated races, nothing like the ones in the autumn, since some of the mares had foals at heel, and you wouldn't race one of those, but there would be a maiden race for the pages and squires, since all of them had horses past breeding age or geldings. Gwen was riding and driving both, and desperately wanted Braith to be proud of how far she had come. She wasn't really concerned about winning the races. Some of the others had horses much younger than hers. Three of the boys about her age were, frankly, more skilled. But she did want Braith to see that her backing hadn't been misplaced. So she had gone over her gear twice now, cleaning and polishing, mending not only popped stitches, but stitches that only looked a little weak. The saddle, the harness, all looked new, but the brass bits still weren't shiny enough. Gwen! They weren't supposed to be talking. They were supposed to be tending to their gear. What? she growled out at the side of her mouth. Is he coming? Here! Is he really coming? Maddox sounded breathless and nervous, probably at least as nervous as she was about Braith coming. Is who coming? she responded, her irritation growing. Pedder glanced over in their direction. He'd clearly heard the hissing, though he hadn't picked out who was talking yet. She bent her head down to her task. With luck he wouldn't notice. Maybe she had permission to end her chores of women's work, but that didn't mean an end to toil. If he felt she wasn't paying sufficient attention to repairing her harness, he would probably set her to wood-chopping, water-carrying, paddock-building, or even carrying stones for the many hearths a-building. "'The Merlin?' Madoc asked excitedly. "'Is the Merlin really coming?' "'The Merlin? Whatever gave him that idea? The Merlin was the High King's man. There was no reason for him to come here, of all places.' "'It was a title, of course, not a name.' The Merlin was the chief of all the druids, as the Wren was the chief of all the bards, and his place was at the side of the High King, advising, working men's magic, not journeying weeks away, especially not at midsummer. "'How should I know?' she hissed back, making sure her head was ducked down over her work so Pedder couldn't see her mouth moving. "'You're the King's daughter. Don't you hear everything?' Madoc might well have said more, except that Pedder had picked out him as the chatterer. Madoc, the older warrior snapped. Madoc leapt to his feet. Gwen kept her head down. Yes, lord, he said faintly. 
It's rare for you to have any thought in your mind at all, much less one so burning a hole in it that you can't leave it until later. Have you something you wish to share with us, Madoc? Gwen kept her eyes on her work, furiously polishing, but she could hear the mockery in Pedder's voice. She also heard his footsteps coming up beside her. He was just behind her, out of her peripheral vision, but she could feel his presence looming. "'I only wanted to know if the Merlin is coming to the Midsummer Feast, my lord,' Madoc replied, his voice breaking a little on the last word. "'Did you know?' There was a long pause. "'Well, as it happens, the Merlin is going to be one of the king's honoured guests.' So don't you think you should pay a little more attention to what you are supposed to be doing, so you don't shame yourself before him? Yes, my lord, Madoc squeaked. Then get back to it, boy. Madoc dropped back down to his work and began polishing the brass of his horse's harness as furiously as Gwen was polishing hers. She heard Pedder's footsteps again, and saw his two hairy feet in their old sandals stop beside her. His left big toenail was black, where his horse had stepped on it. She held her breath and continued to polish. "'Acceptable job, squire,' was all Pedder said. Then he moved on. Gwen breathed again. But she could feel how the lot of them had come alive with the news of such an important visitor. Some of it was excitement, but more of it was fear. There had been fantastic tales told about the Merlin. That he had narrowly escaped being sacrificed by King Vortigern as a young boy, because he'd seen the dragon coiled hidden beneath the base of Vortigern's tower, a dragon that subsequently was released to battle another high in the sky above that tower. Some said he was responsible for the great stone circle out on the plain, though that was unlikely, for it had been there long before the Romans had come. But certainly a Merlin had built it, which only showed the power that the Merlins held. It was more likely true that when Arthur's father Uther lusted for Queen Igraine, he cast illusions over Uther to make Igraine and her entire household believe that it was King Gaulois returned from war. That, so they said, was how Arthur was conceived in the first place. Now Igraine was, or had been, one of the ladies, and the blessing was strong in her line, since both Anna Morgors and Morgana were her daughters, and both were noted for their skill at magic. Some said Igraine was a generation or two out of they blood even, which would not have been completely unlikely. There were sea fey of great power who often chose to wed mortal men, and Tintagel was on a coastal cliff high above the sea. So to deceive her would have taken a great deal of power, and a great deal of courage as well. The ladies were not prone to appreciate men, even druids, even the chief druid, meddling in the affairs of one of their own. Of course, Gaulois had been killed that very night, and Uther did not personally have the Orkney king's blood on his hands, since he'd been rather busy with Igraine. And Igraine had turned about and wedded him, so no one said much about the wrong or the right of it, or at least not around Elary's hearth fire, and where, although Anamor Gors was the subject of much head-shaking, Queen Igraine came in for no such censure. Gwen knew better than to ask. She would have been told that the affairs of the very great were of no concern to a mere squire. But, since the Merlin was coming here, it behooved her dig as much as she could manage up out of her memory. The Merlin, it was said, had known that Uther's life was in danger, and he was the one that had spirited infant Arthur away and kept him safe until he could come into his own again. Considering the number of rivals there were for the position of High King, that could not have been easy. 
and it was certainly the Merlin, this Merlin, Uther's Merlin, that put Arthur in the position to take back the throne that was his, first Uther's own lands, then convincing all the other kings to make him the High King, or beating their armies so they were forced to accept him. There were a lot of stories about how the Merlin had had a hand in that, too. Magic swords, mists that sprang up to hide Arthur's movements, and Arthur and his men being in two places at once, two battles on the same day. The Merlin had done the almost unthinkable. he turned an unknown stripling, a mere squire, into the High King in three years, and that meant power. However you looked at it, whether all the stories were true or not, there was no doubt that the Merlin was a formidable man, and an ancient one, since he must have been a man when Arthur was born, and now Arthur himself was full-grown. Which begged the question, why was he coming here? Gwen? Gwen's head snapped up, for it was Pedder who had spoken her name. She jumped to her feet and bowed. My lord? When she looked up, Pedda was eyeing her with speculation. You'll be serving the Merlin. Her jaw dropped. M m my lord? Me? You're discreet, you're well trained, but most of all you are the king's daughter. We can't honor the Merlin too highly. The king your father has said this himself. We will show the Merlin that there is only the best for him. You'll be serving him. She felt her head swimming. Yes, m my lord, she managed, and then she sat down heavily. Serve the Merlin? Surely not. There must be some mistake. There must be some mistake. Gwen was thinking that, as she nervously stroked the front of her tunic, waiting to be presented to the Merlin as his squire. All the squires had been lined up to greet the Merlin. He was too important to just be allowed to turn up and let his servants pitch his pavilion. He'd been watched for over the course of the last few days by outriders from the king's band, and as soon as he and his entourage were in sight, everyone had gotten lined up to greet him, not just the squires. Now, however, all of the important people had properly greeted him, and only the squires remained in their stiff rank. The Merlin was talking quietly to the king, while Eleri and her women waited attentively. Like the other two girls among the squires, she was dressed as the boys were, in tunic and trousers, rather than a gown. Not that she looked all that different from a boy, except for her hair, which had grown out again and been braided up and wrapped around her head, rather than just cut off at the shoulders or the shoulder blades. At first glance, the Merlin did not look particularly imposing. He was quite an old man, in the usual white druidic robes, but he had none of the usual talismans or other items of power about his person. Not even a single necklace or talk. His long grey hair had been braided and clubbed like a horse's tail, his beard trimmed short. But his eyes gave it all away. They didn't look at you, they looked through you, as if he was seeing something else entirely, even while he took in what you looked like on the outside. They were very pale, those eyes, the same pale grey as his hair. He had all his teeth, too, a rarity in someone that old. It gave him a very fierce look. He had a curiously sharp, clean smell to him, like juniper, and he was lean, not emaciated. Altogether, he put Gwen in mind of an old grey owl. You trifled with him at your peril, 
for he still had talons and knew how to use them. Finally, the Merlin's manservant came to tell him that his pavilion was ready. That was the signal for her to be presented. The king crooked his finger. With her mouth gone dry, she came forward. My lord, the king said, with the slightest of bows, this is your squire for as long as you are among us. My daughter, Gwenwevar. Braith's girl, the Merlin nodded, and Gwen suppressed a start of surprise that he would use that term. You honor me by sending your blood to serve me. He turned his attention to Gwen, and the force of his regard landed on her like a blow. Well, by your leave I shall take mine. I am an old man, and I need my rest. The king laughed politely, but in a way that said without words that he believed none of that. Then your squire shall show you to your encampment. We look forward to your presence at our right hand at supper. Gwen thought the Merlin would turn his attention to other things, as she guided him to the spot where his encampment had been set up, against the east castle wall, sheltered from wind, shaded from the worst of the heat of the day, but warmed by the rising sun in the morning. And so he did, but not for long. Time and time again she felt his eyes burning on the back of her neck, and when they reached where his pavilion had been pitched, he stopped her before she could go. I have some business I must carry out, and a message I need taken, squire, he told her. Come, and he motioned for her to step inside the flap his servant held aside for them. She didn't want to, but what could she do? Reluctantly, she obeyed. He sat down on the stool that had been set ready for him, and gestured for her to stand before him. She kept her eyes fastened to her toes. She studied her own feet, studied the wrapped leather shoes she wore with great care. "'Look at me, squire,' the Merlin ordered, sounding impatient. "'Look up at me. Look me in the eyes.' With even greater reluctance, she raised her eyes to his. The moment their gazes locked, his piercing grey eyes filled her vision, and she could not have looked away if she'd wanted to. She felt dizzy, and yet her knees locked, and she stood as rigid as a statue, as if from far away she heard him speaking. Eleri, the queen, your mother, was she at Arthur's wedding? he asked sharply. What kind of a foolish question was that? No, she heard herself replying. She was here. She was the mother in the rites that night. Everyone saw her there, and at the feast before, and the fire after. Not even eagle's wings could have got her there and back in that time. Besides, she wanted to be the mother in the rites, to share the power all the circles were raising for the king. She wanted to hesitate, not to say anything more, but the words kept tumbling out. She wanted to give father a son after so many daughters so she wanted to be sure she could share in that power. She heard him mutter to himself. It made no more sense than his question. Could it be that? The sharing of that power, and not? The portent said it was his son, but could it have meant the child of his power, and not of his blood? Gwen strained against the invisible bonds that held her, but to no avail. The child she bears, boy or girl. 
She didn't want to answer, but the answer slipped from her. A son, as she wanted, the queen says, and so do the signs and all the women. And again, the Merlin muttered, "I dare not risk it. I dare not. Better a hundred innocent perish to remove that one." She felt like a bird in a net. No matter how hard she struggled, she only entangled herself further. The cold hand of fear clutched at her throat. It was impossible to move even a finger. Your sister, Cataruna, did she ask to leave because of the new child? He asked as her head swam and she found it hard to breathe. No, my lord Merlin. She replied truthfully, and found herself relating word for word that last conversation she'd had with her eldest sister. And you, are you jealous of this prince to come? He asked, his eyes burning into hers. No, she gasped, caught unawares by the question. No, I am going to be his guardian, his protector. And when he grows up, I will be among his war chiefs, like Brathis. I will be his bodyguard and maybe even his adviser. Father is proud of me. He said I would be chief among my brother's warriors. It's all I could want. He mumbled something inaudible, then sighed. Well enough. I will find another means. You will forget all this, Gwen Weaver. I asked you nothing. I said nothing to you. His eyes grew dark, and she heard a distant roaring in her ears. You stood beside my seat. I gave you a trifling message to take to my servant, who is with my horses. You delivered it and brought back the answer. That is all. She felt as if she was drowning, felt her lips parting, heard herself whisper, "I, sir." Very good. Abruptly, she felt herself released from his gaze. She stumbled back a little, disoriented for a moment. Why was she here? Oh, of course, she'd delivered a message for him. Do you need anything more from me, my lord? She asked diffidently. He looked up from the wax tablet he was scribing something on. His eyes were distant, unfocused, giving his whole face an absent-minded cast. Hmm, he said, then shook his head, smiling. No, squire, you can go. Oh, but tell the king. I will be very interested to meet the rest of his brood at dinner. She bowed, "I, my lord," she replied, and quickly left the tent. But she had two strange sensations as she did so. The first was relief, as if she had somehow escaped from something very dangerous, and the other, a sense of unfocused unease. Because he wanted to meet her sisters, it made no sense this unease, but there it was. She wanted, of all things, to prevent such a meeting, but that was impossible. Of course, they would both be there at dinner, and there was nothing she could do to prevent it. So too did the smell of sweat and leather and wool, and over it all wood smoke, the eternal scent of the great hall with its central harp. So did the smell of sweat and leather and wool, and over it all wood smoke, the eternal scent of the great hall with its central harp. Soon all the meals would be taken outside. For there simply would be no room in the great hall for the swarm of guests, but tonight there were few enough that supper was indoors. 
Gwen stood attentively at the Merlin's left hand, making sure that his cup was never empty, he never wanted for anything his eyes lighted upon. He was the least demanding person she had ever had Squire's duty for. He chose plain small beer, not mead, nor stronger ale, nor cider, and his drinking was moderate. He merely sipped, and throughout the meal she had occasion to refill his cup no more than twice. As for food, once served with his choice of a little rabbit, some greens, boiled turnip and bread, he ate slowly, and never indicated he wanted anything else. Every time he moved, that juniper scent wafted from his robes, his hair. It was as if he was always part of the forest somehow. He was strange, a distant thing, like a legend come to sit at the table. Maybe it was the power about him, more than Ellery had, more than any except the ladies at Cauldron Well. While he discussed matters of the High King with her father, his eyes were, for a very long time, on Ginnap. With the tables and benches set around the hearth fire, there was plenty of light for him to see whoever he chose to look at very clearly. Completely unaware of this regard, Ginnath exchanged clumsily flirtatious looks with some of the other squires, much to the open amusement of the king and queen. Seeing that the Merlin was watching the girl, the king leaned over to his guest and said in an undertone, "'She'll make me a fine alliance one day, there's no doubt.' "'Oh?' the Merlin smiled with his lips, but not his eyes which kept their sharp gaze on Ginnath. Her ambition rises no higher than that. The king chuckled. Ginnath, goddess bless her, is a maid meant for a man. Oh, she's a bit clumsy now, but wait a year or two when she learns. The young bucks will be prancing and pawing for her attention. And with that, the Merlin seemed to completely lose interest in Ginnath. He turned his full attention back to the king. With nothing to do, Gwen found herself watching her youngest sister out of the corner of her eye, and was glad to be in the shadows, for she blushed at little Gwen's behavior. The child was utterly shameless. She filched tasty bits off the plates of others, when she was sure they weren't looking, and slipped the telltale remains to the dogs under the table. And once she smuggled a cake with a bite taken out of it onto the plate of the little boy next to her, so that when his father looked for the treat and found it missing, the poor lad got a coughing and sent off to his bed, whimpering that he hadn't done anything and little Gwen watched him go with a smirk. Even when she was full, she continued to steal, hiding nuts and cakes in her pockets. When she tired of that, she began doing something under the table. What it was, Gwen could not tell, until a dogfight erupted there, and the poor hounds were sent off with kicks by the men. No one else seemed to notice her antics, though, except for the Merlin. Any time anyone cast a glance at her, she was all dimples and sideways glances, and got an indulgent smile in return. It was a relief when the Queen rose, signalling the men that it was time to pull the benches together for more serious drinking, while she and the women dealt with the clearing away. Or rather, the women did it under her direction. Little Gwen's smirks turned to scowls as she was set to doing tasks like anyone else under the sharp eye of her mother. As for Gwen and the other squires, their duty until dismissed was to keep the cups and horns of their appointed guests full, and with that to be done, she had no more time to watch her sisters. Shortly the women were gone, and the men were left to themselves. Again, 
the Merlin was abstemious, paying close attention now to all the men as well as the king. He said little, and when he did speak, he asked intelligent and pointed questions. Gwen was relatively certain that he was probing for weak points in the king's loyalty to the high king, and looking for signs of wavering or treachery. If that was true, he found none of it. Lloyd Ogavan Gower was a blunt man, not simple-minded, but open in his ways. His loyalty was first to his people, second to his personal allies, and third to the High King. It's a good thing to have a strong High King again, and a better to have one that knows his way about a battle, the King said, to the nods of satisfaction of those around him. Goddess bring blessings to him, for all that he's young, he knows when to fight, and when to talk, and when to send sly men to buy him time. And if he calls on you for your levies, the Merlin probed, it's a hard thing to have to travel across the width of the land to fight some other man's battles. Hard, aye, but they won't be some other man's battles, will they? the king responded. He's beaten off the Saxons once and the Northerners twice since he was made High King. If we'd had a proper High King when the Romans came, there'd have been no separate pieces, no tearing apart of tribe from tribe. We'd have fought the Carlin knaves on the beach, and there'd have been an end to it. Nay, three years he's been High King, and only once has he called for levies, when the cursed northern men came in force in those dragon ships of theirs. And what happened? We came, and we beat them, and they haven't come again. The men slapped their knees or pounded their feet on the floor in agreement. If he calls for levies, twill be because there's need. And as for other things, tis why he has you, Merlin. You're the Merlin. Whatever you tell him, you have to think of the whole land. That's your duty. I, men. The men pounded their feet again in approval, or responded with I, in varying tones of enthusiasm and satisfaction. So, what Arthur wants from us, by the gods Arthur will get, unstinting. With a nod, the king dismissed the entire question, and moved on to the subject of the tribes in the north, and whether or not they were likely to be a trouble this year. Gwen saw the Merlin's lips curl ever so slightly in a smile, and then he bent his formidable mind to just that question. Gwen let out a little sigh of relief. The talk turned to lighter subjects when that thorny problem had been dealt with as best it could be. "'You have a fine brood of daughters, my host,' the Merlin said, with a casualness that immediately set Gwen's senses to alert again. Four, My eldest has gone to the ladies, and a fine maiden for the circle she'll return to us. My second, you saw— a good girl, a sound girl. But my pride is at your left hand, my lord Merlin. The king cast a glance back at Gwen, with a warmth in it that made her stand taller, even as she blushed for the praise. The queen always held that she was strong in the blessing, and should be the one to go in Kataruna's place. But the goddess clearly had other plans. The blessing she may have, but it seems it was Epona's, and she was born for the path of iron. She takes two weapons as if she was born with a spear in her hand, and as for the horses, Epona herself surely must have smiled on her birth, the king laughed. Well, you'll see. Her horses are old veterans, 
and if she doesn't win, it won't be for lack of skill or heart, and she'll make a good accounting of herself. You have great faith in her, the Merlin said in a neutral tone. Oh, she has the heart of a Boudicca, but more good sense. If she can keep her head, as her model Braith does, she'll do well. The king seemed to realize that he was tempting fate with such praise, and coughed. Of course that's in the hands of the gods, but it's clear enough for all of that. Her place is in the ranks of the warriors, and her love is for horseflesh and the sword. And your fourth? The Merlin's eyes had taken on that hawk-like brightness again. Oh, Gwen Weavach, the king shrugged, a mere chit of a child, and given to childish ways and tempers, as unformed as an unlicked bear cub. Too soon to say what she'll be, and it may be we spoiled her a bit too much, but with the new sun coming, she'll get over that quick enough, or have it beaten out of her. My guess is, the way she queens it among the other children, she'll be another like Ginnat, a maid for a man, and make me another alliance, maybe to Arthur's son, eh? Now, my lord Merlin, on that head, what of the High King's coming son? What birth gift would be best to send? I've a mind to send him my best yearling foal, that boy and horse may grow up together. By the time Gwen was dismissed with the other squires, she was glad enough to crawl into bed with Ginnath and little Gwen. But little Gwen was still awake, and strangely, for once, she didn't torment her sister. Instead, she was as full of questions about the Merlin as any of the boys. "'What did he have you do all day?' little Gwen demanded. "'Run errands and messages, mostly.' Gwen replied wearily, "'Nothing exciting. I didn't see him work any magic, if that's what you want to know.' "'And what did he talk about with the men at the fire?' The child seemed crazed to know about the old man. "'Did he talk about what he's done? What about his magic? Did he tell how he did some of it? How he hid Arthur? How he made Arthur High King? How he helped win battles?' Mostly he asked questions. Gwen yawned. He wanted to know how father and the men felt about Arthur, I suppose. He didn't talk much about himself, or about Arthur, or the new queen, or anything, really. He asked about us, about mother, as you do for politeness. What did father say about me? came the sharp reply that you're too young for anyone to tell what you're going to make of yourself. But if you don't go to sleep, you'll look like a thrall that's been beaten, and no one will give you a thought. And with that, Gwen turned her back on her sister. She half expected a sharp elbow to her ribs, but none came. Instead, there was a pregnant silence, and in that silence, Gwen gratefully fell asleep. Chapter 8 The Merlin's own servant was tending to his master's needs, while any errand that needed running would be addressed by one of the king's personal servants. Gwen had leave from her duties for this race, and that was all she was thinking about. Not that there was much attending the honoured guest would need during the race. He was with the king, the queen, and both Ginath and the king's own squire. He wouldn't be able to lift a finger without someone asking him if he needed something. The king was sparing no effort to make his guest feel just how honoured they were to have him here. Gwen herself was far more concerned with another person among the guests. Braith was here, and Gwen was very anxious that her idol be satisfied with her protégé's progress. She didn't want Braith to think that her trust had been misplaced. So, in these moments before the race, now that she had gone over every bit of the harness and chariot five times over, she was standing between her two charges, as she had seen Braith do, breathing in their breath and letting them breathe in hers, scratching gently along their jawlines, whispering nonsense to them. 
They were old hands at this game, of course, and were far less nervous than she was. They were properly warmed up, and she could sense the readiness of their muscles under her hands when she slid her palms down along their chests. They eyed the other teams nearest them as if they were measuring their opponents, and then turned their attention back to her. The starter was an old scarred fighter from one of the guest contingents. He stopped chatting to a group on the sidelines and stepped up to the starting line. Drivers, he barked, take your places. With a final pat and a whispered word, Gwen left her horses and hopped up into her chariot, taking up the reins. The leather reins felt alive in her hands, as if the horses were speaking to her along them. She saw their haunches bunch as they prepared to leap forward on her command. Get ready, the old man shouted, and she flexed her knees and braced herself for the start. Go! The horses didn't wait for the reins to slap their backs. They were off as soon as they felt her lift them. Or maybe they had responded to the starting shout. No matter, they were off. The chariot lurched forward. Gwen bounced a little against the curved back of her vehicle, and habit took over as she regained her balance and crouched down even with the rumps of her horses. She glanced quickly to either side and saw that she was dead even with the chariots on either side of her. Further than that, she could not see, and she turned her attention back to the course. Beneath her feet, her chariot bounced and rattled. In front of her, the firm haunches of her horses rose and fell, their heads bobbing as they ran, their hooves flashing within a foot of her head. All around her was the thunder of hooves on the hard-packed earth, and the turf flew past in a blur just beyond her feet. Clods thrown off by the horse's hooves pelted the bottom of the chariot. And for a single moment there was nothing but sheer terror. Then, as always, everything settled into place. She didn't really have the words to describe it. Calm descended, and she felt as if the reins, the chariot, even the horses, were part of her. That she was wheel to wheel with the other chariots didn't matter. She knew that things were going to happen an instant before they actually did, just enough time to avoid trouble. And she didn't have to think about it. Her body reacted before her mind actually registered what was about to happen. Suddenly she knew that as they wheeled for the turn, the team on her right was going to veer towards her a little too far, and that the only two ways to avoid a collision were to pull back a little or try and get her team to shoot ahead. And she knew that as game as the team was, their strength was in endurance, not bursts of speed. They were too old for that sort of burst of speed. So she held them back. They fought her a moment, then yielded, and dropped behind the other chariot. The other team blundered into the space where her horses would have been. The driver shot her a look of alarm that blurred into relief, and then they had both made the turn and were on the return leg. Through the reins, her hands told the team, fast but steady. Through the reins, the team told her they would give what she asked for. She glanced to either side. The team that had almost collided with hers was ahead by more than a full length, but she recognized them with some satisfaction, for the driver was older than she by several years, and the team younger than hers, about two years into their prime. She was running second. In third, a length behind her, was another team driven by a boy with more experience and younger horses. His horses were laboring. Hers were good for much more than just the run to the finish. If this had been a battlefield and not a race, he would be no good after this run. She could hear the cheers, so could her horses. Their ears pricked forward. Steady, her hands told them. We are, they told her back. They stretched out their necks, though, determined to make the leader win his prize. And then they were across and she was pulling them up as the spectators swarmed the winner. But as she jumped out of the chariot and went to the horses' heads to take their halters and begin walking them to cool them, 
a smaller group was heading for her in a more leisurely fashion. Braith, Braith's lord, her father, and three of the warriors that were her teachers. I told you not to bet against her. Braith was admonishing her lord, as that worthy handed over to the king a fine silver bracelet. And you said she wouldn't even place with horses that old and young as she is. The king crowed. He pulled Gwen into a hard embrace, laughing. Well done, daughter. Second place, and your team still ready for another charge. First place isn't everything. Not when you bring your team to the finish line, heaving and winded, King," said Braith, a broad grin on her brown face. "Someone had better teach that boy in third that he's training for battles, not for sprints." Gwen said nothing, but she felt as if she was glowing. She'd done it. She'd made Braith and her father proud. "What are the prizes, my Lord King?" someone called from the crowd around the winner. For first place, a silver brooch. The king called back. For third, a fine fat duck and a flagon of wine from the king's table. And for second, he looked down at Gwen, his eyes twinkling. For second, a ton of ale and the boar meant for the king's table. Then let my prize be served among all the drivers. She called out, her high voice ringing clearly out before the cheering could start again. For surely all have earned a share. Any grumbling that might have started among the others that the king's daughter had surely had some secret aid was erased in that moment as the cheering started all over again. Gwen looked up again at her father and saw him mouth the words, "Well done." Before he turned back to his guests to escort them to dinner, but better even than the accolade from her father was the one from Braith, who winked and mouthed the same. The tables and benches had been set up outside, around the three hearths where all the cooking had been done. There were so many guests at a midsummer gathering that the great hall would have been stifling hot in the first place. And you'd scarcely be able to cram them all in there in the second. There was great rejoicing at the table set aside for the squires who had driven in the race as they squabbled good-naturedly over the best parts of the boar, stuffing themselves with both hands, their faces shiny with the rich fat. Gwen, however, was just as happy back at her place behind the Merlin, serving him. For one thing, she already had the acclaim of the two who mattered to her. For another, her gesture and her insistence on returning to duty had favorably impressed her father's guests, the Merlin included. The old man gazed on her for a very long moment as she took her place, and it wasn't the sort of look he gave Ginnat, but the sort of measuring he was bestowing on her father's chiefs. It was a look that said. I underestimated you, and you are worth keeping an eye on. And anyway, although she liked a slice of good boar as much as the next person, she had overheard her mother telling the chief cook to set aside a quarter of a goose and keep it warm for our brave Gwen, so she wasn't losing by her generosity. Once the feast was well under way, however, the Merlin was his usual abstemious self. But this time he paid special attention to Gwen Weavach. She was up to her usual tricks, utterly unaware that she was being studied. First me, then Ginnath, now little Gwen. She wondered what he was thinking. Then it dawned on her: the High King was about to be the father of an heir. Such a boy was going to need a wife, and as soon as possible. An alliance with her father would give Arthur a near neighbor to the troublesome Orkney crew, and hadn't her father suggested it himself? Cateruna had gone to the ladies, and once she came back, the king would not want to give up one with both the gift and the training. Ginnath was perhaps a little too old. Oh, you could betroth babies in the cradle, but usually they were closer in age than this. And when the boy was old enough to sire a child, 
Ginath would be twice his age. Besides, if Eleri did not, after all, have a boy, then the king would want to pick a good husband for Ginath in order to have a male to pass the crown to. Gwen herself? Possible, but probably still too old. And as long as she was a warrior, she would not only be valuable to her father for those skills, but would be much in the company of the men, and without the pressure of being first or second born, she might make a match of her own. Or not. Braith never had. But little Gwen now, that was different. She was young enough to be reasonably close in age to the High King's son. She was pretty, and would likely grow to be even prettier, and she had immense charm. She'd make a good candidate for such an alliance. The king himself had said that there was no telling what she would grow into, so out of his own mouth the Merlin had it that she was not yet seen as a valuable asset. And she was fourth-born. Her father would have every reason to welcome such a betrothal. So now the Merlin might well be watching her to see if she was trainable. If she was betrothed to the High King's heir, they'd want her sent to them. They'd want to be sure she was raised their way, with schooling in what they thought needful. And wouldn't that be interesting? Gwen schooled her more malicious thoughts. With the Merlin there, little Gwen wouldn't be able to use her glamoury, if indeed she had one, to charm people into doing what she wanted. She'd actually have to learn how to behave. Probably how to work, too. The life of a queen was not all fine clothes and goose every day. The queen had charge over the household, and in the king's absence could be expected even to command the warriors. It would probably be the best thing that could happen to her. And Ginath and I would have the bed all to ourselves, she couldn't help but think wistfully. And then she sighed. The way that little Gwen was carrying on, the Merlin would probably think she was far too much trouble, even for such a good alliance as with her father, especially since her father was already clearly loyal. She lifted the hair from the back of her neck for a moment to let a breeze cool it. She was very glad they weren't stuck in the great hall. It was much more pleasant, eating outside, but the king, though he would have scoffed at such a notion, followed the Roman custom of having the family and retainers dining in the great hall most times. Sometimes Gwen wondered why, especially on an afternoon like this. It was easier to clean up after everyone was done eating. The sound of talking didn't get bounced about by hard stone walls so that you had to concentrate even to hear a near neighbor, and it didn't smell. As fastidious as Queen Ellery was, there was only so much you could do in a room where cats and dogs did as they willed. Rats and mice came out at night, and people dropped food and spilled drink on the floor. Maybe it was only because in the great hall the smoke rose straight up to the roof, and there was no bad side for the tables, where wind sent the smoke into your eyes. The people on that side of the hearth fires were looking uncomfortable. Gwen checked on her charge again. The Merlin was still watching little Gwen. Oh, it would be so good if he picked her, Gwen thought fervently. Finally, when the last of the food was gone, and the men had settled down to serious drinking and talking, the Merlin's manservant came and tapped Gwen on the shoulder, and indicated with a jerk of his thumb that she should go eat. She went straight to the head cook, who had indeed saved her a good meal, and, wonder of wonders, had carefully put the goose in a clay pot, and left it basting in its own juice by the fire, so that it didn't congeal in its own fat. Gwen enjoyed every bite, but felt the need to hurry back, lest she be thought laggard. By now the sun had almost set, and the embers of the fire matched the colour of the western sky. She took the jar of beer from the Merlin's manservant, and quietly replaced him without a fuss. The conversation was about children. 
the children of the chiefs, as well as the king, betrothals that might be made, daughters gone to the ladies, second or third sons that might be sent for harder training away from the family. No man would send his heir away, of course, but it was thought that other boys would benefit from being away from the shadow of the eldest and the protection of the family. And, of course, they might catch the eye of a daughter, and there would be an alliance marriage out of it. The Merlin cleared his throat. I have some interest in your youngest, he said with great care. I would like to speak with her at some length over the next day or two. Little Gwen, the king's voice betrayed a touch of confusion. Why, little Gwen, the conversation of such a child is not like to be entertaining. I believe I may have detected another sort of blessing on her than the one the ladies look for, the Merlin replied. Such a thing is elusive, as difficult to follow as a minnow among the reeds, but it is the sort of thing that is useful to the druids. It may be that, as the ladies have called your Kataruna, the druids, although we do not usually call females, might be able to train your youngest. We have on occasion great need for maidens. Pure maidens, with special kinds of power to them. Aha! Comprehension dawned on the king. Virgin foretold us, as the good goddess Arianhrod was to Math Map Mathonwe, Clu's liege lord. Has our high king the need of such, think you? He might, or I might, if the magic calls for it. There are other druidic callings for pure maidens, though these rites be more secret than those of the ladies. The Merlin smiled. I can assure you that if she is indeed endowed with such a blessing, she and you will be greatly honoured for it, protected and guarded, rather better than Arianhrod was. And if she is not, well, no harm will come of a little talk with an old man, hmm? Besides, your trusted Gwenweva will be there. He chuckled deeply. I assure you, my Lord King, I am not such that finds great interest in little girls, except as they may grow to power, or further the needs of the High King. Oh, I had no suspicion of that. The King's ears had turned a little red. And who am I to deny the Druids what they may need, especially as it may be in the interest of the High King? I shall tell the nursemaid that you are to have custody of the little wench for as long as you require, or, he amended with a chuckle, for as long as you can stand her prattle. When the manservant again took Gwen's place, and she picked her way through the snoring bodies bedded down among the rushes in the great hall to the bedchamber, she discovered that once again little Gwen was wide awake. She heard the child sit straight up in bed as she lifted the door curtain. As warm as it was, the bed curtains had been taken down altogether and put away for winter. Ginath is asleep and said she would beat me with a slipper if I woke her, little Gwen hissed urgently. What did they say around the fire? What did the Merlin say? Did he talk about magic? Actually, he talked about you. Gwen figured that would shut the little nuisance up, and it did. He wants to talk to you. He thinks you might have some kind of magic that the druids can use, and if they can, when you're old enough, they'll want you to come to them like Kataruna went to the ladies. I knew it! Little Gwen squeaked with excitement and gloating. Ginath rolled over and swatted at her then rolled back without saying a word. Little Gwen squeaked again, this time with indignation. Well, magic or no magic, you had better be on your best behaviour, because I am to be there too, Gwen whispered crossly. You may be sure that father will ask me about this, and if you act badly, I will tell him. I won't, 
little Gwen began indignantly, Gwen cut her off. And if you act like a pig-keeper's brat, or try to lord it over me, the Merlin will take it ill. He holds good manners high, does the Merlin. He treats me like a full warrior, so you had best do the same. Gwen pulled off her sandals and tunic, and crawled into the bed. And you had better let me get some sleep, too, or I'll let the Merlin know that you are the reason his squire is clumsy in the morning. That threat was enough to still the questions and the gloating in the child's throat. She laid herself back down, and Gwen curled herself into a ball. Could little Gwen have a magic that would be useful to someone besides herself? That Glamory, for instance. Well, it might be useful enough if she tamed it and used it wisely. She could lead other children around easily enough. The High King might find it useful if a maid in his court could do the same with adult men. If little Ferret could be tamed. Thinking that, Gwen fell asleep. She was up before dawn again, and attending to the Merlin's wants before the old man was even awake. Now well acquainted with his habits, she brought fruit and bread and clear spring water, instead of the small beer and meat that the king's other guests would expect. She didn't actually expect little Gwen to turn up until the sun was high, but to her shock, as soon as the Merlin had broken his fast, she and Bronwyn turned up to wait on the Merlin's pleasure. Gwen's eyes nearly jumped out of her head with shock. Little Gwen had never been up this early on her own, ever. After Bronwyn had been dismissed, the Merlin also sent away his manservant, and sat little Gwen down on a stool at his feet. Then he looked at Gwen. And once again she found herself held prisoner by his eyes. It happened even faster this time, and when the Merlin told her that she would hear and see nothing that went on, she nodded vaguely, though her mind battered itself against the fetters he placed around it like a wild thing in a trap. Then he turned to little Gwen, and try as she might, Gwen could only make out scraps of what passed between them. Some things did manage to penetrate the fog that the Merlin had put around Gwen's thoughts. The Merlin asked about the coming heir, and little Gwen replied with such venom, such hatred, that even Gwen was a bit shocked. And then— Then the Merlin turned back to her and looked deeply into her eyes. "'You fight me, girl,' he said with a little admiration and some regret. "'But this is not for the honest ears of one such as you. Sleep and remember nothing.' And that was all she knew. She came to herself with a start. I must have been more tired than I thought. With a touch of alarm, she looked covertly about the tent, but the Merlin did not seem to have noticed her lapse. He was giving little Gwen a small carved box, and smiling with satisfaction. So use that as I told you, and your future will be clear, he said. But the Druids will call for me— Little Gwen pleaded, with something like urgency in her tone. "'I pledge you that someone will. You have power, you will have more, and teachers seek such students out.' He passed a hand over his eyes, as if he was suddenly weary, then looked up at Gwen. "'Escort your sister back to her nurse, then tell your father that this child is indeed blessed with power.' but that the time is not right for her to leave her family. I, my lord, Gwen replied, feeling disappointed that little Gwen was not going to be taken off far, far away, at least not for some time. Little Gwen looked even more disappointed, but she allowed herself to be led off, clutching her little box. What is that? Gwen asked as soon as they had left the tent. Something secret, her sister said, a sly look coming over her. I'm not to tell. Gwen shrugged. Then I won't ask any more. 
Her sister looked disappointed at that response. Half of the value she placed in a secret was that she could torment her older siblings with it. But she didn't have any time to come up with a new tactic, for Bronwyn was waiting for them at the edge of the encampment, and looked with curiosity at the box. "'Tis a secret thing between her and the Merlin,' Gwen said shortly, "'so let her do what he wishes her to do with it.' Bronwyn nodded, and took little Gwen in charge, while Gwen went off to find her father and fulfill the second half of her duty. Her father seemed a little disappointed as well, but said only, "'At least we know she has a blessing. But it must not be something the High King needs. Ah, well,' he waved Gwen off, "'we'll let her age like mead. Mayhap she'll turn out as sweet with the help of whatever it is the Merlin gave her.' Privately, Gwen rather doubted any such miracle could occur, but this was a case when the squire served best by keeping her lips sealed. "'I, my lord king,' she said carefully, bowed, and went back to her duty. Chapter 9 The guests were all gone, the Merlin with them, without his making a display of any kind of magic, much to the bitter disappointment of most of the young squires. This time Gwen had not had the slightest wish to spy on the midsummer rites. She spent that evening, as usual, on attendance on the Merlin, and when he retired to join the rites, she sat quietly with the other squires on her best behaviour. They were all rewarded by a share of mead each, which warmed her belly and made her sleepy. When the Merlin and the women returned, she was surprised, for she had not thought that much time had passed. She was glad when he dismissed her, and she was happy enough to go to bed, even while the young women and men were still leaping the fire, dancing, or making sheep's eyes at each other. Of course, not all of them were confining themselves to that, for it was midsummer after all, but they were out in the hayfields or the meadows, or little bowers under the bushes, and not tumbling and panting in the great hall. So she didn't even think of them, but of the soft mattress, and how good it would be to get there. The truth of the matter was, that between serving the Merlin, and seeing that her horses were tended perfectly, her gear in good order, and the gear of the older warriors attended to, she fell into the bed and slept like a stone every night, and simply didn't have the will to sneak out for a clandestine look. Besides, her curiosity the last time had resulted in a vision that, while exciting, was also somewhat frightening. She'd spied upon the gods that night, and she rather hoped that she was below their attention. At least until she was old enough to start earning some glory in battle— Little Gwen had finally found something to occupy her, besides tormenting her sisters, and for that Gwen was so profoundly grateful to the Merlin that she would have run twice the number of errands he asked of her. Whatever it was that he had told the child and given her kept her captive and quiet in her own thoughts. And meanwhile, now that he was sure of her, the Merlin sent his assigned squire out into the fields and woods to acquire any number of herbs and bits. Mushrooms, both poisonous and tasty, baskets of bark, roots, leaves, owl pellets, bones and teeth, there seemed no end to the odd things he wanted her to find. It wasn't capricious, either. Part of the reason he was sending her for these things was that he was graciously sharing his law of curative things and homely spells with the Queen and her women, showing them how he compounded remedies for all manner of injuries, curses, and diseases. The women loved him for this, but of course this was not the conjuring of dragons or the summoning of demons that the squires hoped to see, so it was all terribly boring to them. In this Gwen didn't agree. Some of the things that the Merlin could cure were downright miraculous. But at last everyone was gone, 
and Gwen was back to duties that seemed light in comparison with the double burden she had carried while the guests were about. Now she knew why the squires had always looked so harried and haggard during festivals, and had never had time for games or gambling. In a time of feasting and leisure, they got none of the latter, and the leftover ends of the former. It was about a week after the last guest had left, but a travelling bard arrived, having spent midsummer at the festival King Lot of Orkney held. Like all bards, he was as full of news as he was of music, and the women swarmed him to hear his largest burden, that Anna Morgors had been brought to bed of yet another son, her fifth. Four more she had, too old of an Arthur, Gwalchmai, Gwalchaved, Gwynvor, and a heroine. Gwalchmai and Gwalchaved were said to be as alike as she and little Gwen, and the younger served the elder as a squire. She only hoped Gwalchmai's younger brother had a better temper than her younger sister. Thin, small, and sickly looking this one is, the bard said, with a little smirk that made Gwen frown. This man was angling for rewards from Queen Ellery, she thought, but she kept her head down over her task and held her peace. She was not allowed to completely escape the training of a maiden amid all the work of a squire. She still had to mend, if not make her own clothing. The king counted on his fingers and chuckled. So old Lot made sure of his wife by quickening her before he took her to Arthur's wedding. Very wise of him. Well, if a man knows he's like to wear the horns, said one of the men with a leer, that's the best way of knowing he won't be raising another man's brat. Ribald laughter spread around the benches. Animal Gores had a reputation that was none too savoury. It was said she had even bedded a Northman once, and it was whispered that she did not confine her couplings to humans. And here, far from the reach of her magic, it was safe enough to gossip about it. I've half suspected old Lot of being her panda at times, said another with a snort, and she is. Queen Ellery was shaking her head as she cradled her belly with one hand. Four living sons, and what does she need with a fifth? she wondered aloud. Well, what's the poor wee thing's name? No matter what kind of mother he has, I'll ask the lady's blessing on him that he shall thrive. It is hardly his fault what he was born to, and he is the High King's nephew, as she is the High King's half-sister. Medrot, gracious queen, the bard said with a bow. She calls him Medrot. Her little sister Morgana is much enamoured of him. Little and sickly, and with the Orkney lot, he'll need Morgana to look after him, old Bronwyn predicted sadly. If they don't bully him a purpose, they'll still worry him like a lot of unwhipped pups with a rag they tug between each other. Little and sickly, perhaps Anna Morgors will tend to him as she did not her healthy boys. We will hope. Ellery raised her chin, signalling that the subject was concluded. Did the Merlin come to visit them, as he did us? The bard shook his head and went on to other things. Gwen had felt an odd and uneasy interest in the subject of this unknown boy-child, but maybe that was only because her mother had taken on an odd expression when she spoke of him. After more gossip concerning Lot, his wife, and their followers, Ellery asked the bard to give them some music, preferably a war-song, for there were rumours the northerners were moving again. Old Bronwyn made a face of disappointment at this. She took a particular delight in the bad behaviour of Anna Morgors, to the point where Gwen found herself wondering what the Queen of the Orkneys could ever have done to Bronwyn to make her so sour against her. Little Gwen had been surprisingly good, although she looked as disappointed as Bronwyn when the Queen changed the subject away from the Orkney clan. Gwen was relieved. 
Perhaps all the attention she had gotten from the Merlin had done her good. She certainly had been on excellent behaviour this evening, fetching the Queen anything she asked for, and not even trying her coy little tricks on the bard. It was rather too bad in a way that Aleri had changed the subject. The bard was not very good, and Gwen found her interest straying away from the war song that was less song and more toneless chanting, mostly in praise of a nebulous leader who, she supposed, was intended to resemble her father. That was often the way with these bards, trying to flatter their hosts in hopes of a rich present rather than earning the rich present by honestly performing to the best of their ability. Sadly, her father didn't seem to see the ploy for what it was. He nodded to the monotonous strumming, and looked as if he was going to interject an approving grunt on the chorus, when suddenly Aleri clutched her swollen belly and screamed out in pain. It was not just a cry. This was a sound that Gwen had never heard from her mother, and from the look of it neither had any of the other women, not even Bronwyn, who had been with her through all the births of her children. The look of startled alarm on Bronwyn's face made a stab of fear go right through Gwen. Swiftly, Hilary's women surrounded her and half carried her into the royal chamber as the king tried to make light of the situation. You see, Bard, your song has roused my son, and now he wants to come forth and do battle. He stripped off a bracelet, only bronze, to the Bard's swiftly covered disappointment, and tossed it to the man, looking distractedly at the entrance to the chambers, now covered by the curtain. Let us drink to him, and to the safe delivery of the Queen, and let us take our drinking outside, so that we do not disturb the women at their work. The rest of the men were nothing loath to do so, taking up their cups and moving with unseemly haste to the fire outside, and Gwen had to go with them in her capacity as a page. And, of course, even though they were all outside and the cries were muffled, when the screaming began everyone knew that something was going horribly wrong. It was bad enough that this was far too early for the baby to be coming. Two weeks more, better still, a month, not now. But the awful sounds that Aleri was making, she didn't sound human any more, she sounded like an animal in pain. The men all raised their voices and gabbled about nothing at all to try and cover it, but the king was pale and sweating, and Gwen wanted nothing more than to run away, far away, and curl up in a ball with her hands over her ears. It was worse when the terrible screaming stopped, and a cold silence took its place. They came to get her, two of Eleri's women, sobbing. Gwen didn't want to go with them, but they took her hands and pulled her along into the room that smelled of stale sweat and blood and something else, something sweetly sickening. Poison, she would have said if they had asked, but no one actually asked her anything. Ginath was already there, sobbing as she wrapped something small in long bands of white cloth. They made her go to the side of the bed, but the thing in the bed with the twisted, agonized face was not her mother, could not have been her mother. Eleri had never looked like that. But, like Ginath, she cried as she did what she was told to do. Eleri's women all did most of the work, washing, dressing, and laying out the body, trying to smooth that tortured face, carrying her and the rapt infant that had never breathed to the bier in the great hall. Gwen and Ginath gathered flowers, herbs, boughs of sacred oak and ash to make the beer. Once, Pedda stopped her as she was gathering meadow sweet, and made her look up into his face. You are a warrior, he said. You must grow used to death. That only made her burst into tears again, and he awkwardly patted her head. You must, he said. Then after a moment his own voice choked. But you never do. 
After that, Pedder kept her with him, except when she was fetched by one of the women. He gave her hard things to do, things that forced her to concentrate, like splitting a wand with an arrow or braiding a horsehair halter in an intricate pattern for a foal. Then he would give her things that exhausted her body, like carrying water and chopping wood. For the most part, though, she seemed to exist in a haze of disbelief, interrupted by the same anguish that caused Ginath and Bronwyn and some of the other women to kneel beside the bier and howl. That was not for her, though. She couldn't let herself do that. But it made her feel torn into a thousand pieces to see her father sitting there beside the bier, eyes dull, hands dangling, face almost grey. It seemed a hundred years. It seemed no time at all. It seemed as if she had thrown herself down, exhausted with weeping and work, and woke to find herself at the side of a barrow. The king's barrow, of course. She knew it. She visited it dutifully, and left offerings of fruit and flowers, and thought no more about it. Now there was a hole in the earth beside it, and at the bottom of the hole was Eleri. She had been draped with a linen cloth so fine that her features could be seen through it, and in her arms was the son she had died trying to give the king. Gwen stared down at her, numb. There was no lady here now, and they could not wait for one, so Bronwyn said the words for the women, and the bard, who had stayed, shaken, but there was some bravery in him to have stayed, said the words for the men. Gwen wanted to run away, as they all began, handful by handful, to throw dirt and flowers into the grave. She wanted to scream, to throw herself down there and beg her mother to return, to do anything but what she was doing. Tossing in the meadow sweet and Angelica she had picked, watching Ginath crumple to the ground, seeing her father look as if he was going to collapse at any moment. All her anguish centred at last on that tiny bundle in Eleri's arms. The cause of all this grief, the brother she had been intended to serve. She didn't hate him. How could she? She had loved him for months. It wasn't his fault this had happened. But with a stab of grief so deep it felt as if her heart had been ripped from her body, she swore a silent vow to Epona. I will never, never, never have a baby just to please a man. Even when they were putting Eleri in the ground, Gwen couldn't believe she was dead. And now that the wake was long past, and there were even little pinpricks of green poking through the brown earth mounded over the queen's grave, Gwen still couldn't make herself believe it. She felt numb, and her thoughts muffled by a thick fog of grief and disbelief. She kept thinking this was all some sort of nightmare, and she would wake up, and everything would be normal again. But she didn't, and it wasn't. Nothing would ever be normal and right again. The rest of the family was no help. Ginath was utterly inconsolable. She and Bronwyn spent most of their time collapsed in each other's arms. The king looked shrunken and old. He'd aged a dozen years in a night, it seemed. He still went through his day, doing all the things that a king had to do, but there was neither life nor light in what he did. He was a king, and he acted as a king, because it was his duty to be a king, although the man in the king wanted only to mourn. Little Gwen was mute as a stone. Her face had a closed look about it, and she hadn't shed a single tear. She just went about doing what people told her to do, without saying three words in the entire day, like a little ghost girl. The night it had happened, Gwen had stumbled over the box that the Merlin had given her little sister, open, cast aside, and empty. 
Gwen had numbly picked it up and put it on little Gwen's chest. When she looked again, it was gone. For the first time ever, she felt sorry for Gwen Weevach. Whatever charm the Merlin had given her, little Gwen must have tried to use to bring their mother back, and it had failed. Not even the strongest magic could bring back the dead, of course, but little Gwen wouldn't have believed that until she tried it for herself. Probably her faith in the Merlin and his promise had been discarded in the moment like the box. Gwen herself spoke only when she was spoken to, and spent as much time as she could in the company of Dai and Adara, weeping into their manes. Nor was the king, were they his daughters, allowed to grieve in relative peace. No. First the lords and the chieftains, then the messengers had descended, and now here were come the Queen of the Orkneys and her brood, supposedly to tender condolences and help, but something in Gwen roused angrily at the look in Anna Morgors's eyes. There was a satisfaction there, a kind of gloating that was ugly. She came with an entourage, but without King Lot or any of her older boys. Gwen had to admit the only word for her was enchanting. Her lush figure would have been the pride of a much younger woman. Her raven hair must have stretched out on the ground when it was unbraided, for the single plait that stretched down her back brushed her heels, and it was as thick as a strong man's wrist. Her little face reminded Gwen of a fox. Her clothing would have aroused immediate envy in every woman there, if they had not all been so wrapped in grief. When she was handed from her cart, as she first arrived to be greeted by the king, she looked as if she had just stepped out of her own chamber, and not that she had undertaken a journey of a fortnight, and every man's gaze was riveted on her. Ellery had always looked far, far younger than she was. Anna Morgors looked ageless. She had brought with her a wet nurse and Medrot, her new son, and Gwen hated him at first sight. He was long, thin, and pale, with a strange head of thick black hair, and he didn't act like a baby should. He never uttered a sound, not even when he was hungry, and he stared at people out of round black eyes like shiny pebbles, not the blue eyes of most babies. She hated having his eyes follow her. She hated that he looked like a changeling, and she hated most of all that this thing was alive when her own brother and her mother were both dead. Vaguely she felt that this was wrong. She was seven years older than this infant. She shouldn't feel so threatened by a baby. But she did. With the queen had come her younger sister Morgana, Gwen hated her, too. She was poised and controlled, and although she did not have the level of enchantment Anna Morgors had, she still made the young men's eyes follow her. Her hair was the same raven black, but her face was more cat-like than fox-like, and her green eyes glittered with secrets. When they were presented to the king, Anna Morgors said all the right things, but Gwen heard what was under the words. Silken, soft murmurs of condolence covered piercing blue eyes that looked everywhere for signs of weakness, and when she presented Morgana, there was more calculation. Gwen was proud of her father, though. He might be bleeding inside, but he gave no sign. Instead, he was gracious, hospitable, and offered his and his daughter's own bedchamber to the visitors. "'I would not like it that you should take your rest in a rude pavilion,' the king said. "'My chamber for you, your son and his nurse, and Morgana can sleep in the chamber beyond.' "'You are most gracious, my lord. Morgana can share it with your daughters,' Anna Morgors replied smoothly. Gwen immediately decided that it was time she began sleeping with the squires. Or out of doors, anything other than sleeping next to the cat, 
and waiting to see if she scratched you in the night. She made the best excuse she could think of, that she came to bed early, smelling of horse, and arose before dawn, and would not for the world think of inflicting her coarse and boyish ways on a lady like Morgana. Her excuse seemed to pass muster with the guests, for they exchanged an amused look, but said nothing at all when she took a rug and a blanket and went to sleep elsewhere. For the first two days Gwen did her best not to leave her father's side, and it was the purest of good fortune that it was her turn to act as his squire and page. She had an idea that Anna Morgors had brought her sister with the idea of getting her wedded to the king. She remembered what had been told her, of how Eleri had armoured him against enchantments, and from almost the moment she set eyes on the pair, she was horribly afraid of what might happen. And Morgana, as the queen, lording it over Ginnath and her, the thought made her sick. It appeared, however, that the same thought had occurred to some of the other women, and was just as revolting to them as it was to Gwen. After the first night, Bronwyn, under the excuse, inspired no doubt by Gwen, of keeping Morgana from being disturbed when Ginnath arose for her morning work, took Ginnath to sleep with her among Eleri's women. By the third night, when Gwen was lying wakeful, Restless under the double burdens of a bright full moon and a heart full of anxiety and mourning, she heard the sounds of several people slipping away from the castle. She left her rug and blanket, pulled on her shoes, and followed the shadowy figures as far as the stones. And that was when she was seized from behind by a pair of strong hands. A third hand was clapped over her mouth, smothering her yelp. Go back to sleep, Gwen, Bronwyn hissed in her ear. We are armoring the king against the enchantments of that trollop and her sister. This is a woman's war, and not magic for you. Keep yourself and your power as Epona would have you. In the moonlight, one of the figures huddled about the altar stone turned her face towards Gwen. It was Ginath, and it seemed to Gwen but it was more than the moonlight that made her seem pale. The other woman let Gwen go, as Bronwyn took her hand away, and with a shiver Gwen crept back to her rug and a restless sort of sleep. Whatever they did, it left Ginnath listless and dull the next day, but it seemed to have worked. The king was courteous but distant, and Anna Morgors's eyes held an annoyance and bafflement that heartened Gwen. Then it was Anna Morgors's turn to make some sort of trial. Now, in all this time, both the Queen and her sister had made a great pet out of little Gwen, begging the King to release her from her ordinary work to play page for them, complimenting her, even praising her charming manners at meals. Gwen truly thought that they would use little Gwen as their next means to get at the King, pointing out that she needed a mother, and how much she and Morgana doted on each other. That was a fearful thought, for Gwen couldn't see how Bronwyn and the others could armour her father against that. But instead, Gwen woke with a start on the first night of the waning moon. At first she couldn't think what would have woken her, especially not feeling as if there was a terrible storm about to break. The sky was utterly cloudless, there was no hint of disturbance, and yet the longer she lay there, staring at nothing at all, the more certain she became that there was a disaster building, some horrific deed about to happen. She had made her bed, as usual, near the wall of the castle, and without thinking much about it, not far from the window of the solar, where the king and queen had slept but it was when she heard whisperings that sent chills up her back coming from that slit of a window, she knew that must have been what awakened her. It sounded like two women whispering to each other, the queen and her sister, surely. Those whispers were not right, not clean. She couldn't make out the words at all, 
but the very tone made her feel ill. And when she heard the scream of a rabbit from inside that room, her blood froze in her veins. The whole castle seemed frozen, plunged into an unhealthy sleep, and there were no normal night sounds at all. No insects, no owls, not even a bat overhead. There were night noises in the far, far distance, but nothing near. The whispering grew more urgent, and there were definitely two voices in it. Then one made a wordless cry of triumph, which was mingled by the squall of a cat, swiftly cut off in a gurgle. And suddenly Gwen found she could move. She snatched up her blanket and rug and ran, without thinking, blindly and in pure panic. She didn't know where she was going, and she didn't even know how she got there, when she came to herself again in Di's stall, with the stallion sleepily waffling her hair. She cast her rug and blanket down and huddled in them, still shaking with fear, and remained there until morning. At some point she must have fallen asleep, for after a timeless age of mindless terror she found herself awakened by the sound of ordinary voices. She was roused by the other squires coming to feed their charges. No one commented on her sleeping in Di's stall, but it was not unusual for squires to do so, if a horse was restless or acting a little off. So she shook the straw out of her clothing, attended to Adara and Di, and then shuffled back to the castle, still feeling horribly ill. Bronwyn immediately intercepted her at the door. To her shock, Bronwyn looked just as ill as she felt, but there was an air of triumph about her. "'Drink this!' the old woman commanded, shoving a beaker at her. It was something pungently herbal, and very nasty, but it immediately made her feel better. When she gave the beaker back to Bronwyn, the old woman grasped her chin and made her look up into her eyes. "'Aye, you felt it,' she declared grimly. "'There was dark magic last night, and this morn. There's a black cock missing from the hen-roost, a black rabbit from the hutch, and a black kitten from the stable. But look yon. She jerked her chin at the high table, where Gwen saw with astonishment that Anna Morgors and Morgana were picking at breakfast. Astonishment because they looked common. There was nothing of the enchanting queen and her bewitching sister about them this morning. The queen of the Orkneys was wan, her cheeks sallow and waxen, her hair and eyes dull. Morgana was plain, and could hardly even manage to nibble at a bit of bread and honey. It was them, for naught else would have rebounded on our protections on the king. What they did came back on them, Bronwyn said with angry triumph. Let this be a lesson in magic to you. What you try can be cast back on you, and you'll suffer for it if it does. Gwen nodded and rubbed her head. It still ached a bit, but it looked as if the Orkney pair had heads that ached much worse. I have told your masters that you're ill, and got you leave to sleep what I gave you off, Bronwyn continued, and gave her a little push towards the huddle on the women's side of the hall, where she could see Ginath's blonde hair among the sleeping women, several others at rough count. Why, Gwen began, she meant to ask, why did you know I would be ill? But she never got that far. I reckoned, given all in all, you'd be sick too. Bronwyn did not explain herself, and after another moment Gwen felt a heavy lassitude creep over her that smothered all curiosity. She stumbled towards a pallet, pulled a corner of blanket over her head, and slept till nightfall. And when she woke, she learned that the queen and her sister had taken to their beds to be nursed, struck down by the mysterious illness that seemed to have struck so many of the women. The men did not ask about it, but then that was hardly surprising. "'We will be grieved to see you go, my lady,' 
the king said politely, but in tones of indifference that brought that flash of annoyance into Anna Morgorz's eyes before she swiftly covered it. She and Morgana were long back to their enchanting selves, and whatever safer ploys they had tried to bewitch the king had also failed, so much that he was not even sorry to hear that they intended to be gone. "'And I shall be grieved to part from you,' she replied with false sorrow. "'Your company and that of your family is so wonderful to me. I wish that I could take some part of you with me when I return to my home. My home is so lonely and remote, my husband so often gone, and my boys are boys, and of little companionship to a poor woman and her sister.' She sighed theatrically, then snapped her fingers. "'But I have it. I can help you and ease my own loneliness at the same time, my lord.' The king looked at her as if she was mad. "'Of course, my lady, but—' She bestowed a dazzling smile on him, as little Gwen looked up with a sharp and avid alertness that made Gwen wary. Whatever was going on— when Weebach was in it up to her chin. "'Oh, king, let me take your youngest to foster with me. A child that young needs a mother, and I so long for a pretty little daughter.' The emphasis she put on the word pretty made little Gwen preen and Ginath blush and frown. "'Only think, coming to live with us, the child will grow up with my boys, and there are five of them. Surely one of them will come to like her, and from liking cleave to her, and then we shall have an alliance of blood as well as borders. And even if that great good does not come to pass, I can teach her as her mother would have, in the maidenly, womanly things she must learn to be a king's daughter." She will not run wild with me, as she might if she is left to grow without a woman's hand to guide her. What say you? Now there was subtle insult in that, for Gwen, for Bronwyn, for Ginath. But it wasn't something that a man would note, and it was nothing they could take exception to, though Gwen felt her cheeks growing hot, and Bronwyn looked like thunder. The king looked bewildered, and little Gwen took advantage of his hesitation. She flung herself down on her knees beside him and clasped her hands around his wrist. "'Please, father, please!' This was all leaving Gwen speechless with astonishment, and it seemed the king was just as surprised and unable to think, for the first thing from his mouth were the words, "'Well, I suppose.' Little Gwen flung herself on his neck. "'Oh, thank you, father!' she squealed. And at that point, of course, there was nothing to do but agree. Chapter 10 It had been two full moons since Queen Aleri died, and one since little Gwen had gone off to foster with Queen Morgor's, in some ways, nothing had changed. The farmers still toiled in the fields, the herds still needed tending, or the work of the kingdom went on as it had, no matter who the king and queen were. Gwen continued to toil at her lessons and chores. The cutting of wood and hauling of water to build strength, practice with bow and wooden sword and blunted spear, with staff and bare hands to make her a warrior, on horseback and in chariot to make her one of the fighting elite, a knight. She added new lessons, tracking and scouting, how to read signs, how to slip undetected across the face of the land, how to spy and not be seen. She was especially good at this last. And in many ways, Everything had changed. The king had emerged from his stupor of grief, but he seldom smiled and never laughed. It was Ginath who supposedly was the lady of the kingdom, though in reality it was Bronwyn who made all the decisions, 
and advised Ginath what orders to give. The evenings in the castle were quiet times, with the king withdrawing immediately after dinner to discuss whatever needed to be discussed with his chiefs, and then going to bed. There were no more long evenings of drinking and tail spinning at the king's hearth. Gwen knew, of course, that such things were still going on, but it was an improvised hearth between the stables and the practice grounds. She had not been set to serve there at first. Her teachers had let others take her place, but she supposed that now they thought enough time had passed and it was time for her to do her duties again. And it wasn't as if there was anything happening there in the evenings that the king needed to be concerned about. Even the carefully spiced mead and ale would continue to be the same. It wasn't as if the secret of the brewing died with Ellery, for Bronwyn was well aware of the recipe, and the same spices were going into the batches being made now. No, it was nothing more than the same sort of talk and laughter that she had heard all of her life. In a way, it gave her both comfort and melancholy. Comfort because it was so familiar. Melancholy because— she felt guilty. It seemed wrong not to go on mourning all the time, somehow disloyal. And then, as the summer turned heavy and the first of the harvests began, the messenger from the High King arrived. He brought with him news that the Queen who shared Gwen's name had given the High King not one but two sons. Fortunately for his own safety, he had heard on his journey of Queen Ellery's death, so the first words from him were not of Arthur's good fortune, but of condolence. Only after he had delivered a long, and to Gwen's mind suspiciously fulsome, speech on Arthur's sorrow at hearing of this, did he deliver himself of his real purpose. The king merely shook his head after a long moment of silence. I wish the High King and his new sons well, he said at last, not troubling to hide his bitterness. All health and long life to them. I do not have rejoicing in me, but I wish them all well. Then he dismissed the messenger with a small gift. Bronwyn came and took him away to the women to be fed, and it was from Bronwyn that Gwen heard the thing that was both shocking and scandalous, and almost not to be believed. Bronwyn had made a habit since Hilary's death and the departure of little Gwen of making sops in wine for Ginath and Gwen before they went to bed. This was especially welcome to both of them, because both of them were labouring far longer than they had used to. Gwen found herself pouring for her father, and then being summoned to the men's fire to pour for one or another of her father's chiefs, until the last of them went to their beds. And Ginath was taking on the task of being the chief of the women far earlier than anyone had reckoned she would need to. Of course it was Bronwyn that actually made most of the decisions, but Bronwyn was very careful to make it seem as if Ginath was the one doing so. Under Bronwyn's eye and an obtrusive coaching, Ginath was doing almost everything that Ellery had. Which meant both Gwen and Ginath were up at dawn and working long, long past sundown. They needed those sops in wine. They also needed to hear what Bronwyn gleaned over the course of the day, carefully winnowing news and important details from mere gossip and speculation. Gwen had had no idea that Bronwyn had performed this service for Ellery until Bronwyn herself told them, over that first bowl of toasted bread covered in sweetened, spiced wine. And she looked grim this night as she handed them the thick pottery bowls. This is for no ears but yours she said quietly, as they settled down on their bed, a bed luxurious to the point of decadence, now that only two of them shared it. 
I would not have the king your father hear of this, or his loyalty to the high king might well be tested to breaking. But you should know. The bite Gwen was swallowing all but lodged in her throat. She swallowed it down with difficulty, her stomach knotted with anxiety. This messenger was sent to spy on us, Bronwyn continued, her jaw tight. He sidled about and put his questions mingled in with other things aplenty, but I could tell what was important to him, and it was about babies. Who'd given birth of late? Who had sons, and when? Strange thing for a king's messenger to be asking, I bethought, and I liked it not at all. So I made sure to keep his cup full, and nothing loath was he to drink it, and that was when I heard the tale. She shook her head. Gwen waited, spoon resting in the bowl, no longer with any appetite. I don't have the gift the queen had, the knowing, that she could say when a man was telling true, telling false, or telling nothing more than wild rumour. But, well, here it is. Bronwyn looked them both in the eyes, each in turn. He said that once his sons were born, on the Merlin's advice, every boy child born in those parts within a week on either side of their birthing date was taken from his mother and smothered. What? gasped Ginath. Gwen could only sit there, half frozen, as memories she didn't think she was supposed to have came flooding back, of the Merlin's questions, of what he had mumbled. There were not, thank the good goddess, many of them, she continued, but, she shook her head again, the way he said it made me think it must be true, and so cold-blooded. Perhaps, Ginnath began in a whisper, her face gone pale, perhaps it was meant as a sacrifice. They all three exchanged sober glances. Even as young as she was, Gwen knew that there were sacrifices. From time to time one of her father's treasured white horses went off and never came back. There were sacrifices at all the great rites, mostly fruit and flowers and grain, of course. Among other things, you didn't waste the life of an animal that could breed more of its kind unless you needed something really badly from the gods. But animals were sacrificed, and sometimes people as well. That was mostly in the hands of the druids. Mostly. Though sometimes there had to be a year king. Only in dark times, though. But the Merlin was the chief druid, and he was the one who had advised Arthur to do this terrible thing. Was he playing the substitute king with the High King's new twins, sacrificing other boy children like them, so that they would be spared? If he was, well, that was just wrong. Even Gwen knew it didn't work like that. The Year King had to go to the sacrifice willingly, had to know what he was doing, and do it for the land and the people, and how could a baby do that? But if they were sacrifices, what were the sacrifices for? It was baffling, and somehow that made it even more horrifying. This is something I thought you should know, Bronwyn concluded, and it will go no further than the three of us. But you, Ginnath, may well be queen here one day, and you, Gwen, will likely serve her as you would have served your brother had he lived. And you must both know about things like this, and keep a sharp watch on the High King's doings. She bit her lip, and the flickering flame from their rushlight made her look even older and more drawn. It may be he has done this for the land and the folk, 
unless the ladies bring the word to us, we cannot know. But on the face of it, these are dark doings, and the High King is besmirched by their foulness. If these are dark doings, there is one thing you may be sure of. What's that, Bronwyn? asked Ginath in a whisper. That they will come back at him when he least expects, and be his ruin, the old woman said grimly. Blood will have blood, and innocent blood calls more strongly than any other. The messenger went on his way. The season turned, summer to harvest, and the rites and the festival. Poor Ginath was at her wit's end, trying to arrange all, even with the help of Bronwyn and all the women, but out of respect for the king, few guests replied with answers that they would come, and only the king's closest arrived. For the villagers it was no different than any other harvest festival. There was food and music, dancing and gaming, drinking and more drinking, coupling and hand-fasting, and all the usual doings in their season. And if the gathering at the king's hearth was a subdued one, if there were no races this year, well, at least there was, at last, a gathering at the king's hearth, and when the guests were gone again, there was no more going out to another hearth and leaving the king to mourn alone over the ashes. In part, that was just plain sense, for there was no other place big enough to hold them all when the winter winds began to blow, but in part it was because the king was taking an interest in life again. A few women made attempts to draw him out, but by midwinter it was clear that there would be no queen taking Elary's place. As for Gwen, her instructors were keeping her too occupied to brood, and had been for moons, so that when midwinter arrived, it came to her one night, as she served as her father's page, that the terrible ache of grief, the chasm that had been inside her, was not gone, never that, but changed to something that was somewhat easier to bear. And, looking at her father's face, it seemed he felt the same. He took an interest in things that he had not had, even at harvest. Still not in women, but much the same if somewhat grimmer interest in the small affairs of his people and his kingdom, and the greater affairs of what was going on outside that kingdom. Perhaps it helped that there was, without a doubt, going to be fighting in the spring. The High King had sent out his messengers again, just before the snow flew, to warn that the seafaring chiefs, the northerners, too disorganized to be called kings, were uniting for what Arthur thought was another push to oust him and overrun them all. It gave her father something to think about, besides his own pain. So, at midwinter, the talk was all of war and the preparations for war. Gwen paid great attention to all this talk, for this was to be her business. There might not be a brother to guard now, but there were two sisters, one of whom would surely wed someone that their father would name as his heir. Whoever that was would need someone he could trust. When the guests were all gone, Gwen and the rest found their hands being turned to those preparations that had been discussed. The nasty barbed war arrows that would tear a man's flesh on being pulled out needed to be made. That was a matter of several steps, some of which could be entrusted to the squires. War chariots, spears, armor, bows, harness, all needed to be checked and put in good order. Much could be put in the squire's hands, and much was. Gwen worked feverishly, and the work did much to help her set aside her troubled thoughts. There were no further ill tales, though more messengers came from the High King, traveling with great difficulty across the winter landscape, bringing with them the questions of levies, and what could be supplied in lieu of, or in addition to, the levies. 
Now Gwen was glad that her father had not heard the tales, that Bronwyn had kept them to herself, for he threw himself into this work with a whole heart. As might have been expected, there were other rumours coming out of the West, that King Lot had demurred, saying that mere rumours were no cause for raising levies, and that in any case the Northerners might well lose interest before spring. "'He intends to send nothing, or as little as possible,' Gwen's father spat one night in disgust. "'There would be no loot in it for him,' pointed out one of the chiefs. "'Even if we drive them far back into their own lands and seize what we drive them off, it is not on Lot's border, and he will get no share of it. If we only drive them back, well, what will we win? Arms and horses both the worse for war. He shook his head, and Lot is far enough from Kelliwig that there is little the High King can do at this stage to enforce his will. Lot will find some excuse, a plague of flux, or weather washing out the roads, and if he arrives it will be too late to be of service. All the more reason for us to act with honour. The king set his chin firmly, and Gwen silently cheered. She felt better for seeing him so alive again, and more like his old self. The talk around the hearth was lively enough to satisfy anyone, and Gwen wished with all her heart that she would be allowed to go along with the levies. But she wouldn't. None of the squires her age were going. Only the seasoned warriors, neither too old nor too young, would be sent. Even the king himself would remain behind, and that was on the orders of the high king himself. Her father grumbled at that, but agreed that it was a sound decision once he heard the reasoning. The High King is concerned that this might be a trick. The messenger that brought them this news was no mere mouthpiece. It was one of Arthur's hand-picked warriors, part of his personal band. He fears that either the Northerners themselves, or someone who has been scheming with them, is arranging for it to look as if they are preparing for a war, when in fact they have no intention of facing us in the field. Instead, once the levies are committed, it is possible that the Northerners will retreat, drawing us after them, and then the real attack will happen somewhere else. No need to ask where else. The Saxons! her father spat in disgust. The messenger nodded. So we need you, ready with a second force, to hold them back if they do push forward. With Gwen watching and listening, committing everything to memory even though she didn't understand more than half of what she heard, the messenger outlined the possible strategies. Rough maps were sketched out in charcoal on the stones. The best of those were transferred with great labour onto tanned hide with a quill and walnut hull ink. By the time the messenger left, Gwen's father had nothing but praise for the wisdom of the young Arthur. There did not seem to be enough hours of daylight for all the preparations, and the warmer the weather became and the longer the days, the sense of urgency increased. Now it was Gwen who was up at dawn, and hard at it until she almost fell asleep with her work in her hands. Ginath had a great deal to do, yes, but not nearly as much. Eleri had always kept ample supplies of healing herbs and so forth on hand, and there had not been much call for such things in the last year. Always be prepared for warfare, had been her admonition to her women, and so they always were. It was about lambing time when it was possible to move freely about the countryside, and the storms of winter were past and boats could sail, that messengers again galloped among the High King's allies. The High King had been brought word from his spies. The Northerners were indeed massing ships, as if to make a great raid. The levies were called up and marched off to join the High King. King Lloyd made a great show of sending them off, and advised the men he sent to make double fires at night, 
and drag brushes behind them to make it seem that their numbers were larger. Then he told those he had kept in reserve to be ready and keep their weapons to hand, as Arthur had warned him. And Arthur was right. Near sunset, very near Beltane, a messenger on a winded horse rode across the southern border of Hloyd's kingdom of Puise, having already come through Penguin, Chalchiveneld, and Caer Kelimion. The Saxons of the south were indeed massing for war and marching, and Lot of Orkney was about to have a rude surprise, for the northerners were making straight for the shores of Lothian, not further south. Perhaps it was just as well he had delayed in sending his levies, for they would not have far to march to meet the enemy. Doubtless he would claim that his wife and Morgana had had some manner of magical warning this was to be so. And doubtless, for the sake of peace, Arthur would accept this, whether he believed it or not. So said Bronwyn, as she and the women methodically passed the readied saddle-bags to the squires, who put them on the horses they had already harnessed. The king had planned this to a nicety, so that the warriors could move out on a moment's warning, and the moment there was light every man, woman, and child was up and putting his preparations into action. The cavalry would go first, followed by the chariots. There would be no men afoot. Arthur would supply the foot-soldiers, for Lloyd's levies that had gone north consisted primarily of foot. Arthur had begged him to reserve the troops that could move faster for the Saxons. The king himself would lead them, and this alone showed how grave the threat was. If he fell, that would leave Puis in the hands of three girls, none of them wed. But he would not fall. Gwen willed it fiercely. Besides, he would be in his chariot, and his chariot driver was second only to Braith in skill. He would be guarded by his sworn band, who also were well aware of what would happen if he fell. By the time the sun was three fingers above the horizon, they were ready to depart. Gwen, to her sorrow, but not her surprise, was not going. She was not being slighted. No one her age was being allowed to go. She stood by the king's chariot, looking up at him. Around them horses stirred restively. Ginath held her hand tightly, but of the two of them it was Gwen who was the calmest. "'I rely on you, my daughters,' the king said, his voice stronger and firmer than it had been since Eleri's death. Gwen could only marvel at how war had made him come alive again. For that she could actually feel glad about it. I do not know how long we will be in the field, but come what may, the lands have to be tilled, the flocks tended, the harvest brought in, and the rites celebrated. You must see to it that these things are done, and done well. Ginath looked up at the king, her eyes bright with tears, so it was Gwen who answered, we will, my lord. He nodded. Now hear me well. I expect to return in triumph. I plan to return. I have every intention of coming back loaded with Saxon wealth, carried on good Saxon horses. But the gods may have have other plans. Should the very worst befall, I have left certain orders. Ginath and you, Gwen, and those who choose to flee are to take shelter with the king of Gwyneth. He is my oldest friend, for we fostered together and swore an oath of brotherhood. I will make no orders other than that. If affairs have gone that badly, let each man act on his own conscience. He had spoken loudly enough that his voice carried over the crowd, and though there were some murmurs, there was much nodding. Ginath sobbed. Gwen had a terrible lump in her throat, but also a strange certainty. King Lloyd would return. There would be others who would not, and she somehow knew there would be great grief for her. 
but her father would return, and as he hoped, in triumph. Ginath had no such feeling of certainty. That much was clear from her look of despair. But she had courage. She swallowed back her tears, stood up straight, and despite red eyes and trembling voice replied, Yes, my lord, father. He bent down and embraced them both, kissing the tops of their heads, then released them. As soon as he had, Gwen could tell that his spirit was elsewhere, already down the road, eager to face battle. Fiercely she wished she could go too. But her fate was already written, and she had to step back and watch as her father took the reins from his chariot driver, and the horses, already impatient, lurched out at a trot. And then they were gone. Then came the worst part of this, the waiting. Gwen was too young to remember much about the last time the levies of Puis went to war, but Ginath was not, and Bronwyn certainly was not. Ginath collapsed in an orgy of grief and despair. Bronwyn allowed her two days to wallow in it, then roused her roughly, took her down to the brook, stripped her bare, and ducked her in the freezing cold water. Gwen had no idea this was going to happen, and only happened to look up from the bowstring she was plaiting to see Bronwyn hauling the weakly protesting girl in that direction. There is such a thing as curiosity that can't be suppressed. Gwen pinned the string down and followed, just in time to see Bronwyn strip Ginath to the skin and shove her in the spring-fed pond. The water was ice-cold, and Ginath shrieked and flailed her arms wildly, trying to keep from falling in. She failed, of course. The water was only waist-deep, but she came up gasping and spluttering, only to be hauled onto the bank just as roughly, rubbed down with a drying cloth, and have her clothing shoved at her. W what d d did you d d do that for? Ginath cried indignantly between the chattering of her teeth. Gwen ran the last few steps to help her get into her shift and gown. You've had your wallow. Two days of buying like a lamb taken from its mum is enough, Bronwyn said, her jaw set. Your father is very much alive, and you have an example to set. What if every woman in this kingdom went a bawling and blethering as if her man was already dead? Straighten your back, go to your duty, and remember that from the time you leave your bed to the time you take to it, you are being watched. Ginath looked furious, but furious was probably better than weeping. Certainly Bronwyn seemed to think so. She nodded and pointed back towards the castle. With her head erect and her eyes practically flashing, Ginath stormed off. She didn't look back. Bronwyn simply followed, without acknowledging Gwen's presence. After a moment, Gwen went back to her bowstring. It was not that long after that Ginath went briskly past, followed by one of the servants, both of them with their arms full of bundles of something. Clearly, Bronwyn's ploy had worked, though it might take Ginath a while to forgive her. Ginath was present at dinner, very much present, and sitting in their father's place. It actually made Gwen proud of her, to see her sitting there, dry-eyed, and talking like their mother talked, when the king was not in the high seat. And when dinner was over, she invited the remaining men to stay at the hearth, picked the most senior of the warriors to take the king's seat, and directed Gwen to tend his cup, before taking the women aside. "'That was well done tonight, sister,' Gwen whispered when she came to bed. She didn't know if Ginath was still awake, but as it happened, she was. It was hard, Ginath replied with a little break in her voice, and Bronwyn was horrid. Gwen debated a moment before saying anything. Bronwyn was right, she ventured, which made her all the more horrid. There was silence on the other side of the bed for a moment, then a sigh. 
I wish one of us could see what was happening with father. At least then I would know. Gwen pondered this for a moment. Why don't you try? she asked. Because, Ginath began, and stopped. What would the worst be? Gwen continued. That you don't see anything? You would be no worse off than now, and you'd know you'd tried. I'll have to ask Bronwyn for help. I've never tried scrying. Ginath plucked at the blanket covering both of them nervously. Kataruna went to the ladies. I'm on the warrior path. That leaves you, Gwen pointed out. You might as well try. You might be stronger in the blessings than you think. Mother's blood runs strong in all of us. Even the brat, little Gwen. She wasn't sure where those words were coming from, but they seemed to do Ginath a lot of good. I might as well, Ginath replied, and the tight sound in her voice was gone. Gwen, somewhat to her own bemusement, had a real talent for braiding bowstrings and working with the Fletcher, so that was what Pedder set her to do. The work was exacting enough that it took her mind off her worries and fears, without being so demanding that she felt as if she was being pulled in too many directions at once. The men had taken almost every arrow and spare string with them. A needful thing, for there would be no time to make more on the march, nor when they closed on the Saxons. But that meant that just to have the means to hunt, a lot of work was ahead of those with the skill. And now that she had rudimentary abilities in fighting, and now that all the older boys were gone, Petter had turned all of his concentration on her and the rest of the young squires. This was not a bad thing at all. Such individualized attention meant that instead of being trained as a herd in the same things, Pedder was taking the time to assess them and decide what they might be best suited for. He might not have had that time until they were a year or more older, if it was not for this. And if they were going to be the last line of defense against the Saxons, or a rear guard on an escape to Gwyneth, they had better be doing what they were best at. For some the choice was obvious. Tall, meaty boys with a lot of sheer brute strength already were clearly made for fighting afoot. To them Pedernau assigned training with the staff, the cudgel, the hammer, the axe. Those with the best eye, Gwen among them, got extra training with bow and spear. Those who clearly were not doing well with their horses either had their difficulties sorted out or were, to their profound relief, dismissed from the chariot and cavalry altogether. Pedder spent all of a day studying them, measuring them, looking at their parents, and consulting with the oldest folk in the village about their grandparents, in order to try and define what they might grow to be like. And that was when Gwen's own abilities became apparent. "'You'll never be a giant,' was Pedder's shrewd assessment. They tell me for size, ye be the spit image of your grandma and grantha on king's side. Except the hair, otherwise small and fast and sleek it, not tall like the queen. Braith was right, Epona put her stamp on ye, and the best place for ye, bodyguard to your kin and scout. Cavalry or chariot, an ye must, but I'd sooner see ye scoutin'. Ye've got the way of movin' quiet and not seen that it bain't possible to teach. That's not be from the king's blood. Now this was a revelation to Gwen. But it occurred to her immediately that it was true. She did have a knack for getting around without people noticing her when she didn't want to be noticed. It had worried her that she was so little, and would have had to go up against much larger and stronger men. But Pedder had found the right place for her, and it was something no one else would have been as well suited to, and she felt suddenly as if everything was right. Meanwhile, Ginath had made up with Bronwyn, and part of her day was spent in learning more of women's magic, 
so that she could try scrying as soon as Bronwyn thought she had the strength for it. In fact, Bronwyn heartily approved of the planned attempt. None of the other women had so much magic in them, and the mere fact that Ginnath was going to at least try to see what was happening with their men made them all encourage her and look to her. Gwen found herself at a variation of her old chore on the afternoon when Ginnath was going to make her first attempt, taking goose feathers that she herself must have cleaned and carefully stripping the veins so that the Fletcher could use them to feather his arrows. Of all of those who were left, she was the best at it, perhaps because she had cleaned so many and knew how to handle them. She spoiled very few. Most were so perfect that the Fletcher had very little to do but trim them to fit and glue them in place. Her thoughts drifted to Ginnath, wondering if she had begun, wondering what it felt like to be the center of a circle of power, and that was when the feathers vanished from her hands and she found herself elsewhere. On the top of a mountain? It seemed so, but this was not like standing on any real mountain, for she could see everything below her as clearly as if she stood within arm's length. A battle was about to begin. A battle not between men, but between two armies of animals. On the one side, boars, an army of boars, huge brutish creatures with greedy eyes and long vicious tusks, with ravens circling above them, leading them a white dragon. On the other, another army of mixed beasts, hounds, stags, keen-eyed wolves, with falcons on watch above, and a great bear leading. Beside the bear, a noble white stallion. She had only time enough to take this all in before the two forces leapt at each other's throats. She had no experience of human wars to know if this was more or less bloody, noisy, confusing, and chaotic. She wanted to look away, sickened by the slaughter, but she could not. It seemed to go on forever, and then, at last, the boars began to lose— the mixed army drove them back over a field slick with blood and thick with fallen bodies. The white dragon turned tail and ran, leaving the boars alone. Then it happened. Pressing eagerly ahead, the white stallion stumbled over the corpse of a boar. Another, its tusks dripping with the blood of its victims, saw the chance and leapt for him. Other animals saw what was happening, but were too far— they would never reach him in time to save him. All but one. With a high, thin cry, a falcon dove out of the sky, talons slashing at the boar's eyes. The boar roared with pain, reared and snapped, catching the falcon before she could escape, killing her instantly. But that was enough time for the stallion to scramble to his feet and rejoin the army, which rushed on the boar and slew it before it could even drop the poor mangled corpse in its mouth. And then she was back, dazed, feathers still in her hands. But this time, this time she knew what she had seen. The boars were the Saxon army, for boars were sacred to them. The bear must have been the High King Arthur, the stallion, her own father. And the falcon? The falcon could only have been Braith, and she had just seen how Braith had died. Heedless of the feathers, she buried her face in her hands and wept.